To Scapula by Tertullian. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. We are not in any great perturbation or alarm about the persecutions we suffer from the ignorance of men, for we have attached ourselves to this sect, fully accepting the terms of its covenant, so that, as men whose very lives are not their own, we engage in these conflicts, our desire being to obtain God's promised rewards, and our dread lest the woes with which he threatens an unchristian life should overtake us. So we shrink not from the grapple with your utmost rage, coming even forth of our own accord to the contest, and condemnation gives us more pleasure than acquittal. We have sent therefore this tract to you, in no alarm about ourselves, but in much concern for you and for all our enemies, to say nothing of our friends. For our religion commands us to love even our enemies, and to pray for those who persecute us, aiming at a perfection all its own, and seeking in its disciples something of a higher type than the commonplace goodness of the world. For all love those who love them. It is peculiar to Christians alone to love those that hate them. Therefore, mourning over your ignorance and compassionating human error, and looking on to that future of which every day shows threatening signs, necessity is laid on us to come forth in this way also, that we may set before you the truths you will not listen to openly and publicly. We are worshippers of one God, of whose existence and character nature teaches all men, at whose lightnings and thunders you tremble, whose benefits minister to your happiness. You think that others too are gods, the same we know to be devils. However, it is a fundamental human right, a privilege of nature, that every man should worship according to his own convictions. One man's religion neither harms nor helps another man. It is assuredly no part of religion to compel religion, to which free will and not force should lead us the sacrificial victims even being required of a willing mind. You will render no real service to your gods by compelling us to sacrifice, for they can have no desire of offerings from the unwilling, unless they are animated by a spirit of contention, which is a thing altogether undivine. Accordingly, the true God bestows his blessings alike on wicked men and on his own elect, upon which account he has appointed an eternal judgment, when both thankful and unthankful will have to stand before his bar. Yet you have never detected us, sacrilegious wretches though you reckon us to be, in any theft, far less in any sacrilege. But the robbers of your temples, all of them swear by your gods and worship them. They are not Christians, and yet it is they who are found guilty of sacrilegious deeds." We have not time to unfold how many other ways your gods are mocked and despised by their own votaries. So, too, treason is falsely laid to our charge, though no one has ever been able to find followers of Albinus or Niger or Cassius among Christians, while the very men who had sworn by the genie of the emperor, who had offered and vowed sacrifices for their safety, who had often pronounced condemnation on Christ's disciples, are till this day found traitors to the imperial throne. A Christian is enemy to none, least of all to the emperor of Rome, whom he knows to be appointed by his God, and so cannot but love and honour, and whose well-being, moreover, he must needs desire, with that of the empire over which he reigns, so long as the world shall stand, for so long as that shall Rome continue. To the emperor, therefore, we render such reverential homage as is lawful for us and good for him, regarding him as the human being next to God, who from God has received all his power, and is less than God alone. And this will be according to his own desires. For thus, as less only than the true God, he is greater than all besides. Thus he is greater than the very gods themselves, even they too being subject to him. We therefore sacrifice for the emperor's safety, but to our God and his, but after the manner God has enjoined, in simple prayer. For God, creator of the universe, has no need of odours or of blood. These things are the food of devils. But we not only reject those wicked spirits, we overcome them, we hold them up daily to contempt, we exorcise them from their victims, as multitudes can testify. 
so all the more we pray for the imperial well-being, as those who seek it at the hands of him who is able to bestow it. And one would think it must be abundantly clear to you that the religious system under whose rules we act is one inculcating a divine patience. Since, though our numbers are so great, constituting all but the majority in every city, we conduct ourselves so quietly and modestly. I might perhaps say, known rather as individuals than as organized communities, and remarkable only for the reformation of our former vices. For far be it from us to take it ill that we have laid on us the very things we wish, or in any way plot the vengeance at our own hands, which we expect to come from God. However, as we have already remarked, it cannot but distress us that no state shall bear unpunished the guilt of shedding Christian blood, as you see indeed in what took place during the presidency of Hilarion. For when there had been some agitation about places of sepulture for our dead, and the cry arose, no area, no burial grounds for the Christians, it came about that their own area, their threshing floors, were a-wanting, for they gathered in no harvests. As to the rains of the bygone year, it is abundantly plain of what they were intended to remind men, of the deluge, no doubt, which in ancient times overtook human unbelief and wickedness. And as to the fires which lately hung all night over the walls of Carthage, they who saw them know what they threatened, and what the preceding thunders pealed, they who were hardened by them can tell. All these things are signs of God's impending wrath, which we must needs publish and proclaim in every possible way, and in the meanwhile we must pray it may be only local. Sure are they to experience it one day in its universal and final form, who interpret otherwise these samples of it. That sun, too, in the metropolis of Utica, with light all but extinguished, was a portent which could not have occurred from an ordinary eclipse, situated as the Lord of Day was in his height and house. You have the astrologers consult them about it. We can point you also to the deaths of some provincial rulers who in their last hours had painful memories of their sin in persecuting the followers of Christ. Vigelus Saturninus, who first here used the sword against us, lost his eyesight. Claudius Lucius Herminianus in Cappadocia, enraged that his wife had become a Christian, had treated the Christians with great cruelty. Well, left alone in his palace, Suffering under a contagious malady, he boiled out in living worms and was heard exclaiming, Let nobody know of it, lest the Christians rejoice and Christian wives take encouragement. Afterwards he came to see his error in having tempted so many from their steadfastness by the tortures he inflicted, and died almost a Christian himself. In that doom which overtook Byzantium, Celius Capella could not help crying out, Christians rejoice! Yes, and the persecutors, who seem to themselves to have acted with impunity, shall not escape the day of judgment. For you, we sincerely wish it may prove to have been a warning only, that, immediately after you had condemned Mavilus of Adramitum to the wild beasts, you were overtaken by those troubles, and that, even now, for the same reason you are being called to a blood reckoning. But do not forget the future." We who are without fear ourselves are not seeking to frighten you, but we would save all men if possible by warning them not to fight with God. You may perform the duties of your charge and yet remember the claims of humanity. If on no other ground than that you are liable to punishment yourself, you ought to do so. For is not your commission simply to condemn those who confess their guilt and to give over to the torture those who deny? You see, then, how you trespass yourself, against your instructions, to wring from the confessing a denial. It is, in fact, an acknowledgment of our innocence that you refuse to condemn us at once when we confess. In doing your utmost to extirpate us, if that is your object, it is innocence you assail. But how many rulers, men more resolute and more cruel than you are, have contrived to get quit of such causes altogether? As Cincius Severus, who himself suggested the remedy at Thistris, pointed out how the Christians should answer that they might secure an acquittal, as Vespronius Candidus, who dismissed from his bar a Christian on the ground that to satisfy his fellow citizens would break the peace of the community, as Asper, who, in the case of a man who gave up his faith under slight infliction of the torture, did not compel the offering of a sacrifice, having owned before, 
among the advocates and assessors of court that he was annoyed at having to meddle with such a case. Pudens, too, at once dismissed a Christian who was brought before him, perceiving from the indictment that it was a case of vexatious accusation, tearing the document to pieces. He refused so much as to hear him without the presence of his accuser, as not being consistent with the imperial commands. All this might be officially brought under your notice, and by the very advocates who are themselves also under obligations to us, although in court they give their voices as it suits them. For the clerk of one of them who was liable to be thrown upon the ground by an evil spirit was set free from his affliction, as was also the relative of another and the little boy of a third. And how many men of rank, to say nothing of common people, have been delivered from devils and healed of diseases? Even Severus himself, the father of Antoinine, was graciously mindful of the Christians, for he sought out the Christian proculus surnamed Torpatian, the steward of Euhodius, and in gratitude for his having once cured him by anointing, he kept him in his palace till the day of his death. Antoinine, too, brought up as he was on Christian milk, was intimately acquainted with this man. Both women and men of highest rank, whom Severus knew well to be Christians, were not merely permitted by him to remain uninjured, but he even bore distinguished testimony in their favour, and gave them publicly back to us from the hands of a raging populace. Marcus Aurelius also, in his expedition to Germany, by the prayers his Christian soldiers offered to God, got rain in that well-known thirst. When, indeed, have not droughts been put away by our kneelings and our fastings? At times like these, moreover, the people crying to the God of gods, the alone omnipotent, under the name of Jupiter, have borne witness to our God. Then we never deny the deposit placed in our hands, we never pollute the marriage bed, we deal faithfully with our wards, we give aid to the needy, we render to none evil for evil. As for those who falsely pretend to belong to us, and whom we too repudiate, let them answer for themselves. In a word, who has complaint to make against us on other grounds? To what else does the Christian devote himself save the affairs of his own community, which, during all the long period of its existence, no one has ever proved guilty of the incest or the cruelty charged against it? It is for freedom from crime so singular, for probity so great, for righteousness, for purity, for faithfulness, for truth, for the living God that we are consigned to the flames." For this is a punishment you are not wont to inflict either on the sacrilegious, or on undoubted public enemies, or on the treason-tainted of whom you have so many. Nay, even now our people are enduring persecution from the governors of Legio and Mauritiania. But it is only with the sword, as from the first it was ordained that we should suffer. But the greater our conflicts, the greater our rewards. Your cruelty is our glory. Only see you to it that in having such things as these to endure, we do not feel ourselves constrained to rush forth to the combat, if only to prove that we have no dread of them, but on the contrary, even invite their infliction. When Arius Antonius was driving things hard in Asia, the whole Christians of the province, in one united band, presented themselves before his judgment seat, on which, ordering a few to be led forth to execution, he said to the rest, O miserable men, if you wish to die, you have precipices or halters. If we should take it into our heads to do the same thing here, what will you make of so many thousands? of such a multitude of men and women, persons of every sex and every age and every rank, when they present themselves before you. How many fires, how many swords will be required? What will be the anguish of Carthage itself, which you will have to decimate, as each one recognizes there his relatives and companions, as he sees there it may be men of your own order and noble ladies, and all the leading persons of the cities, either kinsmen or friends of those of your own circle? Spare thyself, if not us poor Christians. Spare Carthage, if not thyself. Spare the province, which the indication of your purpose has subjected to the threats and extortions at once of the soldiers and of private enemies. We have no master but God. He is before you, and cannot be hidden from you, but to him you can do no injury. But those whom you regard as masters are only men, and one day they themselves must die." Yet this community will be undying, for be assured that just in the time of its seeming overthrow, it is built up into greater power. 
for all who witness the noble patience of its martyrs, as struck with misgivings, are inflamed with desire to examine into the matter in question, and as soon as they come to know the truth, they straightway enroll themselves its disciples. End of To Scapula by Tertullian Address to the Martyrs by Tertullian this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Blessed Martyrs Designate Along with the provision which Our Lady Mother the Church, from her bountiful breasts, and each brother out of his private means, makes for your bodily wants in the prison, accept also from me some contribution to your spiritual sustenance. For it is not good that the flesh be feasted, and the spirit starve. Nay, if that which is weak is carefully looked to, it is but right that that which is still weaker should not be neglected. Not that I am specially entitled to exhort you, yet not only the trainers and overseers, but even the unskilled, nay, all who choose without the slightest need for it, are wont to animate from afar by their cries the most accomplished gladiators, and from the mere throng of onlookers useful suggestions have sometimes come. First then, O blessed, grieve not the Holy Spirit who has entered the prison with you. For if he had not gone with you there, you would not have been there this day. And do you give all endeavour, therefore, to retain him? So let him lead you thence to your Lord." The prison, indeed, is the devil's house as well, wherein he keeps his family. But you have come within its walls for the very purpose of trampling the wicked one underfoot in his chosen abode. You had already in pitched battle outside, utterly overcome him. Let him have no reason, then, to say to himself, They are now in my domain, with vile hatreds I shall tempt them, with defections or dissensions among themselves." Let him fly from your presence and skulk away into his own abysses, shrunken and torpid, as though he were an out-charmed or out-smoked snake. Give him not the success in his own kingdom of setting you at variance with each other, but let him find you armed and fortified with concord, for peace among you is battle with him. You know that some, not able to find this peace in the church, have been used to seek it from the imprisoned martyrs. And so you ought to have it dwelling with you, and to cherish it, and to guard it, that you may be able, perhaps, to bestow it upon others. Other things, hindrances equally of the soul, may have accompanied you as far as the prison gate, to which also your relatives may have attended you. There and thenceforth you were severed from the world. How much more! from the ordinary course of worldly life and all its affairs. Nor let this separation from the world alarm you. For if we reflect that the world is more really the prison, we shall see that you have gone out of a prison rather than into one. The world has the greater darkness blinding men's hearts. The world imposes the more grievous fetters binding men's very souls. The world breathes out the worst impurities human lusts. The world contains a large number of criminals, even the whole human race. Then, last of all, it awaits the judgment, not of the proconsul, but of God. Wherefore, O blessed, you may regard yourselves as having been translated from a prison to, we may say, a place of safety. It is full of darkness, but ye yourselves are light. It has bonds, but God has made you free. Unpleasant exhalations are there, but ye are an odour of sweetness. The judge is daily looked for, but ye shall judge the judges themselves. Sadness may be there for him who sighs for the world's enjoyments. The Christian outside the prison has renounced the world, but in the prison he has renounced a prison too. It is of no consequence where you are in the world, you who are not of it. And if you have lost some of life's sweets, it is the way of business to suffer present loss, that after gains may be the larger. 
Thus far I say nothing of the rewards to which God invites the martyrs. Meanwhile, let us compare the life of the world and of the prison, and see if the spirit does not gain more in the prison than the flesh loses. Nay, by the care of the church and the love of the brethren, even the flesh does not lose there what is for its good, while the spirit obtains besides important advantages. You have no occasion to look on strange gods. You do not run against their images. You have no part in heathen holidays, even by mere bodily mingling in them. You are not annoyed at the foul fumes of idolatrous solemnities. You are not pained by the noise of public shows, nor by the atrocity or madness or immodesty of their celebrants. Your eyes do not fall on stews and brothels. You are free from causes of offence, from temptations, from unholy reminiscences. You are free now from persecution, too. The prison does the same service for the Christian which the desert did for the prophet. Our Lord himself spent much of his time in seclusion, that he might have greater liberty to pray, that he might be quit of the world. It was in a mountain solitude, too, he showed his glory to the disciples. Let us drop the name of prison, let us call it a place of retirement. Though the body is shut in, though the flesh is confined, all things are open to the spirit. In spirit, then, roam abroad, in spirit walk about, not setting before you shady paths or long colonnades, but the way which leads to God. As often as in spirit your footsteps are there, so often you will not be in bonds. The leg does not feel the chain when the mind is in the heavens. The mind compasses the whole man about, and whither it wills it carries him. But where thy heart shall be, there shall be thy treasure." Be there our heart, then, where we would have our treasure. Grant now, O blessed, that even to Christians the prison is unpleasant. But we were called to the warfare of the living God in our very response to the sacramental words. Well, no soldier comes out of the campaign laden with luxuries, nor does he go to action from his comfortable chamber, but from the light and narrow tent, where every kind of hardness and roughness and disagreeableness must be put up with. Even in peace, soldiers inure themselves to war by toils and inconveniences, marching in arms, running over the plain, working at the ditch, making the testudo, engaging in many arduous labours. The sweat of the brow is in everything, that bodies and minds may not shrink at having to pass from shade to sunshine, from sunshine to icy cold, from the robe of peace to the coat of mail, from silence to clamour, from quiet to tumult. In like manner, O blessed, count whatever is hard in this lot of yours as a discipline of your powers of mind and body. You are about to pass through a noble struggle, in which the living God acts the part of superintendent, in which the Holy Ghost is your trainer, in which the prize is an eternal crown of angelic essence, citizenship in the heavens, glory everlasting. Therefore your Master Jesus Christ, who has anointed you with his Spirit, and led you forth to the arena, has seen it good, before the day of conflict, to take you from a condition more pleasant in itself, and imposed on you a harder treatment, that your strength might be the greater. For the athletes, too, are set apart to a more stringent discipline, that they may have their physical powers built up. They are kept from luxury, from daintier meats, from more pleasant drinks. They are pressed, racked, worn out. The harder their labours in the preparatory training, the stronger is the hope of victory. And they, says the Apostle, that they may obtain a corruptible crown. We with the crown eternal in our eye, look upon the prison as our training ground, that at the goal of final judgment we may be brought forth well disciplined by many a trial, since virtue is built up by hardships, as by voluptuous indulgence it is overthrown. From the saying of our Lord we know that the flesh is weak, the spirit willing. Let us not withal take delusive comfort from the Lord's acknowledgement of the weakness of the flesh, for precisely on this account he first declared the spirit willing that he might show which of the two ought to be subject to the other, that the flesh might yield obedience to the spirit, the weaker to the stronger, the former thus from the latter getting strength. 
let the spirit hold converse with the flesh about the common salvation, thinking no longer of the troubles of the prison, but of the wrestle and conflict for which they are the preparation. The flesh, perhaps, will dread the merciless sword, and the lofty cross, and the rage of the wild beasts, and that punishment of the flames, of all most terrible, and all the skill of the executioner in torture. But on the other side, let the spirit set clearly before both itself and the flesh how these things, though exceeding painful, have yet been calmly endured by many, nay, have even been eagerly desired for the sake of fame and glory, and this not only in the case of men, but of women too, that you, O holy women, may be worthy of your sex. It would take me too long to enumerate one by one the men who, at their own self-impulse, have put an end to themselves. As to women, there is a famous case at hand. The violated Lucretia, in the presence of her kinsfolk, plunged the knife into herself, that she might have glory for her chastity. Mucius burned his right hand on an altar, that this deed of his might dwell in fame. The philosophers have been outstripped. For instance, Heraclitus, who, smeared with cow dung, burned himself and Empedocles, who leapt down into the fires of Ethna, and Peregrinus, who not long ago threw himself at the funeral pyre. For women even have despised the flames. Dido did so, lest after the death of a husband very dear to her, she should be compelled to marry again. And so did the wife of Hasdrubal, who, Carthage now on fire, that she might not behold her husband suppliant at Scipio's feet rushed with her children into the conflagration in which her native city was destroyed. Regulus, a Roman general, who had been taken prisoner by the Carthaginians, declined to be exchanged for a large number of Carthaginian captives, choosing rather to be given back to the enemy. He was crammed into a sort of chest, and everywhere pierced by nails driven from the outside, he endured so many crucifixions. Woman has voluntarily sought the wild beasts and even asps, those serpents worse than bear or bull, which Cleopatra applied to herself, that she might not fall into the hands of her enemy. But the fear of death is not so great as the fear of torture, and so the Athenian courtesan succumbed to the executioner when, subjected to torture by the tyrant for having taken part in a conspiracy, still making no betrayal of her confederates, she at last bit off her tongue and spat it in the tyrant's face, that he might be convinced of the uselessness of his torments, however long they should be continued. Everybody knows what to this day is the great Lacedaemonian solemnity, the the amastigosis, or scourging, in which sacred rite the Spartan youths are beaten with scourges before the altar, their parents and kinsmen standing by and exhorting them to stand it bravely out. For it will be always counted more honourable and glorious that the soul, rather than the body, has given itself to stripes. But if so high a value is put on the earthly glory, won by mental and bodily vigour, that men for the praise of their fellows, I may say, despise the sword, the fire, the cross, the wild beasts, the torture. These surely are but trifling sufferings to obtain a celestial glory and a divine reward. If the bit of glass is so precious, what must the true pearl be worth? Are we not called on then most joyfully to lay out as much for the true as others do for the false? I leave out of account now the motive of glory. All these same cruel and painful conflicts are mere vanity you find among men. In fact, a sort of mental disease has trampled underfoot. How many ease-lovers does the conceit of arms give to the sword? They actually go down to meet the very wild beasts in vain ambition, and they fancy themselves more winsome from the bites and scars of the contest. Some have sold themselves to fires to run a certain distance in a burning tunic. Others, with most enduring shoulders, have walked about under the hunter's whips. The Lord has given these things a place in the world, O blessed, not without some reason. For what reason but now to animate us, and on that day to confound us if we have feared to suffer for the truth, 
that we might be saved, what others out of vanity have eagerly sought for to their ruin. Passing too from examples of enduring constancy, having such an origin as this, let us turn to a simple contemplation of man's estate in its ordinary conditions, that mayhap from things which happen to us whether we will or no, and which we must set our minds to bear, we may get instruction. How often then have fires consumed the living? How often have wild beasts torn men to pieces? It may be in their own forests, or it may be in the heart of cities, when they have chanced to escape from their dens. How many have fallen by the robber's sword? How many have suffered at the hands of enemies the death of the cross, after having been tortured first? Yes, and treated with every sort of contumely. One may even suffer in the cause of a man what he hesitates to suffer in the cause of God. In reference to this indeed, let the present times bear testimony, when so many persons of rank have met with death in a mere human being's cause, and that, though from their birth and dignities and bodily condition and age, such a fate seemed most unlikely, either suffering at his hands, if they had taken part against him, or from his enemies, if they had been his partisans. End of Address to the Martyrs by Tertullian The Martyrdom of Perpetua and Felicitas by Tertullian. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by David Ronald. If ancient illustrations of faith, which both testify to God's grace and tend to man's edification, are collected in writing, so that by the perusal of them, as if by the reproduction of the facts, as well God may be honoured, as man may be strengthened, why should not new instances be also collected that shall be equally suitable for both purposes, if only on the ground that these modern examples will one day become ancient and available for posterity, although in their present time they are esteemed of less authority by reason of the presumed veneration for antiquity. But let men look to it, if they judge the power of the Holy Spirit to be one according to the times and seasons, since some things of later date must be esteemed of more account as being nearer to the very last times, in accordance with the exuberance of grace manifested to the final periods determined for the world. For, quote, In the last days, saith the Lord, I will pour out of my Spirit upon all flesh, and their sons and their daughters shall prophesy, and upon my servants and my handmaidens will I pour out of my spirit, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. End quote. And thus we, who both acknowledge and reverence, even as we do the prophecies, modern visions as equally promised to us, and consider the other powers of the Holy Spirit as an agency of the church for which also he was sent, administering all gifts and all, even as the Lord distributed to every one, as well needfully collect them in writing, as commemorate them in reading to God's glory, that so no weakness or despondency of faith may suppose that the divine grace abode only among the ancients, whether in respect to the condescension that raised up martyrs, or that gave revelations, since God always carries into effect what he has promised, for a testimony to unbelievers, to believers for a benefit. And we therefore, what we have heard and handled, declare also to you, brethren and little children, that as well you, who were concerned in these matters, may be reminded of them again to the glory of the Lord, as that you who know them by report may have communion with the blessed martyrs, and through them with the Lord Jesus Christ, to whom be glory and honor for ever and ever. Amen. The young catechumens, Revocatus and his fellow servant, Felicitas, Saturninus, and Secundulus were apprehended, and among them also was Vivia Perpetua, respectably born, liberally educated, a married matron, having a father and mother and two brothers, one of whom, like herself, was a catechumen, and a son and infant at the breast. She herself was about twenty-two years of age. From this point onward, she shall herself narrate the whole course of her martyrdom, 
as she left it described by her own hand and with her own mind. While, says she, we were still with the persecutors, and my father, for the sake of his affection for me, was persisting in seeking to turn me away and to cast me down from the faith. Father, said I, do you see, let us say, this vessel lying here to be a little pitcher or something else? And he said, I see it to be so. And I replied to him, Can it be called by any other name than what it is? And he said, No. Neither can I call myself anything else than what I am, a Christian. Then my father, provoked at this saying, threw himself upon me as if he would tear my eyes out. But he only distressed me and went away overcome by the devil's arguments. Then, in a few days after I had been without my father, I gave thanks to the Lord, and his absence became a source of consolation to me. In that same interval of a few days we were baptized, and to me the Spirit prescribed that in the water of baptism nothing else was to be sought for than bodily endurance. After a few days we were taken into the dungeon, and I was very much afraid, because I had never felt such darkness. O oh, terrible day! O oh, the fierce heat of the shock of the soldiery because of the crowds! I was very unusually distressed by my anxiety for my infant. There were present there Tertius and Pomponius, the blessed deacons who ministered to us, and had arranged by means of a gratuity that we might be refreshed by being sent out for a few hours into a pleasanter part of the prison. Then going out of the dungeon, all attended to their own wants. I suckled my child, which was now enfeebled with hunger. In my anxiety for it, I addressed my mother and comforted my brother and commended to their care my son. I was languishing because I had seen them languishing on my account. Such solicitude I suffered for many days, and I obtained leave for my infant to remain in the dungeon with me, and forthwith I grew strong and was relieved from distress and anxiety about my infant and the dungeon became to me, as it were, a palace, so that I preferred being there to being elsewhere. Then my brother said to me, My dear sister, you are already in a position of great dignity, and are such that you may ask for a vision, and that it may be made known to you whether this is to result in a passion or an escape. And I, who knew that I was privileged to converse with the Lord, whose kindness I have found to be so great, boldly promised him and said, Tomorrow I will tell you, and I asked, and this was what was shown to me. I saw a golden ladder of marvelous height reaching up even to heaven, and very narrow, so that persons could not only ascend it one by one, and on the sides of the ladder was fixed every kind of iron weapon. There were there swords, lances, hooks, daggers, so that if anyone went up carelessly or not looking upwards, he would be torn to pieces and his flesh would cleave to the iron weapons and under the ladder itself was crouching a dragon of wonderful size, who lay in wait for those who ascended and frightened them from the ascent. And Saturus went up first, who had subsequently delivered himself up freely on our account, not having been present at the time when we were taken prisoners. And he attained the top of the ladder and turned towards me and said to me, Perpetua, I am waiting for you, but be careful that the dragon do not bite you. And I said, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, he shall not hurt me. And from under the ladder itself, as if in fear of me, he slowly lifted up his head, and as I trod upon the first step, I trod upon his head. And I went up, and I saw an immense extent of the garden, and in the midst of the garden a white-haired man sitting in the dress of a shepherd of a large stature milking sheep, and standing around were many thousand white-robed ones. And he raised his head and looked upon me, and said to me, Thou art welcome, daughter. And he called me, and from the cheese as he was milking, he gave me, as it were, a little cake, and I received it with folded hands, and I ate it. And all who stood around said, Amen. And at the sound of their voices I was awakened, still tasting a sweetness which I cannot describe. And I immediately related this to my brother, and we understood that it was to be a passion, and we ceased henceforth to have any hope in this world. After a few days there prevailed a report that we should be heard, and then my father came to me from the city, worn out with anxiety. He came up to me, that he might cast me down, saying, Have pity, my daughter, on my gray hairs. Have pity on your father, if I am worthy to be called a father by you. If with these hands I have brought you up, 
to this flower of your age, if I have preferred you to all your brothers, do not deliver me up to the scorn of men. Have regard to your brothers, have regard to your mother and your aunt, have regard to your son, who will not be able to live after you. Lay aside your courage, and do not bring us all to destruction, for none of us will speak in freedom if you should suffer anything. These things said my father in his affection, kissing my hands and throwing himself down at my feet, and with tears he called me not daughter, but lady. And I grieved over the gray hairs of my father, that he alone of all my family would not rejoice over my passion. And I comforted him, saying, O oh, that scaffold, whatever God will shall happen, for know that we are not placed in our own power, but in that of God. And he departed from me in sorrow. Another day, while we were at dinner, we were suddenly taken away to be heard, and we arrived at the town hall. At once the rumor spread through the neighborhood of the public place, and an immense number of people were gathered together. We mount the platform, the rest were interrogated and confessed. Then they came to me, and my father immediately appeared with my boy, and withdrew me from the step, and said in a supplicating tone, Have pity on your babe. And Hilarianus, the procurator, who had just received the power of life and death in the place of the proconsul, Minucius Timinianus, who was deceased, said, Spare the gray hairs of your father, spare the infancy of your boy, offer sacrifice for the well-being of the emperors. And I replied, I will not do so. Hilarianus said, Are you a Christian? And I replied, I am a Christian. And as my father stood there to cast me down from the faith, he was ordered by Hilarianus to be thrown down and was beaten with rods. And my father's misfortune grieved me, as if I myself had been beaten. I so grieved for his wretched old age. The procurator then delivers judgment on all of us and condemns us to wild beasts. And we went down cheerfully to the dungeon. Then, because my child had been used to receive suck from me and to stay with me in the prison, I sent Pomponius, the deacon, to my father to ask for the infant, but my father would not give it him. And even as God willed it, the child no long desired the breast, nor did my breast cause me uneasiness, lest I should be tormented by care for my babe and by the pain of my breasts at once. After a few days, whilst we were all praying, on a sudden, in the middle of our prayer, there came to me a word, and I named Dinocrates, and I was amazed that the name had never come into my mind until then, and I was grieved as I remembered his misfortune and I felt myself immediately to be worthy, and to be called on to ask on his behalf. And for him I began earnestly to make supplication, and to cry with groaning to the Lord. Without delay, on that very night, this was shown to me in a vision. I saw Dinocrates going out from a gloomy place, where also there were several others, and he was parched and very thirsty, with a filthy countenance and pallid color, and the wound on his face which he had when he died. This Dinocrates had been my brother after the flesh, seven years of age, who died miserably with disease, his face being so eaten out with cancer that his death caused repugnance to all men. For him I had made my prayer, and between him and me there was a large interval, so that neither of us could approach to the other. And moreover, in the same place where Dinocrates was, there was a pool full of water, having its brink higher than was the stature of the boy, and Dinocrates raised himself up as if to drink, and I was grieved that, although the pool held water, still, on account of the height to its brink, he could not drink, and I was aroused, and knew that my brother was in suffering, but I trusted that my prayer would bring help to his suffering, and I prayed for him every day until we passed over into the prison of the camp, for we were to fight in the camp show." Then was the birthday of Gaeta Caesar, and I made my prayer for my brother day and night, groaning and weeping that he might be granted to me. Then, on the day on which we remained in fetters, this was shown to me. I saw that that place which I had formerly observed to be in gloom was now bright, and Dinocrates, with a clean body well clad, was finding refreshment. And where there had been a wound, I saw a scar. In that pool which I had before seen, I saw now with its margin lowered even to the boy's navel. And one drew water from the pool incessantly, and upon its brink was a goblet filled with water, and Dinocrates drew near and began to drink from it, and the goblet did not fail. And when he was satisfied, 
he went away from the water to play joyously after the manner of children and i awoke then i understood that he was translated from the place of punishment again after a few days Putin's a soldier, an assistant overseer of the prison, who began to regard us in great esteem, perceiving that the great power of God was in us, admitted many brethren to see us, that both we and they might be mutually refreshed, and when the day of exhibition drew near, my father, worn with suffering, came into me, and began to tear out his beard, and to throw himself on the earth, and to cast himself down on his face, and to reproach his years, and to utter such words as might move all creation, I grieved for his unhappy old age. The day before on which we were to fight, I saw in a vision that Pomponius, the deacon, came hither to the gate of the prison, and knocked vehemently. I went out to him, and opened the gate for him, and he was clothed in a richly ornament, white robe, and he had on manifold calicolae, and he said to me, Perpetua, we are waiting for you. Come. And he held his hand to me, and we began to go through rough and winding places. Scarcely at length had we arrived, breathless at the amphitheater, when he led me into the middle of the arena and said to me, Do not fear, I am here with you, and I am laboring with you. And he departed. And I gazed upon an immense assembly in astonishment, and because I knew that I was given to the wild beasts, I marveled that the wild beasts were not let loose upon me. Then there came forth against me a certain Egyptian, horrible in appearance, with his backers to fight with me. And there came to me, as my helpers and encourages, handsome youths, and I was stripped and became a man. Then my helpers began to rub me with oil, as is the custom for contest, and I beheld that Egyptian, on the other hand rolling in the dust, and a certain man came forth of wondrous height, so that he even overtopped the top of the amphitheater, and he wore a loose tunic and a purple robe between two bands over the middle of the breast, and he had on a calicule of varied form made of gold and silver, and he carried a rod as if he were a trainer of gladiators, and a green branch upon which were apples of gold, and he called for silence and said, this Egyptian, if he should overcome this woman, shall kill her with the sword, and if she shall conquer him, she shall receive this branch. Then he departed. And we drew near to one another, and began to deal out blows. He sought to lay hold of my feet, while I struck at his face with my heels, and I was lifted up in the air, and began thus to thrust at him, as if spurning the earth. But when I saw that there was some delay, I joined my hands so as to twine my fingers with one another, and I took hold upon his head, and he fell on his face, and I trod upon his head. And the people began to shout, and my backers to exalt. And I drew near to the trainer, and took the branch, and he kissed me, and said to me, Daughter, peace be with you. And I began to go gloriously to the Santa Vivarian gate. Then I awoke, and perceived that I was not to fight with beasts, but against the devil. Still I knew that the victory was awaiting me. This, so far, I have completed several days before the exhibition, but what passed at the exhibition itself, let who will write. Moreover, also, the blessed Satyrus related this his vision, which he himself committed to writing. We had suffered, says he, and we were gone forth from the flesh, and we were beginning to be borne by four angels into the east, and their hands touched us not, and we floated not supine, looking upwards, but as if ascending a gentle slope, and being set free, we at length saw the first boundless light, and I said, Perpetua, for she was at my side, this is what the Lord promised to us, we have received the promise, and while we are borne by the same four angels, there appears to us a vast space which was like a pleasure garden, having rose trees of every kind of flower and the height of the trees was after the measure of a cypress, and their leaves were falling incessantly. Moreover, there in the pleasure garden, four other angels appeared, brighter than the previous ones, who, when they saw us, gave us honor, and said to the rest of the angels, Here they are, here they are, with admiration. And those four angels who bore us, being greatly afraid, put us down, and we passed over on foot the space of a furlong in a broad path. There we found Jocundus and Saturninus and Artaxius, who having suffered the same persecution were burnt alive, and Quintus, 
who also himself a martyr and departed in the prison. And we asked of them where the rest were. And the angel said to us, Come first, enter, and greet your Lord. And we came near to a place, the walls of which were such as if they were built of light. And before the gate of that place stood four angels, who clothed those who entered with white robes. And being clothed, we entered and saw the boundless light, and heard the united voice of some who said without ceasing, Holy, holy, holy. And in the midst of that place we saw, as it were, a hoary man sitting, having snow-white hair, and with a youthful countenance, and his feet we saw not. And on his right hand and on his left were four and twenty elders, and beside them a great many others were standing. We entered with great wonder, and stood before the throne, and the four angels raised us up, and we kissed him, and he passed his hand over our face, and the rest of the elders said to us, Let us stand. And we stood and made peace, and the elders said to us, Go and enjoy. And I said, Perpetua, you have what you wish. And she said to me, Thanks be to God, that joyous as I was in the flesh, I am now more joyous here. And we went forth, and saw before the entrance Opatatus, the bishop at the right hand, and Aspasius, the presbyter, a teacher, at the left hand, separate and sad. And they cast themselves at our feet, and said to us, Restore peace between us, because you have gone forth, and have left us thus. And we said to them, Art not thou our father, and thou our presbyter, that you should cast yourselves at our feet? And we prostrated ourselves, and we embraced them. And Perpetua began to speak with them, and we drew them apart in the pleasure garden under a rose tree. And while we were speaking with them, the angel said unto them, Let them alone, that they may refresh themselves, and if you have any dissensions between you, forgive one another. And they drove them away, and they said to Optatus, Rebuke thy people, because they assemble to you as if returning from the circus and contending about factious matters. And then it seemed to us as if they would shut the doors, and in that place we began to recognize many brethren, and moreover martyrs. We were all nourished with an indescribable odor which satisfied us. Then I joyously awoke. The above were the more eminent visions of the blessed martyrs Saturus and Perpetua themselves, which they themselves committed to writing. But God called Secundulus, while he was yet in the prison, by an earlier exit from the world, not without favor, so as to give a respite to the beasts. Nevertheless, even if his soul did not acknowledge cause for thankfulness, assuredly his flesh did. But respecting Felicitas, for to her also the Lord's favor approached in the same way, when she had already gone eight months with child, for she had been pregnant when she was apprehended. As the day of the exhibition was drawing near, she was in great grief, lest on account of her pregnancy she should be delayed, because pregnant women are not allowed to be publicly punished, and lest she should shed her sacred and guiltless blood among some who had been wicked subsequently. Moreover, also, her fellow martyrs were painfully saddened, lest they should leave so excellent a friend, and as it were, companion, alone in the path of the same hope. Therefore, joining together their united cry, they poured forth their prayer to the Lord three days before the exhibition. Immediately after their prayer, her pains came upon her, and when, with the difficulty naturally to an eight months' delivery, in the labor of bringing forth, she was sorrowing, some one of the servants of the cataractory said to her, You who are in such suffering now, what will you do when you are thrown to the beasts, which you despise when you refuse to sacrifice? And she replied, Now it is, I that suffer what I suffer, but then there will be another in me who will suffer for me, because I also am about to suffer for him. Thus she brought forth a little girl, which a certain sister brought up as her daughter. Since then the Holy Spirit permitted, and by permitting willed, that the proceedings of that exhibition should be committed to writing, although we are unworthy to complete the description of so great a glory, yet we obey, as it were, the command of the most blessed Perpetua, nay, her sacred trust, and add one more testimony concerning her constancy and her loftiness of mind. While they were treated with more severity by the tribune, because, from the intimations of certain deceitful men, he feared lest they should be withdrawn from the prison by some sort of magic incantations, 
Perpetua answered to his face and said, Why do you not at least permit us to be refreshed, being as we are objectionable to the most noble Caesar and having to fight on his birthday? Or is it not your glory if we are brought forward fatter on that occasion? The tribune shuddered and blushed, and commanded that they should be kept with more humanity, so that permission was given to their brethren and others to go in and be refreshed with them, even the keeper of the prison trusting them now himself. Moreover, on the day before, when in that last meal, which they call the free meal, they were partaking as far as they could, not of a free supper, but of an agape, which the same firmness they were uttering such words as these to the people, denouncing against them the judgment of the Lord, bearing witness to the felicity of their passion, laughing at the curiosity of the people who came together, while Saturna said, Tomorrow is not enough for you, for you to behold with pleasure that which you hate. Friends today, enemies tomorrow, yet note our faces diligently, that you may recognize them on that day of judgment. Thus all departed thence astonished, and from these things many believed. The day of their victory shone forth, and they proceeded from the prison into the amphitheatre, as if to an assembly, joyous and of brilliant countenances, if perchance shrinking, it was with joy, and not with fear. Perpetua followed with placid look, and with step and gait as a matron of Christ, beloved of God, casting down the luster of her eyes from the gaze of all. Moreover, Felicitas, rejoicing that she had safely brought forth, so that she might fight with the wild beasts, from the blood and from the midwife to the gladiator, to wash after childbirth with a second baptism. And when they were brought to the gate, and were constrained to put on the clothing, the men, that of the priests of Saturn, and the women, that of those who were consecrated to Cirrus, that noble-minded woman resisted to the end with constancy. For she said, We have come thus far of our own accord, for this reason that our liberty might not be restrained, for this reason we have yielded our minds, that we might not do any such thing as this. We have agreed on this with you." In justice acknowledged the justice, the tribune yielded to their being brought as simply as they were. Perpetua sang psalms, already treading underfoot the head of the Egyptians. Revocatus and Saturninus and Satyrus uttered threatenings against the gazing people about this martyrdom. When they came within sight of Hilarianus, by gesture and nod, they began to say to Hilarianus, Thou judgest us, say they, but God will judge thee. At this the people exasperated, demanded that they should be tormented with scourges as they passed along the rank of the Venatores. And they indeed rejoiced that they should have incurred any one of their lord's passions. But he who had said, Ask, and ye shall receive, gave to them, when they asked, that death which each one had wished for. For when, at any time they had been discoursing among themselves about their wish in respect to their martyrdom, Saturnitus indeed had professed that he wished that he might be thrown to all the beasts, doubtless that he might wear a more glorious crown. Therefore, in the beginning of the exhibition, he and Revocatus made trial of the leopard, and moreover, upon the scaffold, they were harassed by the bear. Satyrus, however, held nothing in greater abomination than a bear, but he imagined that he would be put to end with one bite of a leopard. Therefore, when a wild boar was supplied, it was the huntsman, rather, who supplied that boar who was gored by that same beast, and died the day after the shows. Satyrus only was drawn out, and when he had been bound on the floor near to the bear, the bear would not come forth from his den, and so Satyrus for the second time recalled unhurt. Moreover, for the young women, the devil prepared a very fierce cow, provided especially for that purpose contrary to custom, rivaling their sex also, in that of the beasts. And so, stripped and clothed with nets, they were led forth. The populace shuddered, as they saw one young woman of delicate frame, and another with breasts still dropping from her recent childbirth. So, being recalled, they are unbound. Perpetua is first let in. She was tossed and fell on her loins, and when she saw her tunic torn from her side, she drew it over her as a veil for her middle, rather mindful of her modesty than her suffering. 
Then she was called for again, and bound up her disheveled hair, for it was not becoming for a martyr to suffer with disheveled hair, lest she should appear to be mourning in her glory. So she rose up, and when she saw Felicitas crushed, she approached and gave her hand, and lifted her up, and both of them stood together, and the brutality of the populace being appeased, they were recalled to the Santa Vivarian gate. Then Perpetua was received by a certain one, who was still a catechumen, Rusticus by name, who kept close to her, and she, as if aroused from sleep, so deeply had been in the spirit and in the ecstasy, began to look round her, and to say to the amazement of all, I cannot tell when we are to be led out to that cow. And when she had heard what had already happened, she did not believe it, until she had perceived certain signs of injury in her body and in her dress, and had recognized the catechumen. Afterwards causing that catechumen and the brother to approach, she addressed them, saying, Stand fast in the faith, and love one another, all of you, and be not offended at my sufferings. The same satirist at the other entrance exhorted the soldier Prudence, saying, Assuredly, here I am, as I have promised and foretold, for up to this moment I have felt no beast, and now believe with your whole heart, lo, I am going forth to that beast, and I shall be destroyed with one bite of the leopard. And immediately, at the conclusion of the exhibition, he was thrown to the leopard, and with one bite of his, he was bathed with such a quantity of blood that the people shouted out to him as he was returning, the testimony of his second baptism. Saved and washed, saved and washed. Manifestly, he was assuredly saved, who had been glorified in such a spectacle. Then to the soldier Pudens he said, Farewell, and be mindful of my faith, and let not these things disturb, but confirm you. And at the same time he asked for a little ring from his finger, and returned it to him bathed in his wound, leaving to him an inherited token and the memory of his blood. And then, lifeless, he is cast down with the rest, to be slaughtered in the usual place. And when the populace called for them into the midst, that as the sword penetrated into their body, they might make their eyes partners in the murder, they rose up of their own accord, and transferred themselves whither the people wished. But they first kissed one another, that they might consummate their martyrdom with the kiss of peace. The rest indeed, immovable, and in silence, received the sword thrust, much more Satyrus, who also had first ascended the ladder, and first gave up his spirit, for he was also waiting for Perpetua. But Perpetua, that she might taste some pain, being pierced between the ribs, cried out loudly, and she herself placed the wavering right hand of the youthful gladiator to her throat. Possibly such a woman could not have been slain unless she herself had willed it, because she was feared by the impure spirit. O oh, most brave and blessed martyrs, O oh, truly called and chosen unto the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ, whom whoever magnifies and honors and adores assuredly ought to read these examples for the edification of the church, not less than the ancient ones, so that new virtues also may testify that one and the same Holy Spirit is always operating even until now, and God the Father omnipotent and His Son Jesus Christ our Lord, whose is the glory and infinite power for ever and ever. Amen. End of the Martyrdom of Perpetua and Felicitas by Tertullian The Soul's Testimony by Tertullian This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Read by David Ronald The Soul's Testimony by Tertullian If, with the object of convicting the rivals and persecutors of the Christian truth, from their own authorities of the crime of at once being untrue to themselves and doing injustice to us, one is bent on gathering testimonies in its favor from the writings of the philosophers or the poets or other masters of this world's learning and wisdom. He has need of a most inquisitive spirit and a still greater memory to carry out the research. Indeed, some of our people who still continued their inquisitive labors in ancient literature and still occupied memory with it have published works we have in our hands of this very sort, works in which they relate and attest the nature and origin of their traditions and the grounds on which opinions rest, 
and from which it may be seen at once that we have embraced nothing new or monstrous, nothing for which we cannot claim the support of ordinary and well-known writings, whether in ejecting error from our creed or admitting truth to it. But the unbelieving hardness of the human heart leads them to slight even their own teachers, otherwise approved and in high renown whenever they touch upon arguments which are used in defense of Christianity. Then the poets are fools when they describe the gods with human passions and stories. Then the philosophers are without reason when they knock at the gates of truth. He will thus far be reckoned a wise and sagacious man who has gone the length of uttering sentiments that are almost Christian, while if, in a mere affection of judgment and wisdom, he sets himself to reject their ceremonies, or to convicting the world of its sin, he is sure to be branded as a Christian." We will have nothing, then, to do with the literature and the teaching perverted in its best results, which is believed in its errors rather than its truth. We shall lay no stress on it if some of their authors have declared that there is one God, and one God only. Nay, let it be granted that there is nothing in heathen writers which a Christian approves, that it may be put out of his power to utter a single word of reproach, for all are not familiar with their teachings, and those who are have no assurance in regard to their truth. Far less do men assent to our writings, to which no one comes for guidance unless he is already a Christian. I call in a new testimony, yea, one which is better known than all literature, more discussed than all doctrine, more public than all publications, greater than the whole man, I mean, all which is man's. Stand forth, O soul." whether thou art a divine and eternal substance as most philosophers believe if it be so thou wilt be the less likely to lie or whether thou art the very opposite of divine because indeed a mortal thing as epicurus alone thinks in that case there will be the less temptation for thee to speak falsely in this case whether thou art received from heaven or sprung from earth whether thou art formed of numbers or of atoms whether thine existence begins with that of the body, or thou art put into it at a later stage, from whatever source and in whatever way, thou makest man a rational being, in the highest degree capable of thought and knowledge, stand forth and give thy witness. But I call thee not, as when, fashioned in schools, trained in libraries, fed in attic academies and porticos, thou belchest wisdom. I address thee simple rude, uncultured, and untaught, such as they have thee who have thee only, that very thing of the road, the street, the workshop, holy. I want thine inexperience, since in thy small experience no one feels any confidence. I demand of thee the things thou bringest with thee into man, which thou knowest either from thyself or from thine author, whoever he may be. Thou art not, as I well know, Christian, for a man becomes a Christian, he is not born one. Yet Christians earnestly press thee for a testimony. They press thee, though an alien, to bear witness against thy friends, that they may be put to shame before thee, for hating and mocking us on account of things which convict thee as an accessory. We give offense by proclaiming that there is one God, to whom the name of God alone belongs, from whom all things come, and who is Lord of the whole universe. Bear thy testimony, if thou knowest this to be the truth, for openly and with a perfect liberty, such as we do not possess, we hear thee both in private and in public exclaim, quote, which may God grant, end quote, and, quote, if God so will, end quote. By expressions such as these, thou declarest that there is one who is distinctively God, and thou confesseth that all power belongs to him to whose will, as sovereign, thou dost look. At the same time, too, thou deniest any others to be truly gods, in calling them by their own names of Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, Minerva, for thou affirmest him to be God alone, to whom thou givest no other name than God, and though thou sometimes callest these others gods, thou plainly usest the designation as one which does not really belong to them, but is, so to speak, a borrowed one. Nor is the nature of the god we declare unknown to thee, quote, God is good, God does good, end quote. 
thou art wont to say, plainly suggesting further, quote, but man is evil, end quote, in asserting an antithetic proposition, thou, in a sort of indirect and figurative way, reproachest man with his wickedness in departing from a god so good, so, again, as among us, as belonging to the god of benignity and goodness, blessing is a most sacred act in our religion and our life, thou too sayest as readily as a Christian needs, quote, God bless thee, end quote, and when thou turnest the blessing of God into a curse, in like manner thy very words confess with us that his power over us is absolute and entire. There are some who, though they do not deny the existence of God, hold withal that he is neither searcher, nor ruler, nor judge, treating with especial disdain those of us who go over to Christ out of fear of a coming judgment, as they think, honoring God in freeing him from the cares of keeping watch, and the trouble of taking note, not even regarding him as capable of anger. For if God, they say, gets angry, then he is susceptible of corruption and passion, but that of which passion and corruption can be affirmed may also perish, which God cannot do. But these very persons elsewhere, confessing that the soul is divine and bestowed on us by God, stumble against the testimony of the soul itself, which affords an answer to these views. For if either divine or God-given, it doubtless knows its giver, and if it knows him, it undoubtedly fears him too, and especially as having been by him endowed so amply. Has it no fear of him, whose favor it is so desirous to possess, and whose anger it is so anxious to avoid? Whence, then, the soul's natural fear of God, if God cannot be angry? How is there any dread of him whom nothing offends? What is feared but anger? Whence comes anger but from observing what is done? What leads to watchful oversight but judgment and prospect? Whence is judgment but from power? To whom does supreme authority and power belong but to God alone? So thou art always ready, O soul, from thine own knowledge, nobody casting scorn upon thee, and no one preventing, to exclaim, quote, God sees all, end quote, and, quote, I commend thee to God, end quote, and, quote, God may repay, end quote, and, quote, God shall judge between us, end quote. How happens this, since thou art not Christian? How is it that, even with the garland of Ceres on the brow, wrapped in the purple cloak of Saturn, wearing the white robe of the goddess Isis, thou invokest God as judge, standing under the statue of Aesculapius, adorning the brazen image of Juno, arraying the helmet of Minerva with dusky figures, thou never thinkest of appealing to any of these deities. In thine own forum thou appealest to a god who is elsewhere. Thou permittest honor to be rendered in thy temples to a foreign god. O, oh, striking testimony to the truth, which in the very midst of demons obtains a witness for us Christians. But when we say that there are demons, as though, in the simple fact that we alone expelled them from the men's bodies, we did not also prove their existence, some disciple of Chrysippus begins to curl the lip. Yet thy curses sufficiently attest that there are such beings, and that they are objects of thy strong dislike. As what comes to thee as a fit expression of thy strong hatred of him, thou callest the man a demon who annoys thee with his filthiness, or malice, or insolence, or any other vice which we ascribe to evil spirits. In expressing vexation, contempt, or abhorrence, thou hast Satan constantly upon thy lips, the very same we hold to be the angel of evil, the source of error, the corrupter of the whole world, by whom in the beginning man was entrapped into breaking the commandment of God, and the man being given over to death on account of his sin, the entire human race, tainted in their descent from him, were made a channel for transmitting his condemnation. Thou seest, then, thy destroyer, and though he is fully known only to Christians, or to whatever sect, confesses the Lord, yet even thou hast some acquaintance with him, while yet thou abhorrest him.
even now, as the matter refers to thy opinion on a point the more closely belonging to thee, in so far as it bears on thy personal well-being, we maintain that after life has passed away thou still remainest in existence, and lookest forward to a day of judgment, and according to thy deserts, art assigned to misery or bliss, in either way of it for ever, that, to be capable of this, thy former substance must needs return to thee, the matter and the memory of the very same human being, for neither good nor evil couldst thou feel if thou wert not endowed again with that sensitive bodily organization, and there would be no grounds for judgment without the presentation of the very person to whom the sufferings of judgment were due. That Christian view, though much nobler than the Pythagorean, as it does not transfer thee into beasts, though more complete than the Platonic, since it endows thee again with a body, though more worthy of honor than the Epicurean, as it preserves thee from annihilation, yet, because of the name connected with it, it is held to be nothing but vanity and folly, and, as it is called, a mere presumption. But we are not ashamed of ourselves if our presumption is found to have thy support. Well, in the first place, when thou speakest of one who is dead, thou sayest of him, Poor man, poor surely, not because he has been taken from the good life, but because he has been given over to punishment and condemnation. But at another time thou speakest of the dead as free from trouble. Thou professest to think life a burden and death a blessing. Thou art wont, too, to speak of the dead as in repose, when, returning to their graves beyond the city gates, with food and dainties, thou art wont to present offerings to thyself rather than to them, or when, coming from the graves again, thou art staggering under the effects of wine. But I want thy sober opinion. Thou callest the dead poor when thou speakest thine own thoughts, when thou art at a distance from them. For at their feast, when in a sense they are present and recline along with thee, it would never do to cast reproach upon their lot. Thou canst not but adulate those for whose sake thou art feasting it so sumptuously. Dost thou then speak of him as poor who feels not? How happens it that thou cursest as one capable of suffering from thy curse the man whose memory comes back on thee with the sting in it of some old injury it is thine imprecation that quote, the earth may lie heavy on him end quote, and that there may be trouble quote, to his ashes in the realm of the dead end quote. in like manner in thy kindly feeling to him to whom thou art indebted for favors thou entreatest quote, repose to his bones and ashes end quote. and thy desire is that among the dead that he may quote, have pleasant rest. End quote. If thou hast no power of suffering after death, if no feeling remains, if, in a word, severance from the body is the annihilation of thee, what makes thee lie against thyself, as if thou couldst suffer in another state? Nay, why dost thou fear death at all? There is nothing after death to be feared, if there is nothing to be felt. For though it may be said that death is dreadful, not for anything it threatens afterwards, but because it deprives us of the good life, yet, on the other hand, as it puts an end to life's discomforts, which are far more numerous, death's terrors are mitigated by a gain that more than outweighs the loss, and there is no occasion to be troubled about a loss of good things, which is amply made up for by so great a blessing as relief from every trouble." There is nothing dreadful in that which delivers from all that is to be dreaded. If thou shrinkest from giving up life because thy experience of it has been sweet, at any rate there is no need to be in any alarm about death if thou hast no knowledge that it is evil. Thy dread of it is the proof that thou art aware of its evil. Thou wouldst never think it evil, thou wouldst have no fear of it at all, if thou wert not sure that after it there is something to make it evil, and so a thing of terror. Let us leave unnoted at this time that natural way of fearing death. It is a poor thing for any one to fear what is inevitable. I take up the other side, and argue on the ground of a joyful hope beyond our term of earthly life. For desire of posthumous fame is with almost every class an inborn thing. 
I have not time to speak of the Curti and the Reguli or the brave men of Greece who afford us innumerable cases of death despised for after renown, who at this day is without the desire that he may be often remembered when he is dead, who does not give all endeavor to preserve his name by works of literature or by the simple glory of his virtues or by the splendor even of his tomb. How is it the nature of the soul to have these posthumous ambitions and with such amazing effort to prepare the things it can only use after decease? It would care nothing about the future if the future were quite unknown to it. But perhaps thou thinkest thyself sure, after thy exit from the body, of continuing still to feel than of any future resurrection, which is a doctrine laid at our door as one of our presumptuous suppositions. But it is also the doctrine of the soul, for if any one inquires about a person lately dead as though he were alive, it occurs at once to say, quote, He has gone, end quote. He is expected to return then. These testimonies of the soul are simple as true, commonplace as simple, universal as commonplace, natural as universal, divine as natural. I don't think they can appear frivolous or feeble to any one if he reflect on the majesty of nature from which the soul derives its authority. If you acknowledge the authority of the mistress, you will own it also in the disciple. Well, Nature is the mistress here, and her disciple is the soul, but everything the one has taught or the other learned has come from God the teacher of the teacher. And what the soul may know from the teachings of its chief instructor, thou canst judge from that which is within thee. Think of that which enables thee to think. Reflect on that which in forebodings is the prophet, the augur in omens, the foreseer of coming events. Is it a wonderful thing, if, being the gift of God to man, it knows how to divine? Is it anything very strange, if it knows the God by whom it was bestowed, even fallen as it is, the victim of the great adversary's machinations? It does not forget its creator, his goodness and law, and the final end both of itself and of its foe. Is it singular, then, if, divine in its origin, its revelations agree with the knowledge God has given to his own people. But he who does not regard those outbursts of the soul as the teaching of a congenital nature and the secret deposit of an inborn knowledge will say that the habit and, so to say, the vice of speaking in this way has been acquired and confirmed from the opinions of published books widely spread among men. Unquestionably, the soul existed before letters, and speech before books, and ideas before the writing of them, and man himself before the poet and philosopher. Is it then to be believed that before literature and its publication, no utterances of the sort we have pointed out came from the lips of men? Did nobody speak of God and his goodness, nobody of death, nobody of the dead? Speech went a-bagging, I suppose, nay, the subjects being still a-wanting, without which it cannot even exist at this day, when it is so much more copious and rich and wise, it could not exist at all if the things which are now so easily suggested, that cling to us so constantly, that are so very near to us, that are somehow born on our very lips, had no existence in ancient times, before letters had any existence in the world before there was a mercury, I think, at all. And whence was it, I pray, that letters themselves came to know and to disseminate for the use of speech what no mind had ever conceived or tongue put forth or ear taken in? But, clearly, since the scriptures of God, whether belonging to Christians or to Jews, into whose olive tree we have been grafted, are much more ancient than any secular literature, or let us only say, are of a somewhat earlier date, as we have shown in its proper place when proving their trustworthiness, if the soul have taken these utterances from writings at all, we must believe it has taken them from ours and not from yours, its instruction coming more naturally from the earlier than the later works. 
which latter indeed waited for their own instruction from the former, and though we grant that light has come from you, still it has flowed from the first fountainhead originally, and we claim as entirely ours as you may have taken from us and handed down. Since it is thus, it matters little whether the soul's knowledge was put into it by God or by his book. Why then, O oh man, wilt thou maintain a view so groundless as that those testimonies of the soul have gone forth from the mere human speculations of your literature and got hardening of common use? Believe then your own books, and as to our scriptures, so much the more believe writings which are divine. But in the witness of the soul itself, give like confidence to nature. Choose the one of these you observe to be the most faithful friend of truth. If your own writings are distrusted, neither God nor nature lie. And if you would have faith in God and nature, have faith in the soul. Thus you will believe yourself. Certainly you value the soul as giving you your true greatness, that to which you belong, which is all things to you, without which you can neither live nor die, on whose account you even put God away from you. Since then, you fear to become a Christian, call the soul before you, and put her to question. Why does she worship another? Why name the name of God? Why does she speak of demons when she means to denote spirits to be held accursed? Why does she make her protestations towards the heavens, and pronounce her ordinary execrations earthwards? Why does she render service in one place, and another invoke the avenger? Why does she pass judgments on the dead? What Christian phrases are those she has got, though Christians she neither desires to see nor hear? Why has she either bestowed them on us, or received them from us? Why has she either taught us them, or learned them as our scholar? Regard with suspicion this accordance in words, while there is such difference in practice. It is utter folly denying, a universal nature too, ascribe this exclusivity to our language and the Greek, which are regarded among us as so near akin. The soul is not a boon from heaven to Latins and Greeks alone. Man is the one name belonging to every nation upon earth. There is one soul and many tongues, one spirit and various sounds. Every country has its own speech, but the subjects of speech are common to all. God is everywhere, and the goodness of God is everywhere. Demons are everywhere, and the cursing of them is everywhere. The invocation of divine judgment is everywhere. Death is everywhere, and the sense of death is everywhere. And all the world over is found the witness of the soul. There is not a soul of man that does not, from the light that is in itself, proclaim the very things we are not permitted to speak above our breath. Most justly, then, every soul is a culprit, as well as a witness, in the measure that it testifies for truth, the guilt of error lies on it, and on the day of judgment it will stand before the courts of God without a word to say, Thou proclaimest God, O soul, but thou didst not seek to know him. Evil spirits were detested by thee, and yet they were the objects of thy adoration. The punishments of hell were foreseen by thee, but no care was taken to avoid them. Thou hadst the savour of Christianity, and withal wert the persecutor of Christians. End of the Testimony of the Soul by Tertullian Read by David Ronald Part 1 of Prescription Against Heretics by Tertullian, read by David Ronald. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The character of the times in which we live is such as to call forth from us even this admonition that we ought not to be astonished at the heresies which abound, neither ought their existence to surprise us, for it was foretold that they should come to pass, nor the fact that they subvert the faith of some, for their final cause is, by affording a trial to faith, to give it also the opportunity of being approved. Groundless, therefore, and inconsiderate, is the offense of the many who are scandalized by the very fact that heresies prevail to such a degree. How great might their offense have been if they had not existed, when it has been determined that a thing must by all means be, it receives the final cause for which it has its being. 
This secures the power through which it exists in such a way that it is impossible for it not to have existence. Taking the similar case of fever, which is appointed a place amongst all other deathly and excruciating issues of life for destroying man, we are not surprised either that it exists, for there it is, or that it consumes man, for that is the purpose of its existence. In like manner, with respect to heresies, which are produced for the weakening and the extinction of faith, since we feel a dread because they have this power, we should first dread the fact of their existence. For as long as they exist, they have their power, and as long as they have their power, they have their existence. But still, fever, as being an evil both in its cause and in its power, as all know, we rather loathe than wonder at and to the best of our power guard against not having its extirpation in our power. Some men prefer wondering at heresies, however, which bring with them eternal death and the heat of a stronger fire, for possessing this power instead of avoiding their power when they have the means of escape. But heresies would have no power if men would cease to wonder that they have such power. For it either happens that, while men wonder, they fall into a snare, or, because they are ensnared, they cherish their surprise, as if heresies were so powerful because of some truth which belonged to them. It would no doubt be a wonderful thing that evil should have any force of its own, were it not that heresies are strong in those persons who are not strong in faith. In a combat of boxers and gladiators, generally speaking, it is not because a man is strong that he gains the victory or loses it because he is not strong, but because he who is vanquished was a man of no strength. And indeed, this very conqueror, when afterwards matched against a really powerful man, actually retires crestfallen from the contest. In precisely the same way, Heresies derive such strength as they have from the infirmities of individuals, having no strength whenever they encounter a really powerful faith. It is usual, indeed, with persons of a weaker character, to be so built up in confidence by certain individuals who are caught by heresy as to topple over into ruin themselves. How comes it to pass, they ask, that this woman or that man who are the most faithful, the most prudent, and the most approved in the church have gone over to the other side? Who that asks such a question does not in fact reply to it himself, to the effect that men whom heresies have been able to pervert ought never to have been esteemed prudent or faithful or approved. This again is, I suppose, an extraordinary thing that one who has been approved should afterwards fall back. Saul, who was good beyond all others, is afterwards subverted by envy. David, a good man after the Lord's own heart, is guilty afterwards of murder and adultery. Solomon, endowed by the Lord with all grace and wisdom, is led into idolatry by women. For to the Son of God alone was it reserved to persevere to the last without sin. But what if a bishop, if a deacon, if a widow, if a virgin, if a doctor, if even a martyr, have fallen from the rule of faith, will heresies on that account appear to possess the truth? Do we prove the faith by the persons, or the persons by the faith? No one is wise, no one is faithful, no one excels in dignity, but the Christian, and no one is a Christian but he who perseveres even to the end." You, as a man, know any other man from the outside appearance. You think as you see, and you see as far only as you have eyes. But, says the scripture, the eyes of the Lord are lofty. Man looketh at the outward appearance, but God looketh at the heart. The Lord beholdeth, and knoweth them that are his. And the plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted, he rooted up. And the first shall, as he shows, be last and he carries his fan in his hand to purge his threshing floor. Let the chaff of a fickle faith fly off as much as it will at every blast of temptation. All the pure will be that heap of corn which shall be laid up in the garner of the Lord. Did not certain of the disciples turn back from the Lord himself when they were offended? Yet the rest did not therefore think that they must turn away from following him. But because they knew that he was the word of life and was come from God, They continued in his company to the very last, 
after he had gently inquired of them whether they would also go astray. It is a comparatively small thing that certain men, like Phygelus and Hermogenes and Philetus and Hymenaeus, deserted his apostle. The betrayer of Christ was himself one of the apostles. We are surprised at seeing his churches forsaken by some men, although the things which we suffer after the example of Christ himself show us to be Christians. They went out from us, says St. John, but they were not of us. If they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But let us rather be mindful of the sayings of the Lord and the letters of the apostles, for they have both told us beforehand that there shall be heresies, and have given us, in anticipation, warnings to avoid them, and inasmuch as we are not alarmed because they exist, so we ought not to wonder that they are capable of doing that, on account of which they must be shunned. The Lord teaches us that many ravening wolves shall come in sheep's clothing. Now, what are these sheep's clothings but the external surface of the Christian profession? Who are the ravening wolves but those deceitful senses and spirits which are lurking within to waste the flock of Christ? Who are the false prophets but deceptive predictors of the future? Who are the false apostles but the preachers of a spurious gospel? Who are the antichrists both now and evermore but the men who rebel against Christ? Heresies at the present time will no less rend the church by their perversion of doctrine than will the Antichrist persecute her at that day by the cruelty of his attacks, except that persecution makes even martyrs, but heresy only apostates. And therefore, heresies must needs be in order that they which are approved might be made manifest, but those who remained steadfast under persecution and those who did not wander out of their way into heresy. For the apostle does not mean that those persons should be deemed approved who exchange their creed for heresy, although they contrariously interpret his words to their own side when he says in another passage, Prove all things, hold fast that which is good, as if, after proving all things amiss, one might, not through error, make a determined choice of some evil thing. Moreover, when he blames dissensions and schisms, which undoubtedly are evils, he immediately adds heresies likewise. Now that, which he subjoins to evil things, he of course confesses to be itself an evil, and all the greater, indeed, because he tells us that his belief of their schisms and dissensions was grounded on his knowledge that there must be heresies also. For he shows us that it was owing to the prospect of the greater evil that he readily believed the existence of the lighter ones, and so far indeed was he from believing, in respect of evils of such a kind, that heresies were good, that his object was to forewarn us that we ought not to be surprised at temptations of even a worse stamp, since he said they tended to make manifest all such as were approved. In other words, those whom they were unable to pervert. In short, since the whole passage points to the maintenance of unity and the checking of divisions, inasmuch as heresies sever men from unity no less than schisms and dissensions, no doubt he classes heresies under the same head of censure as he does schisms and also dissensions. And by so doing, he makes those to be not approved who have fallen into heresies, more especially when with reproofs he exhorts men to turn away from such, teaching them that they should all speak and think the selfsame thing, the very object which heresies do not permit. On this point, however, we dwell no longer, since it is the same Paul who, in his epistle to the Galatians, counts heresies among the sins of the flesh, who also intimates to Titus that a man who is a heretic must be rejected after the first admonition, on the ground that he that is such is perverted and committeth sin as a self-condemned man. Indeed, in almost every epistle, when enjoining on us the duty of avoiding false doctrines, he sharply condemns heresies. Of these, the practical effects are false doctrines, called in Greek, heresies, a word used in the same sense of that choice which a man makes when he either teaches them to others or takes up with them for himself. For this reason, it is that he calls the heretic self-condemned, because he has himself chosen that for which he is condemned. 
We, however, are not permitted to cherish any object after our own will, not yet to make choice of that which another has introduced of his private fancy. In the Lord's apostles we possess our authority, for even they did not of themselves choose to introduce anything, but faithfully delivered to the nations of mankind the doctrine which they had received from Christ. If, therefore, even an angel from heaven should preach any other gospel than theirs, he would be called accursed by us. The Holy Ghost had even then foreseen that there would be in a certain virgin called Philomene an angel of deceit, transformed into an angel of light, by whose miracles and illusions Apelles was led when he introduced his new heresy. These are the doctrines of men and of demons, produced for itching ears of the spirit of this world's wisdom, this the Lord called foolishness, and chose the foolish things of the world to confound even philosophy itself. For philosophy it is, which is the material of the world's wisdom, the rash interpreter of the nature and the dispensation of God. Indeed, heresies are themselves instigated by philosophy. From this source came the aeons, and I know not what infinite forms, and the trinity of man in the system of Valentinus, who was of Plato's school. From the same source came Marcion's better God, with all his tranquillity. He came of the Stoics. Then, again, the opinion that the soul dies is held by the Epicureans, while the denial of the restoration of the body is taken from the aggregate school of all the philosophers. Also, when matter is made equal to God, then you have the teaching of Zeno, and when any doctrine is alleged touching a god of fire, then Heraclitus comes in. The same subject matter is discussed over and over again by the heretics and the philosophers. The same arguments are involved. Whence comes evil? Why is it permitted? What is the origin of man? And in what way does he come? Besides the question, which Valentinus has very lately proposed, whence comes God? Which he settles with the answer, from enthymesis and ectroma. Unhappy Aristotle, who invented for these men dialectics, the art of building up and pulling down, an art so evasive in its propositions, so far-fetched in its conjectures, so harsh in its arguments, so productive of contentions, embarrassing even to itself, retracting everything, and really treating of nothing. Whence spring those fables and endless genealogies, and unprofitable questions, and words which spread like a cancer. From all these, when the apostle would restrain us, he expressly names philosophy as that which he would have us be on our guard against. Writing to the Colossians, he says, See that no one beguile you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, and contrary to the wisdom of the Holy Ghost. He had been at Athens, and had, in his interviews with its philosophers, become acquainted with that human wisdom which pretends to know the truth whilst it only corrupts it and is itself divided into its own manifold heresies by the variety of its mutually repugnant sects what indeed has athens to do with jerusalem what concord is there between the academy and the church what between heretics and christians our instruction comes from the porch of solomon who had himself taught that the Lord should be sought in simplicity of heart. Away with all attempts to produce a modeled Christianity of Stoic, Platonic, and dialectic composition, we want no curious disputation after possessing Christ Jesus, no inquisition after enjoying the gospel. With our faith we desire no further belief, for this is our palmary faith, that there is nothing which we ought to believe besides. I come now to the point which is urged both by our own brethren and by the heretics. Our brethren adduce it as a pretext for entering on curious inquiries, and the heretics insist on it for importing the scrupulosity of their unbelief. It is written, they say, Seek, and ye shall find. Let us remember at what time the Lord said this. I think it was at the very outset of his teaching, when there was still a doubt felt by all whether he were the Christ, and when even Peter had not yet declared him to be the Son of God, and John, Baptist, had actually ceased to feel assurance about him. 
With good reason, therefore, was it then said, Seek, and ye shall find, when inquiry was still be to made of him who was not yet become known. Besides, this was said in respect of the Jews, for it is to them that the whole matter of this reproof pertains, seeing that they had a revelation where they might seek Christ. They have, says he, Moses and Elias, in other words, the law and the prophets, which preach Christ. As also in another place he says plainly, Search the scriptures in which ye expect to find salvation, for they testify of me, which will be the meaning of Seek and ye shall find, for it is clear that the next words also apply to the Jews, Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. The Jews had formerly been in covenant with God, but being afterwards cast off on account of their sins, they began to be without God. The Gentiles, on the contrary, had never been in covenant with God. They were only as a drop from a bucket, and as dust from the threshing floor, and were ever outside the door. Now, how shall he who has always outside knock at the place where he never was? What door does he know of when he has passed through none, either by entrance or ejection? Is it not rather he who is aware that he once lived within and was thrust out that probably found the door and knocked thereat? In like manner, ask and ye shall receive is suitably said to one who is aware from whom he ought to ask, by whom also some promise had been given, that is to say, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. Now the Gentiles knew nothing either of him or of any of his promises, Therefore it was to Israel that he spake, when he said, I am not sent, but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Not yet had he cast to the dogs the children's bread. Not yet did he charge them to go into the way of the Gentiles. It is only at the last that he instructs them to go and teach all nations and baptize them, when they were so soon to receive the Holy Ghost, the Comforter, who should guide them into all truth. And this, too, makes towards the same conclusion. If the apostles who were ordained to be teachers to the Gentiles were themselves to have the Comforter for their teacher, far more needless was it to say to us, Seek, and ye shall find, to whom was to come, without research, our instruction by the apostles, and to the apostles themselves by the Holy Ghost. All the Lord's sayings, indeed, are set forth for all men, through the ears of the Jews have they passed unto us. Still most of them were addressed to Jewish persons. They therefore did not constitute instruction properly designed for ourselves, but rather an example. I now purposely relinquish this ground of argument. Let it be granted that the words, Seek, and ye shall find, were addressed to all men equally. Yet even here, one's aim is, carefully to determine the sense of the words, consistently with that reason, which is the guiding principle in all interpretation. Now, no divine saying is so unconnected and diffuse that its words only are to be insisted on and their connection left undetermined. But at the outset, I lay down this position that there is some one and therefore definite thing taught by Christ, which the Gentiles are by all means bound to believe, and for that purpose to seek, in order that they may be able, when they have found it, to believe. However, there can be no indefinite seeking for that which has been taught as one only definite thing. You must seek until you find and believe when you have found nor have you anything further to do but to keep what you have believed, provided you believe this besides, that nothing else is to be believed, and therefore nothing else is to be sought. After you have found and believed what has been taught by him who charges you to seek no other thing than that which he has taught, when, indeed, any man doubts about this, proof will be forthcoming that we have in our possession that which was taught by Christ. Meanwhile, such is my confidence in our proof that I anticipate it in the shape of an admonition to certain persons not to seek anything beyond what they have believed, that this is what they ought to have sought, how to avoid interpreting, seek and ye shall find, without regard to the rule of reason.
Now the reason of this saying is comprised in three points, in the matter, in the time, in the limit. In the matter, so that you must consider what it is you have to seek, in the time when you have to seek, in the limit, how long. What you have to seek, then, is that which Christ has taught, and you must go on seeking, of course, for such time as you fail to find, until, indeed, you find it. But you have succeeded in finding when you have believed, for you would not have believed if you had not found, as neither would you have sought except with a view to find. Your object, therefore, in seeking was to find, and your object in finding was to believe. All further delay for seeking and finding you have prevented by believing. The very fruit of your seeking has determined for you this limit. This boundary has he set for you himself, who is unwilling that you should believe anything else than what he has taught, or, therefore, even seek for it. If, however, because so many other things have been taught by one and another, we are on that account bound to go on seeking, so long as we are able to find anything, we must, at that rate, be ever seeking, and never believe anything at all. For where shall be the end of seeking? Where the stop in believing, where the completion in finding, shall it be with Marcion? But even Valentinus proposes to us the maxim, Seek, and ye shall find. Then shall it be with Valentinus? Well, but Apelles too will assail me with the same quotation. Hebion also, and Simon, and all in turn, have no other argument wherewithal to entice me, and draw me over to their side. Thus I shall be nowhere, and still be encountering that challenge, seek, and ye shall find, precisely as if I had no resting place, as if, indeed, I had never found that which Christ has taught, that which ought to be sought, that which must needs be believed. There is impunity in erring, if there is no delinquency, although, indeed, to err, it is itself an act of delinquency. With impunity, I repeat, does a man ramble, when he purposely deserts nothing. But yet, if I have believed what I was bound to believe, and then afterwards think that there is something new to be sought after, I of course expect that there is something else to be found, although I should by no means entertain such expectation, unless it were because I either had not believed, although I apparently had become a believer, or else have ceased to believe. If I thus desert my faith, I am found to be a denier thereof." Once for all, I would say, no man seeks except him who either never possessed or else has lost what he sought. The old woman in the gospel had lost one of her ten pieces of silver, and therefore she sought it. When, however, she found it, she ceased to look for it. The neighbor was without bread, and therefore he knocked. But as soon as the door was opened to him and he received the bread, he discontinued knocking. The widow kept asking to be heard by the judge, because she was not admitted. But when her suit was heard, thenceforth she was silent. So that there is a limit both to seeking, and to knocking, and to asking. For to every one that asketh, says he, it shall be given, and to him that knocketh, it shall be opened, and by him that seeketh, it shall be found. Away with the man who is ever seeking, because he never finds. For he seeks, there where nothing can be found." Away with him who is always knocking, because it will never be open to him, for he knocks where there is none to open. Away with him who is always asking, because he will never be heard, for he asks of one who does not hear. As for us, although we must still seek, and that always, yet where ought our search to be made? Amongst the heretics, where all things are foreign and opposed to our own verity, and to whom we are forbidden to draw near? What slave looks for food from a stranger, not to say an enemy of his master? What soldier expects to get bounty and pay from kings who are unallied, I might almost say hostile, unless forsooth he be a deserter and a runaway and a rebel? Even that old woman searched for the piece of silver within her own house. It was also at his neighbor's door that the persevering assailant kept knocking. Nor was it to a hostile judge, although a severe one, that the widow made her appeal. 
No man gets instruction from that which tends to destruction. No man receives illumination from a quarter where all is darkness. Let our seeking, therefore, be in that which is our own, and from those who are our own, and concerning that which is our own, that and only that which can become an object of inquiry without impairing the rule of faith. Now, with regard to this rule of faith, that we may from this point acknowledge what it is which we defend, it is, you must know, that which prescribes the belief that there is one only God, and that he is none other than the creator of the world, who produced all things out of nothing through his own word, first of all sent forth that this word is called his son, and under the name of God was seen in diverse manners by the patriarchs, heard at all times in the prophets, at last brought down by the spirit and power of the father into the virgin mary was made flesh in her womb and being born of her went forth as jesus christ thenceforth he preached the new law and the new promise of the kingdom of heaven worked miracles having been crucified he rose again the third day then having ascended into the heavens he sat at the right hand of the father sent instead of himself the power of the holy ghost to lead such as believe will come with glory to take the saints to the enjoyment of everlasting life of the heavenly promises and to condemn the wicked to everlasting fire after the resurrection of both these classes shall have happened together with the restoration of their flesh this rule as it will be proved was taught by christ and raises amongst ourselves no other questions than those which heresies introduce and which make men heretics so long however as its form exists in its proper order you may seek and discuss as much as you please and give full rein to your curiosity in whatever seems to you to hang in doubt or to be shrouded in obscurity you have at hand no doubt some learned brother gifted with the grace of knowledge some one of the experienced class some one of your close acquaintance who is curious like yourself although with yourself a seeker he will after all be quite aware that it is better for you to remain in ignorance lest you should come to know what you ought not because you have acquired the knowledge of what you ought to know thy faith he says hath saved thee not observe your skill in the scriptures now faith has been deposited in the rule it has a law and in the observance thereof salvation skill however consists in curious art having for its glory simply the readiness that comes from knack let such curious art give place to faith let such glory yield to salvation at any rate let them either relinquish their nosiness or else be quiet to know nothing in opposition to the rule of faith is to know all things suppose that heretics were not enemies to the truth so that we were not forewarned to avoid them what sort of conduct would it be to agree with men who do themselves confess that they are still seeking for if they are still seeking they have not as yet found anything amounting to certainty and therefore whatever they seem for a while to hold they betray their own scepticism whilst they continue seeking you therefore who seek after their fashion looking to those who are themselves ever seeking a doubter to doubters a waverer to waverers must needs be led blindly by the blind down into the ditch but when for the sake of deceiving us they pretend that they are still seeking in order that they may palm their essays upon us by the suggestion of an anxious sympathy when in short after gaining an access to us they proceed at once to insist on the necessity of our inquiring into such points as they were in the habit of advancing then it is high time for us in moral obligation to repel them so that they may know that it is not christ but themselves whom we disavow for since they are still seekers they have no fixed tenants yet and being not fixed in tenant they have not yet believed and being not yet believers they are not christians but even though they have their tenets and their belief they still say that inquiry is necessary in order to discussion previous however to the discussion they deny what they confess not yet to have believed so long as they keep it an object of inquiry when men therefore are not christians even on their own admission how much more do they fail to appear such to us 
what sort of truth is that which they patronize when they commend it to us with a lie? Well, but they actually treat of the scriptures and recommend their opinions out of the scriptures. To be sure they do. From what other source could they derive arguments concerning the things of faith except from the records of the faith? We are therefore come to the gist of our position, for at this point we were aiming, and for this we were preparing in the preamble of our address, which we have just completed, so that we may now join issue on the contention to which our adversaries challenge us. They put forward the scriptures, and by this insolence of theirs they at once influence some. The encounter itself, however, they weary the strong, they catch the weak, and dismiss waverers with a doubt. Accordingly, we oppose to them this step above all others of not admitting them to any discussion of the scriptures. If in these lie their resources before they can use them, it ought to be clearly seen to whom belongs the possession of the scriptures, that none may be admitted to the use thereof who has no title at all to the privilege. I might be thought to have laid down this position to remedy distrust in my case, or from a desire of entering on the contest in some other way, were there not reasons on my side, especially this, that our faith owes deference to the apostle who forbids us to enter on questions, or to lend our ears to new-fangled statements, or to consort with the heretic after the first and second admonition, not, be it observed, after discussion. Discussion he has inhibited in this way, by designating admonition as the purpose of dealing with the heretic, and the first one too, because he is not a Christian, in order that he might not, after the manner of a Christian, seem to require correction again and again, and before two or three witnesses, seeing that he ought to be corrected for the very reason that he is not to be disputed with, and in the next place, because a controversy over the scriptures can clearly produce no other effect then help to upset either the stomach or the brain. Now this heresy of yours does not receive certain scriptures, and whichever of them it does receive, it perverts by means of additions and diminutions for the accomplishment of its own purpose, and such as it does receive, it receives not in their entirety, but even when it does receive any, up to a certain point as entire, it nevertheless perverts even these by the contrivance of diverse interpretations. Truth is just as much opposed by the adulteration of its meaning as it is by a corruption of its text. Their vain presumptions must needs refuse to acknowledge the writings whereby they are refuted. They rely on those which they have falsely put together and which they have selected because of their ambiguity. Though most skilled in the scriptures, you will make no progress when everything which you maintain is denied on the other side, and whatever you deny by them is maintained. As for yourself, indeed, you will lose nothing but your breath, and gain nothing but vexation from their blasphemy. But with respect to the man for whose sake you enter on the discussion of the scriptures, with the view of strengthening him when afflicted with doubts, let me ask, will it be to the truth or rather to heretical opinions that he will lean, influenced by the very fact that he sees you have made no progress whilst the other side is on an equal footing with yourself in denying and in defense, or at any rate on a like standing, he will go away confirmed in his uncertainty by the discussion, not knowing which side to adjudge heretical. For no doubt they too are able to retort these things on us, it is indeed a necessary consequence that they should go so far as to say that adulterations of the scriptures and false expositions thereof are rather introduced by ourselves inasmuch as they, no less than we, maintain that truth is on their side. Our appeal, therefore, must not be made to the scriptures, nor must controversy be admitted on points in which victory will either be impossible or uncertain or not certain enough. But even if a discussion from the scriptures should not turn out in such a way as to place both sides on a par, yet the natural order of things would require that this point should be first proposed, which is now the only one which we must discuss. 
with whom lies that very faith to the scriptures belong, from what, and through whom, and when, and to whom, has been handed down that rule by which men become Christians. For wherever it shall be manifest that the true Christian rule and faith shall be, there will likewise be the true scriptures and expositions thereof, and all the Christian traditions. Christ Jesus our Lord may bear with me a moment in thus expressing myself, whosoever he is, of what God soever he is, the Son, of what substance soever he is man and God, of what faith soever he is, the teacher, of what reward soever he is, the promiser, did, whilst he lived on earth, himself declare what he was, what he had been, what the Father's will was which he was administering, what the duty of man was which he was prescribing, and this declaration he made, either openly to the people or privately to his disciples, of whom he had chosen the twelve chief ones to be at his side, and whom he destined to be the teachers of the nations. Accordingly, after one of these had been struck off, he commanded the eleven others on his departure to the Father to go and teach all nations who were to be baptized into the Father and into the Son and into the Holy Ghost. Immediately, therefore, so did the apostles, whom this designation indicates as the sent. Having on the authority of a prophecy which occurs in a psalm of David, chosen Matthias by lot as the twelfth into the place of Judas, they obtained the promised power of the Holy Ghost for the gift of miracles and of utterance, and after first bearing witness to the faith in Jesus Christ throughout Judea and founding churches there, they next went forth into the world and preached the same doctrine of the same faith to the nations. They then, in like manner, founded churches in every city, from which all the other churches, one after another, derived the tradition of the faith and the seeds of doctrine, and are every day deriving them, that they may become churches. Indeed, it is on this account only that they will be able to deem themselves apostolic as being the offspring of apostolic churches. Every sort of thing must necessarily revert to its original for its classification. Therefore, the churches, although they are so many and so great, comprise but the one primitive church founded by the apostles from which they all spring. In this way, all are primitive and all are apostolic whilst they are all proved to be one, unbroken, unity by their peaceful communion, and title of brotherhood and bond of hospitality, privileges which no other rule directs than the one tradition of the selfsame mystery. From this, therefore, do we draw up our rule, since the Lord Jesus Christ sent the apostles to preach, our rule is that no others ought to be received as preachers than those whom Christ appointed, for no man knoweth the Father save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. Nor does the Son seem to have revealed him to any other than the apostles, whom he set forth to preach, that, of course, which he revealed to them. Now, what that was which they preached, in other words, what it was which Christ revealed to them, can, as I must here likewise prescribe, properly be proved in no other way than by those very churches which the apostles founded in person, by declaring the gospel to them directly themselves, both viva vos, as the phrase is, and subsequently by their epistles. If, then, these things are so, it is in the same degree manifest that all doctrine which agrees with the apostolic churches, those molds and original sources of the faith, must be reckoned for truth as undoubtedly containing that which the said churches received from the apostles, the apostles from Christ, Christ from God, whereas all doctrine must be prejudged as false which savors of contrariety to the truth of the churches and apostles of Christ and God, it remains then that we demonstrate whether this doctrine of ours, of which we have now given the rule, has its origin in the tradition of the apostles, and whether all other doctrines do not ipso facto proceed from falsehood. We hold communion with the apostolic churches because our doctrine is in no respect different from theirs. This is our witness of truth. 
but inasmuch as the proof is so near at hand that if it were at once produced there would be nothing left to be dealt with let us give way for a while to the opposite side if they think that they can find some means of invalidating this rule just as if no proof were forthcoming from us they usually tell us that the apostles did not know all things but herein they are impelled by the same madness whereby they turn round to the very opposite point and declare that the apostles certainly knew all things but did not deliver all things to all persons in either case exposing christ to blame for having sent forth apostles who had either too much ignorance or too little simplicity what man then of sound mind can possibly suppose that they were ignorant of anything whom the lord ordained to be masters or teachers keeping them as he did inseparable from himself in their attendance in their discipleship in their society to whom when they were alone he used to expound all things which were obscure telling them that to them it was given to know those mysteries which it was not permitted the people to understand was anything withheld from the knowledge of peter who is called the rock on which the church should be built who also obtained the keys of the kingdom of heaven with the power of loosing and binding in heaven and on earth was anything again concealed from john the lord's most beloved disciple who used to lean on his breast to whom alone the lord pointed judas out as the traitor whom he commended to mary as a son in his own stead of what could he have meant those to be ignorant to whom he even exhibited his own glory with moses and elias and the father's voice moreover from heaven not as if he thus disapproved of all the rest but because by three witnesses must every word be established after the same fashion too i suppose were they ignorant to whom after his resurrection also he vouchsafed as they were journeying together to expound all the scriptures no doubt he had once said i have yet many things to say unto you but ye cannot hear them now but even then he added when he the spirit of truth shall come he will lead you into all truth he thus shows that there was nothing of which they were ignorant to whom he had promised the future attainment of all truth by help of the spirit of truth and assuredly he fulfilled his promise since it is proved in the acts of the apostles that the holy ghost did come down now they who reject that scripture can neither belong to the holy spirit seeing that they cannot acknowledge that the holy ghost has been sent as yet to the disciples nor can they presume to claim to be a church themselves who positively have no means of proving when and with what swaddling clothes this body was established of so much importance is it to them not to have any proofs for the things which they maintain lest along with them there be introduced damaging exposures of those things which they mendaciously devise now with the view of branding the apostles with some mark of ignorance they put forth the case of peter and them that were with him having been rebuked by paul something therefore they say was wanting in them this they allege in order that they may from this construct that other positions of theirs that a fuller knowledge may possibly have afterwards come over the apostles such as fell to the share of paul when he rebuked those who preceded him i may here say to those who reject the acts of the apostles it is first necessary that you shows us who this paul was both what he was before he was an apostle and how he became an apostle so very great is the use which they make of him in respect of other questions also it is true that he tells us himself that he was a persecutor before he became an apostle still this is not enough for any man who examines before he believes since even the lord himself did not bear witness of himself but let them believe without the scriptures if their object is to believe contrary to the scriptures still they should show from the circumstance which they allege of peter's being rebuked by paul that paul added yet another form of the gospel besides that which peter and the rest had previously set forth 
But the fact is, having been converted from a persecutor to a preacher, he is introduced as one of the brethren to brethren, by brethren to them, indeed, by men who had put on faith from the apostles' hands. Afterwards, as he himself narrates, he went up to Jerusalem for the purpose of seeing Peter, because of his office, no doubt, and by right of a common belief in preaching. Now they certainly would not have been surprised at his having become a preacher instead of a persecutor if his preaching were of something contrary, nor, moreover, would they have glorified the Lord, because Paul had presented himself as an adversary to him. They accordingly even gave him the right hand of fellowship as a sign of their agreement with him, and arranged amongst themselves a distribution of office, not a diversity of gospel, so that they should severally preach not a different gospel, but the same to different persons, Peter to the circumcision, Paul to the Gentiles. For as much then as Peter was rebuked, because, after he had lived with the Gentiles, he proceeded to separate himself from their company out of respect for persons, the fault surely was one of conversation, not of preaching. For it does not appear from this that any other God than the Creator, or any other Christ than the Son of Mary, or any other hope than the Resurrection, was by him announced. I have not the good fortune, or, as I must rather say, I have not the unenviable task of setting apostles by the ears. But inasmuch as our very perverse cavillers obtrude the rebuke in question for the set purpose of bringing the earlier doctrine into suspicion, I will put in a defense, as it were, for Peter, to the effect that even Paul said that he was made all things to all men, to the Jews a Jew, to those who were not Jews as one who was not a Jew, that he might gain all. Therefore, it was according to times and persons and causes that they used to censure certain practices which they would not hesitate themselves to pursue, in like conformity to the times and persons and causes, just as if Peter too had censured Paul, because, whilst forbidding circumcision, he actually circumcised Timothy himself. Never mind those who pass sentence on apostles. It is a happy fact that Peter is on the same level with Paul in the very glory of martyrdom. Now, although Paul was carried away even to the third heaven and was caught up to paradise and heard certain revelations there, yet these cannot possibly seem to have qualified him for teaching another doctrine, seeing that their very nature was such as to render them communicable to no human being. If, however, that unspeakable mystery did leak out and become known to any man, and if any heresy affirms that it does itself follow the same, then either Paul must be charged with having betrayed the secret, or some other man must actually be shown to have been afterwards caught up into paradise, who had permission to speak out plainly what Paul was not allowed even to mutter. But here is, as we have said, the same madness in their allowing indeed that the apostles were ignorant of nothing and preached not any doctrines which contradicted one another, but at the same time insisting that they did not reveal all to all men, for that they proclaimed some openly and to all the world, whilst they disclosed others only in secret and to a few, because Paul addressed even this expression to Timothy, O Timothy, guard that which is entrusted to thee, and again, that good thing which was committed unto thee, keep. What is this deposit? Is it so secret as to be supposed to characterize a new doctrine? Or is it a part of that charge of which he says, This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy? And also of the precept of which he says, I charge thee in the sight of God, who quickeneth all things, and before Jesus Christ, who witnessed a good confession under Pontius Pilate, that thou keep this commandment. Now, what is this commandment, and what is this charge? From the preceding and the succeeding contexts, it will be manifest that there is no mysterious hint darkly suggested in this expression about some far-fetched doctrine, but that a warning is rather given against receiving any other doctrine than that which Timothy had heard from himself, as I take it publicly before many witnesses, is his phrase. Now, 
if they refuse to allow that the church is meant by these many witnesses, it matters nothing, since nothing could have been secret which was produced before many witnesses, nor again must the circumstance of his having wished him to commit these things to faithful men who should be able to teach others also be construed into a proof of their being some occult gospel for when he says these things he refers to the things of which he is writing at the moment in reference however to occult subjects he would have called them as being absent those things not these things to one who had a joint knowledge of them with himself besides which it must have followed that for the man to whom he committed the ministration of the gospel he would add the injunction that it be not ministered in all places and without respect to persons in accordance with the lord saying not to cast one's pearls before swine nor that which is holy unto dogs openly did the lord speak without any intimation of a hidden mystery he had himself commanded that whatsoever they had heard in darkness and in secret they should declare in the light and on the housetops he had himself foreshown by means of a parable that they should not keep back in secret fruitless of interest a single pound that is one word of his he used himself to tell them that a candle was not usually pushed away under a bushel but placed on a candlestick in order to give light to all who are in the house these things the apostles either neglected or failed to understand if they fulfilled them not by concealing any portion of the light that is of the word of god and the mystery of christ of no man i am quite sure were they afraid neither of jews nor of gentiles in their violence with all the greater freedom then would they certainly preach in the church who held not their tongue in synagogues and public places indeed they would have found it impossible either to convert jews or to bring in gentiles unless they set forth in order that which they would have them believe much less when churches were advanced in the faith would they have withdrawn from them anything for the purpose of committing it separately to some few others although even supposing that among intimate friends so to speak they did hold certain discussions yet it is incredible that these could have been such as to bring in some other rule of faith differing from and contrary to that which they were proclaiming through the catholic churches as if they spoke of one god in the church and another at home and described one substance of christ publicly and another secretly and announced one hope of the resurrection before all men and another before the few although they themselves in their epistles besought men that they would all speak one and the same thing and that there should be no divisions and dissensions in the church seeing that they whether paul or others preach the same things moreover they remembered the words let your communication be yea yea nay nay for whatsoever is more than this cometh of evil so that they were not to handle the gospel in a diversity of treatment since therefore it is incredible that the apostles were either ignorant of the whole scope of the message which they had to declare or failed to make known to all men the entire rule of faith let us see whether while the apostles proclaimed it perhaps simply and fully the churches through their own fault set it forth otherwise than the apostles had done all these suggestions of distrust you may find put forward by the heretics they bear in mind how the churches were rebuked by the apostle o foolish galatians who hath bewitched you and ye did run well who hath hindered you and how the epistle actually begins i marvel that ye are so soon removed from him who hath called you as his own in grace to another gospel that they likewise remember what was written to the corinthians that they were yet carnal who required to be fed with milk being as yet unable to bear strong meat, who also thought that they knew somewhat, whereas they knew not yet anything as they ought to know. When they raised the objection that the churches were rebuked, let them suppose that they were also corrected, 
Let them also remember those churches concerning whose faith and knowledge and conversation the apostle rejoices and give thanks to God, which nevertheless even at this day unite with those which were rebuked in the privileges of one and the same institution. Grant then that all have erred, that the apostle was mistaken in giving his testimony, that the Holy Ghost had no such respect to any one church as to lead it into truth, although sent with this view by Christ, and for this asked of the Father that he might be the teacher of truth. Grant also that he, the steward of God, the vicar of Christ, neglected his office, permitting the churches for a time to understand differently and to believe differently what he himself was preaching by the apostles. Is it likely that so many churches, and they so great, should have gone astray into one and the same faith? No casualty distributed among many men issues in one and the same result. Error of doctrine in the churches must necessarily have produced various issues. When, however, that which is deposited among many is found to be one and the same, it is not the result of error, but of tradition. Can any one, then, be reckless enough to say that they were in error who handed on the tradition? End of Prescription Against Heretics, Part 1 by Tertullian Read by David Ronald Part 2 a Prescription Against Heretics by Tertullian Read by David Ronald This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In whatever manner error came, it reigned, of course, only as long as there was an absence of heresies. Truth had to wait for certain Marcionites and Valentinians to set it free. During the interval... The gospel was wrongly preached, men wrongly believed, so many thousands were wrongly baptized, so many works of faith were wrongly wrought, so many miraculous gifts, so many spiritual endowments were wrongly set in operation, so many priestly functions, so many ministries were wrongly executed, and, to sum up the whole, so many martyrs wrongly received their crowns. Else, if not wrongly done, and to no purpose, how comes it to pass that the things of God were on their course before it was known to what God they belonged, that there were Christians before Christ was found, that there were heresies before true doctrine? Not so, for in all cases truth precedes its copy, the likeness succeeds the reality. Absurd enough, however, it is, that heresy should be deemed to have preceded its own prior doctrine even on this account because it is that doctrine itself which foretold that there should be heresies against which men would have to guard to a church which possessed this doctrine it was written yea the doctrine itself writes to its own church though an angel from heaven preach any other gospel than that which we have preached let him be accursed where was Marcion then, the shipmaster of Pontus, the zealous student of Stoicism? Where was Valentinus then, the disciple of Platonism? For it is evident that those men lived not so long ago in the reign of Antoninus for the most part, and that they at first were believers in the doctrine of the Catholic Church, in the Church of Rome under the episcopate of the blessed Eleutherus, until on account of their ever-restless curiosity, with which they even infected the brethren, they were more than once expelled. Marcion, indeed, went with the two hundred sesterces with which he had brought into the church, and when banished at last to a permanent excommunication, they scattered abroad the poisons of their doctrines. Afterwards, it is true, Marcion professed repentance and agreed to the conditions granted to him that he should receive reconciliation if he restored to the church all the others whom he had been training for perdition. He was prevented, however, by death. It was indeed necessary that there should be heresies, and yet it does not follow from that necessity that heresies are a good thing as if it has not been necessary also that there should be evil. 
it was even necessary that the Lord should be betrayed, but woe to the traitor, so that no man may from this defend heresies. If we must likewise touch the descent of Apelles, he is far from being one of the old school. Like his instructor and molder, Marcion, he rather forsook the continents of Marcion by resorting to the company of a woman, and withdrew to Alexandria out of sight of his most abstemious master, returning therefrom after some years unimproved, except that he was no longer a Marcionite, he clave to another woman, the maiden Philomene, whom we have already mentioned, who herself afterwards became an enormous prostitute. Having been imposed by her vigorous spirit, he committed to writing the revelations which he had learned of her. Persons are still living who remember them, their own actual disciples and successors, who cannot therefore deny the lateness of their date, but, in fact, by their own works they are convicted, even as the Lord said, for since Marcion separated the New Testament from the Old, he is necessarily subsequent to that which he separated, inasmuch as it was only in his power to separate what was previously united. Having then been united previous to its separation, the fact of its subsequent separation proves the subsequence also of the man who effected the separation. In like manner, Valentinus, by his different expositions, and acknowledged emendations makes these changes on the express ground of previous faultiness and therefore demonstrates the difference of the documents these corruptors of the truth we mention as being more notorious and more public than others there is however a certain man named nicodius and hermogenes and several others who still pursue the course of perverting the ways of the lord let them show me by what authority they come. If it be some other god they preach, how comes it that they employ the things and the writings and the names of that god against whom they preach? If it be the same god, why treat him in some other way? Let them prove themselves to be new apostles. Let them maintain that Christ has come down a second time, taught in person a second time, has been twice crucified, twice dead, twice raised, for thus has the apostle described the order of events in the life of Christ, for thus, too, is he accustomed to make his apostles to give them, that is, power besides of working the same miracles which he worked himself. I would, therefore, have their mighty deeds also brought forward, except that I allow their mightiest deed to be that by which they perversely vie with the apostles." For whilst they used to raise men to life from the dead, these consign men to death from their living state. Let me return, however, from this digression to discuss the priority of truth and the comparative lateness of falsehood, deriving support from my argument, even from that parable which puts in the first place the sowing by the Lord of the good seed of the wheat, but introduces at a later stage the adulteration of the crop by its enemy, the devil, with the useless weed of the wild oats. For herein is figuratively described the difference of doctrines, since in other passages also the word of God is likened unto seed. From the actual order, therefore, it becomes clear that that which was first delivered is of the Lord and is true, whilst that is strange and false which was afterwards introduced. This sentence will keep its ground in opposition to all later heresies which have no consistent quality of kindred knowledge inherent in them to claim the truth as on their side. But if there be any heresies which are bold enough to plant themselves in the midst of the apostolic age, that they may thereby seem to have been handed down by the apostles because they existed in the time of the apostles, we can say, let them produce the original records of their churches. Let them unfold the role of their bishops, running down in due succession from the beginning in such a manner that that first bishop of theirs shall be able to show for his ordainer and predecessor some one of the apostles or of apostolic men, a man, moreover, who continued steadfast with the apostles. 
for this is the manner in which the apostolic churches transmit their registers, as the church of Smyrna, which records that Polycarp was placed therein by John, as also the church of Rome, which makes Clement to have been ordained in like manner by Peter. In exactly the same way, the other churches likewise exhibit their several worthies, whom, as having been appointed to their episcopal places by apostles, they regard as transmitters of the apostolic seed. Let the heretics contrive something of the same kind. For after their blasphemy, what is there that is lawful for them to attempt? But should they even effect the contrivance, they will not advance a step. For their very doctrine, after comparison with that of the apostles, will declare by its own diversity and contrariety that it had for its author neither an apostle nor an apostolic man. Because, as the apostles would never have taught things which were self-contradictory, so the apostolic men would not have inculcated teaching different from the apostles, unless they, who received their instruction from the apostles, went and preached in a contrary manner. To this test, therefore, will they be submitted for proof by those churches who, although they derive not their founder from the apostles or apostolic men as being of much later date, for they are in fact being founded daily, yet, since they agree in the same faith, they are accounted as not less apostolic because they are aching in doctrine. Then let all the heresies, when challenged to these two tests by our apostolic church, offer their proof of how they deem themselves to be apostolic. But in truth, they neither are so, nor are they able to prove themselves to be what they are not, nor are they admitted to peaceful relations and communion by such churches as are in any way connected with apostles, inasmuch as they are in no sense themselves apostolic because of their diversity as to the mysteries of the faith. Besides all this, I add a review of the doctrines themselves, which, existing as they did, in the days of the apostles were both exposed and denounced by the said apostles, for by this method they will be more easily reprobated when they are detected to have been even then in existence, or at any rate to have been seedlings of the terrors which then were. Paul, in his first epistle to the Corinthians, sets his mark on certain who denied and doubted the resurrection. This opinion was the especial property of the Sadducees. A part of it, however, is maintained by Marcion and Apollos and Valentinus and all other impugners of the resurrection. Writing also to the Galatians, he inveighs against such men as observed and defend circumcision and the Mosaic law. Thus runs Hebion's heresy, such also as forbid to marry, he reproaches in his instructions to Timothy. Now, this is the teaching of Marcion and his follower Apelles. The apostle directs a similar blow against those who said that the resurrection was past already. Such an opinion did the Valentinians assert of themselves, when, again, he mentions endless genealogies. One also recognizes Valentinus, in whose system a certain aeon, whosoever he be, of a new name, and that not one only, generates of his own grace, sense and truth, and these, in like manner, produce of themselves word and life, while these again afterwards begat man in the church. From the primary eight, ten other aeons after them spring, and then the twelve others arise with their wonderful names, to complete the mere story of the thirty aeons. The same apostle, when disapproving of those who are in bondage to elements, points us to some dogma of Hermogenes, who introduces matter as having no beginning, and then compares it with God, who has no beginning. By thus making the mother of the elements a goddess, he has it in his power to be in bondage, to a being which he puts on par with God. John, however, in the Apocalypse is charged to chastise those who eat things sacrificed to idols and who commit fornication. There are even now another sort of Nicolaitans. Theirs is called the Gaian heresy. 
but in his epistle he especially designates those as antichrists, who denied that Christ was come in the flesh, and who refused to think that Jesus was the Son of God, the one dogma Marcion maintained, the other Hebion. The doctrine, however, of Simon's sorcery, which inculcated the worship of angels, was itself actually reckoned amongst idolatries and condemned by the Apostle Peter in Simon's own person. These are, as I suppose, the different kinds of spurious doctrines which, as we are informed by the apostles themselves, existed in their own day, and yet we find amongst so many various perversions of truth not one school which raised any controversy concerning God as the creator of all things. No man was bold enough to surmise a second God. More readily was doubt felt about the Son than about the Father, until Marcion introduced, in addition to the Creator, another God of goodness only. Apelles made the Creator of some nondescript, glorious angel, who belonged to the superior God, the God, according to him, of the law and of Israel, affirming that he was fire. Valentinus disseminated his aeons and traced the sin of one aeon to the production of God the Creator. To none forsooth except these, nor prior to these, was revealed the truth of the divine nature, and they obtained this special honor and fuller favor from the devil, we cannot doubt, because he wished even in this respect to rival God that he might succeed by the position of his doctrines in doing himself what the Lord said could not be done, making the disciples above their master. Let the entire mass of heresies choose, therefore for themselves the times when they should appear provided that the when be an unimportant point allowing too that they be not of the truth and as a matter of course that such as had no existence in the time of the apostles could not possibly had any connection with the apostles if indeed they had then existed their names would be extant with a view to their own repression likewise those heresies indeed which did exist in the days of the apostles are condemned in their very mention if it be true then that those heresies which in the apostolic times were in a rude form are now found to be the same only in a much more polished shape they derive their condemnation from this very circumstance or if they were not the same, but arose afterwards in a different form, and merely assumed from them certain tenets, then, by sharing with them an agreement in their teaching, they must needs partake in their condemnation, by reason of the above-mentioned definition of lateness of date, which meets us on the very threshold. Even if they were free from any participation in condemned doctrine, they would stand already judged on the mere ground of time, being all the more spurious, because they were not even named by the apostles. Whence we have the firmer assurance that these were the heresies which even then were announced as about to rise. Challenged and refuted by us, according to these definitions, let all the heresies boldly on their part also advance similar rules to these against our doctrine, whether they be later than the apostles or contemporary with the apostles, provided they be different from them, provided also they were, by either a general or a specific censure, precondemned by them. For since they deny the truth of our doctrine, they ought to prove that it also is heresy, refutable by the same rule as that by which they are themselves refuted, and at the same time to show us where we must seek the truth, which it is, by this time, evident, has no existence amongst them. Our system is not behind any in date. On the contrary, it is earlier than all, and this fact will be the evidence of that truth which everywhere occupies the first place. The apostles, again, nowhere condemn it. They rather defend it, a fact which will show that it comes from themselves. For that doctrine which they refrain from condemning, when they have condemned every strange opinion, they show to be their own, and on that ground too they defend it. Come now, 
you who would indulge a better curiosity, if you would apply it to the business of your salvation, run over the apostolic churches in which the very thrones of the apostles are still preeminent in their places, in which their own authentic writings are read, uttering the voice and representing the face of each of them severally. Achaia is very near you, in which you find Corinth. Since you are not far from Macedonia, you have Philippi, and there too you have the Thessalonians. Since you are able to cross to Asia, you get Ephesus. Since, moreover, you are close upon Italy, you have Rome, from which there comes even into our own hands the very authority of the apostles themselves. How happy is its church on which apostles poured forth all their doctrine along with their blood, where Peter endures a passion like his lord's, where Paul wins his crown in a death like John's, where the Apostle John was first plunged unhurt into boiling oil, and thence remitted to his island exile. See what she has learned, what taught, what fellowship has had with even our churches in Africa. One Lord God does she acknowledge, the creator of the universe, and Christ Jesus, born of the Virgin Mary, the Son of God, the creator, and the resurrection of the flesh. The law and the prophets she unites in one volume with the writings of evangelists and apostles from which she drinks in her faith. This she seals with the water of baptism, arrays with the Holy Ghost, feeds with the Eucharist, cheers with martyrdom, and against such a discipline thus maintained she admits no gainsayer. This is the discipline which I no longer say foretold that heresy should come for from which they proceeded. However, they were not of her, because they were opposed to her. Even the rough wild olive arises from the germ of the fruitful, rich, and genuine olive. Also from the seed of the mellowest and sweetest fig, there springs the empty and useless wild fig. In the same way, heresies too come from our plant, although not of our kind. They come from the grain of truth, but, owing to their falsehood, they have only wild leaves to show. Since this is the case, in order that the truth may be adjudged to belong to us, as many as walk according to the rule, which the church has handed down from the apostles, the apostles from Christ, and Christ from God, the reason of our position is clear, when it determines that heretics ought not to be allowed to challenge an appeal to the scriptures, since we, without the scriptures, prove that they have nothing to do with the scriptures. For as they are heretics, they cannot be true Christians, because it is not from Christ that they get that which they pursue of their own mere choice, and from the pursuit incur and admit the name of heretics. Thus, not being Christians, they have acquired no right to the Christian scriptures, and it may be fairly said to them, Who are you? When and whence did you come? As you are none of mine, what have you to do with that which is mine? Indeed, Marcion, by what right do you hew my wood? By whose permission, Valentinus, are you diverting the streams of my fountain? By what power, Apelles, are you removing my landmarks? This is my property. Why are you, the rest, sowing and feeding here at your own pleasure? This, I say, is my property. I have long possessed it. I possessed it before you. I hold sure title deeds from the original owners themselves, to whom the estate belonged. I am the heir of the apostles, just as they carefully prepared their will and testament and committed it to a trust and adjured the trustees to be faithful to their charge, even so do I hold it. As for you, they have, it is certain, always held you as disinherited and rejected you as strangers, as enemies. But on what ground are heretics strangers and enemies to the apostles, if it be not from the difference of their teaching, which each individual of his own mere will has either advanced or received in opposition to the apostles. Where diversity of doctrine is found, there, then, must the corruption, both of the scriptures and the expositions thereof, be regarded as existing. On those whose purpose it was to teach differently, lay the necessity of differently arranging the instruments of doctrine, they could not possibly have efficated their diversity of teaching in any other way than by having a difference in the means whereby they taught. As in their case, 
corruption in doctrine could not possibly have succeeded without a corruption also of its instruments, so to ourselves also integrity of doctrine could not have accrued without integrity in those means by which doctrine is managed. Now, what is there in our scriptures which is contrary to us? What of our own have we introduced that we should have to take it away again or else add to it or alter it in order to restore it to its natural soundness anything which is contrary to it and contained in the scriptures? What we are ourselves that also the scriptures are and have been from the beginning. Of them we have our being, before there was any other way, before they were interpolated by you. Now, inasmuch as all interpolation must be believed to be a later process for the express reason that it proceeds from rivalry, which is never in any case previous to nor home-born with that which it emulates, it is as incredible to every man of sense that we should seem to have introduced any corrupt text into the scriptures existing as we have been from the very first, and being the first, as it is, that they have not in fact introduced it, who are both later in date and opposed to the scriptures. One man perverts the scriptures with his hand, another their meaning by his exposition. For although Valentinus seems to use the entire volume, he has none the less laid violent hands on the truth only with a more cunning mind and skill than Marcion. Marcion expressly and openly used the knife, not the pen, since he made such an excision of the scriptures as suited his own subject matter. Valentinus, however, abstained from such excision, because he did not invent scriptures to square with his own subject matter, but adapted his matter to the scriptures, and yet he took away more, and added more, by removing the proper meaning of every particular word, and adding fantastic arrangements of things which have no real existence. These were the ingenious arts of spiritual wickedness, wherewith we also, my brethren, may fairly expect to have to wrestle as necessary for faith that the elect may be made manifest and that the reprobate may be discovered. And therefore they possess influence and a facility in thinking out and fabricating errors which ought not to be wondered at as if it were a difficult and inexplicable process, seeing that in profane writings also an example comes ready to hand of a similar facility. You see, in our own day, composed out of Virgil, a story of a wholly different character, the subject matter being arranged according to the verse, and the verse according to the subject matter. In short, Hosidius, Geta, has most completely pilfered his tragedy of Medea from Virgil, a near relative of my own among some leisure productions of his pen has composed out of the same poet the table of Cebus. On the same principle, those potasters are commonly called Homer Santones, collectors of Homeric odds and ends, who stitch into one piece patchwork fashion works of their own from the lines of homer out of many scraps put together from this passage and from that in miscellaneous confusion now unquestionably the divine scriptures are more fruitful in resources of all kinds for this sort of facility nor do I risk contradiction in saying that the very scriptures were even arranged by the will of God in such a manner as to furnish materials for heretics, inasmuch as I read that there must be heresies which there cannot be without the scriptures. The question will arise, by whom is it to be interpreted the sense of the passages which make for heresies? By the devil, of course, to whom pertain those wiles which pervert the truth, and who, by the mystic rites of his idols, vies even with the essential portions of the sacraments of God. He, too, baptizes some, that is, his own believers and faithful followers. He promises the putting away of sins by a laver of his own, and if my memory still serves me, Mithra there, in the kingdom of Satan, sets his marks on the foreheads of his soldiers, celebrates also the oblation of bread, and introduces an image of the resurrection, and before a sword, wreaths a crown. 
What also must we say to Satan's limiting his chief priest to a single marriage? He too has his virgins. He too has his proficients in continence. Suppose now we revolve in our minds the superstitions of Numa Pompilius, and consider his priestly offices and badges and privileges, his sacrificial services too, and the instruments and vessels of the sacrifices themselves, and the curious rites of his expiations and vows, is it not clear to us that the devil imitated the well-known moroseness of the Jewish law? Since, therefore, he has shown such emulation in his great aim of expressing in the concerns of his idolatry those very things of which consist the administration of Christ's sacraments, it follows, of course, that the same being, possessing still the same genius, both set his heart upon and succeeded in adapting to his profane and rival creed the very documents of divine things and of the Christian saints. His interpretation from their interpretations, his words from their words, his parables from their parables. For this reason, then, no one ought to doubt either that spiritual wickedness from which also heresies come have been introduced by the devil, or that there is any real difference between heresies and idolatry, seeing that they appertain both to the same author and the same work that idolatry does. They either pretend that there is another God in opposition to the Creator, or, even if they acknowledge that the Creator is the one only God, they treat of Him as a different being from what He is in truth. The consequence is that every lie which they speak of God is in a certain sense a sort of idolatry. I must not omit an account of the conduct also of the heretics, how frivolous it is, how worldly, how merely human, without seriousness, without authority, without discipline, as suits their creed. To begin with, it is doubtful who is a catechumen and who is a believer. They have all access alike, they hear alike, they pray alike, even heathens, if any such happen to come among them. That which is holy they will cast to the dogs and their pearls, although, to be sure, they are not real ones, they will fling to the swine. Simplicity they will have to consist in the overthrow of discipline, attention to which on our part they call brotherly. Peace also they huddle up, anyhow, with all comers, for it matters not to them, however different be their treatment of subjects, provided only they can conspire together to storm the citadel of the one only truth. All are puffed up, all offer you knowledge. Their catechumens are perfect before they are full taught. The very women of these heretics, how wanton they are, for they are bold enough to teach, to dispute, to enact exorcisms, to undertake cures, it may be even to baptize. Their ordinances are carelessly administered, capricious, changeable. At one time they put novices in office, at another time men who are bound to some secular employment, at another persons who have apostatized from us to bind them by vain glory, since they cannot buy the truth. Nowhere is the promotion easier than in the camp of rebels, where the mere fact of being there is a foremost service. And so it comes to pass that today one man is their bishop, tomorrow another, today he is a deacon who tomorrow is a reader, today he is a presbyter who tomorrow is a layman, for even on laymen do they impose the functions of priesthood. But what shall I say concerning the ministry of the word, since they make it their business not to convert the heathen, but to subvert our people? This is rather the glory which they catch at, to compass the fall of those who stand, not the raising of those who are down. Accordingly, since the very work which they purpose to themselves comes not from the building up of their own society, but from the demolition of the truth, they undermine our edifices, that they may erect their own, only deprive them of the law of Moses and the prophets and the divinity of the Creator, and they have not another objection to talk about. The consequence is that they more easily accomplish the ruin of standing houses than the erection of fallen ruins. It is only when they have such objects in view that they show themselves humble and bland and respectful. 
Otherwise, they know no respect even for their own leaders. Hence, it is supposed that schisms seldom happen among heretics because, even when they exist, they are not obvious. Their very unity, however, is schism. I am greatly in error if they do not amongst themselves swerve even from their own regulations, for as much as every man, just as it suits his own temper, modifies the traditions he has received after the same fashion as the man who handed them down did when he molded them according to his own will. The progress of the matter is an acknowledgment at once of its character and of the manner of its birth. That was allowable to the Valentinians, which had been allowed to Valentinus. That was also fair for the Marsoniates, which had been done by Marcion even to innovate on the faith as was agreeable to their own pleasure. In short, all heresies, when thoroughly looked into, are detected harboring dissent in many particulars even from their own founders. The majority of them have not even churches. Motherless, houseless, creedless, outcasts, they wander about in their own essential worthlessness. It has also been a subject of remark how extremely frequent is the intercourse which heretics hold with magicians, with mountebanks, with astrologers, with philosophers, and the reason is that they are men who devote themselves to curious questions. Seek, and ye shall find, is everywhere in their minds. Thus, from the very nature of their conduct, may be estimated the quality of their faith. In their discipline, we have an index of their doctrine. They say that God is not to be feared. Therefore, all things are in their view, free and unchecked. Where, however, is God not feared, except where he is not? Where God is not, their truth also is not. Where there is no truth, then, naturally enough, there is also such a discipline as theirs. But where God is, there exists the fear of God, which is the beginning of wisdom. Where the fear of God is, there is seriousness, an honorable and yet thoughtful diligence, as well as an anxious carefulness and a well-considered admission to the sacred ministry and a safely guarded communion and promotion after good service, and a scrupulous submission to authority and a devout attendance and a modest gait and a united church, and God in all things. These evidences, then, of a stricter discipline existing among us are an additional proof of truth, from which no man can safely turn aside who bears in mind that future judgment when we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, to render an account of our faith itself before all things. What, then, will they say who shall have defiled it, even the virgin which Christ committed to them with the adultery of heretics. I suppose they will allege that no injunction was ever addressed to them by him or by his apostles concerning depraved and perverse doctrines assailing them, or about their avoiding and abhorring the same. He and his apostles, perhaps, will acknowledge that the blame rather lies with themselves and their disciples in not having given us previous warning and instruction. They will, besides, add a good deal respecting the high authority of each doctor of heresy, how that these mightily strengthened belief in their own doctrine, how that they raised the dead, restored the sick, foretold the future, that so they might deservedly be regarded as apostles. As if this caution were not also in written record, that many should come who were to work even the greatest miracles in defense of the deceit of the corrupt preaching, so, forsooth they, will deserve to be forgiven. If, however, any, being mindful of the writings and the denunciations of the Lord and the apostles, shall have stood firm in the integrity of the faith, I suppose they will run great risk of missing pardon when the Lord answers, I plainly forewarned you that there should be teachers of false doctrine in my name, as well as that of prophets and apostles also, and to my own disciples did I give a charge that they should preach the same things to you. But as for you, it was not, of course, to be supposed that you would believe me. I once gave the gospel and the doctrine of the said rule of life and faith, to my apostles, but afterwards it was my pleasure to make considerable changes in it. 
I had promised a resurrection, even of the flesh, but on second thoughts it struck me that I might not be able to keep my promise. I had shown myself to have been born of a virgin, but this seemed to me afterwards to be a discreditable thing. I had said that he was my father, who is the maker of the sun and the showers, but another and better father has adopted me. I had forbidden you to lend an ear to heretics, but in this I erred. Such blasphemies, it is possible, do enter the minds of those who go out of the right path, and who do not defend the true faith from the danger which besets it. On the present occasion, indeed, our treatise has rather taken up a general position against heretics, showing that they must all be refuted on definite, equitable, and necessary rules, without any comparison with the scriptures. For the rest, if God in his grace permit, we shall prepare answers to certain of these heretics in separate treatises. To those who may devote their leisure in reading through these pages, in the belief of the truth, be peace in the grace of our God, Jesus Christ, forever. End of Part 2 of Prescription Against Heretics by Tertullian Read by David Ronald Appendix Against All Heresies by Tertullian This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by David Ronald Earliest Heretics Simon Magnus, Menander, Saturninus, Basilides, Nicolaus, The Works Begin as a Fragment. Of which heretics I will, to pass by a good deal, summarize some, few particulars, for of Judaism's heretics I am silent. Dositheus, the Samaritan, I mean, who was the first who had the hardihood to repudiate the prophets on the ground that they had not spoken under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Of the Sadducees, I am silent, who, springing from the root of this error, had the hardihood to adjoin to this heresy the denial likewise of the resurrection of the flesh. The Pharisees, I perturb it, who were divided from the Jews by their superimposing of certain adidimates to the law, which fact likewise made them worthy of receiving this very name, and together with them the Herodians, likewise, who said that Herod was Christ, to those I betake myself who have chosen to make the gospel the starting point of their heresies. Of these the first of all is Simon Magnus, who in the Acts of the Apostles earned a condign and just sentence from the Apostle Peter. He had the hardihood to call himself the supreme virtue, that is, the supreme God, and moreover, to assert that the universe had been originated by his angels, that he had descended in quest of an erring demon, which was wisdom, that, in a phantasmal semblance of God, he had not suffered among the Jews, but was as if he had suffered. After him, Menander, his disciple, likewise a magician, saying the same as Simon, whatever Simon had affirmed himself to be, this did Menander equally affirm himself to be, asserting that none could possibly have salvation without being baptized in his name. Afterwards again followed Saturninus, he too affirming that the inascible virtue that is God abides in the highest regions, and that those regions are infinite, and in the regions immediately above us, but the angels far removed from him made the lower world, and that, because light from above had flashed refulgently in the lower regions, the angels had carefully tried to form man after the similitude of that light, that man lay crawling on the surface of the earth, that this light and this higher virtue was, thanks to mercy, the salvable spark in man, while all the rest of him perishes, that Christ had not existed in a bodily substance, and had endured a quasi-passion in a phantasmal shape merely, that a resurrection of the flesh there will by no means be. Afterwards broke out the heretic Basilides. He affirms that there is a supreme deity by name Abraxas, by whom was created mind, which in Greek he calls nous, that thence sprang the word, that of him issued providence, virtue, and wisdom, that out of these subsequently were made principalities, powers, and angels, 
and there ensued infinite issues and processions of angels that by these angels three hundred and sixty-five heavens were formed and the world in honour of abraxas whose name if computed has in itself this number now among the last of the angels those who made the world he places the god of the jews latest that is the god of the law and of the prophets whom he denies to be a god but affirms to be an angel to him he says was allotted the seed of abraham and accordingly he it was who transferred the sons of israel from the land of egypt into the land of canaan affirming him to be turbulent above the other angels and accordingly given to the frequent arousing of seditions and wars yes and the shedding of human blood christ moreover he affirms to have been sent not by this maker of the world but by the above-named abraxas and to have come in a phantasm and been destitute of the substance of flesh that it was not he who suffered among the jews but that simon was crucified in his stead whence again there must be no believing on him who was crucified lest one confess to having believed on simon martyrdoms he says are not to be endured the resurrection of the flesh he strenuously impugns affirming that salvation has not been promised to bodies a brother heretic emerged in nicolaus he was one of the seven deacons who were appointed in the acts of the apostles he affirms that darkness was seized with a concupiscence and indeed a foul and obscene one after light out of this permixture it is a shame to say what fetid and unclean combinations arose the rest of his tenants too are obscene for he tells of certain aeons sons of turpitude and of conjunctions of execrable and obscene embraces and permixtures and certain yet baser outcomes of these he teaches that there were born moreover demons and gods and spirits seven and other things sufficiently sacrilegious alike and foul which we blush to recount and at once pass them by enough it is for us that this heresy of the nicolaitans has been condemned by the apocalypse of the lord with the weightiest authority attaching to a sentence in saying because this thou holdest thou hatest the doctrine of the nicolaitans which i too hate to these are added those heretics likewise who are called ophites for they magnify the serpent to such a degree that they prefer him even to christ himself for it was he they say who gave us the origin of the knowledge of good and of evil his power and majesty they say moses perceiving set up the brazen serpent and whoever gazed upon him obtained health christ himself they say further in his gospel imitates moses's serpent's sacred power in saying and to moses upreared the serpent in the desert so it behoveth the son of man to be upreared him they introduced to bless their eucharistic elements now the whole parade and doctrine of this error flowed from the following source they say that from the supreme primary aeon whom men spoke of there emanated several other inferior aeons to all these however there opposed himself an aeon whose name is aldaboeth he had been conceived by the permixture of a second aeon with inferior aeons and afterwards when he had been desirous of forcing his way into the higher regions had been disabled by the permixture of the gravity of matter with himself to arrive at the higher regions had been left in the midst and had extended himself to his full dimensions and thus had made the sky Ialdabaoth, however, had descended lower, and had made him seven sons, and had shut from their view the upper regions by self-distension, in order that, since these angels could not know what was above, they might think him the sole god. These inferior virtues and angels, therefore, had made man, and, because he had been originated by weaker and mediocre powers, he lay crawling worm-like that aeon however out of which aldaboeth had proceeded moved to the heart with envy had injected into man as he lay a certain spark excited whereby he was through prudence to grow wise and be able to understand the things above 
So again, the Isle de Boeth aforesaid, turning indignant, had emitted out of himself the virtue and similitude of the serpent, and this had been the virtue in paradise, that is, this had been the serpent whom Eve had believed, as if he had been God the Son. He plucked, say they, from the fruit of the tree, and thus conferred on mankind the knowledge of things good and evil. Christ, moreover, existed not in substance of flesh. Salvation of the flesh is not to be hoped for at all. Moreover, also, there has broken out another heresy also, which is called that of the Cainites. And the reason is that they magnify Cain as if he had been conceived of some potent virtue which operated in him, for Abel had been procreated after being conceived of an inferior virtue, and accordingly had been found inferior. They who assert this likewise defend the traitor Judas, telling us that he is admirable and great because of the advantages he is vaunted to have conferred on mankind, for some of them think that thanksgiving is to be rendered to Judas on this account, viz. Judas, they say, observing that Christ wished to subvert the truth, betrayed him in order that there might be no possibility of truths being subverted. And others thus dispute against them, and say, because the powers of this world were unwilling that Christ should suffer, lest through his death salvation should be prepared for mankind, he, consulting for the salvation of mankind, betrayed Christ, in order that there might be no possibility at all of the salvation being impeded, which was being impeded through the virtues which were opposing Christ's passion, and thus, through the passion of Christ, there might be no possibility of the salvation of mankind being retarded. But again, the heresy has started forth, which is called that of the Sethetes. The doctrine of this perversity is as follows. Two human beings were formed by the angels, Cain and Abel. On their account arose great contentions and discords among the angels. For this reason, that virtue, which was above all the virtues, which they styled the mother, when they said that Abel had been slain, willed this Seth of theirs to be conceived and born in place of Abel, in order that those angels might be as cheated who had created those two former human beings, while this pure seed rises and is born. For they say that there had been inquitous premixtures of two angels and human beings, for which reason that virtue which, as we have said, they style the mother brought on the deluge even for the purpose of vengeance, in order that that seed of premixture might be swept away, and this only seed which was pure be kept entire, but in vain, for they who had originated those of the former seed sent into the ark secretly and stealthily and unknown to that mother virtue, together with those eight souls, the seed likewise of Ham, in order that the seed of evil should not perish, but should, together with the rest, be preserved, and after the deluge be restored to the earth, and, by example of the rest, should grow up and diffuse itself, and fill and occupy the whole orb of Christ. Moreover, their sentiments are such that they call him merely Seth, and say that he was instead of the actual Seth. Carpocrates, furthermore, introduced the following sect. He affirms that there is one virtue, the chief among the upper regions, that out of this were produced angels and virtues, which, being far distant from the upper virtues, created the world. Being far distant from the upper virtues created this world in the lower regions, that Christ was not born of the Virgin Mary, but was generated, a mere human being of the seed of Joseph, superior, they admit, above all others in the practice of righteousness and in integrity of life, that he suffered among the Jews, and that his soul alone was received in heaven as having being more firm and hardy than all others, whence he would infer, retaining only the salvation of souls, that there are no resurrections of the body. After him break out the heretic Serenthus, teaching similarly, 
for he too says that the world was originated by those angels and sets forth Christ as born of the seed of Joseph, contending that he was merely human, without divinity, affirming also that the law was given by angels, representing the God of the Jews as not the Lord, but an angel. His successor was Ebion, not agreeing with Serinthus in every point, in that he affirms the world to have been made by God, not by angels, and because it is written, no disciple above his master, nor servant above his lord, sets forth likewise the law as binding, of course for the purpose of excluding the gospel and vindicating Judaism. Valentinus the heretic, moreover, introduced many fables. These I will retrench and briefly summarize for he introduces the plumora and the thirty aeons these aeons moreover he explains in the way of syzygies that is conjugal unions of some kind for among the first he says were depth and silence of these proceeded mind and truth out of whom burst the word and life from whom again were created man and the church but these are not all for of these last also proceeded twelve aeons from speech, moreover, and life proceeded other ten aeons. Such is the triacontad of aeons, which is made up in the plumora of an ogdode, a decad, and a duodecad. The thirteenth aeon, moreover, will to see the great Bythus, and, to see him, had the hardihood to ascend into the upper regions, and not being capable of seeing his magnitude, desponded, and almost suffered dissolution, had not some one, he whom he calls Horos, to wit, sent to invigorate him, strengthen him by pronouncing the word Io. This aeon, moreover, which was thus reduced to despondency, he calls Achamoth, who says that he was seized with certain regretful passions, and out of his passions gave birth to material essences. For he was panic-stricken, he says, and terror-stricken, and overcome with sadness, and of these passions he conceived and bare. Hence he made the heaven and the earth and the sea and whatever is in them, for which cause all things made by him are infirm and frail and capable of falling and mortal, inasmuch as he himself was conceived and produced from despondency. He, however, originated this world out of those material essences which Achamoth, by his panic or terror or sadness or sweat, had supplied. For of his panic, he says, was made darkness, of his fear and ignorance, the spirits of wickedness and malignity, of his sadness and tears, the humidities of founts, the material essence of floods and sea. Christ, moreover, was sent by the first Father who is by this. He, moreover, was not in the substance of our flesh, but, bringing down from heaven some spiritual body or other, passed through the Virgin Mary as water through a pipe, neither receiving nor borrowing aught thence. The resurrection of our present flesh he denies, but maintains that of some sister flesh. Of the law and the prophets, some parts he approves, some he disapproves, that is, he disapproves all in reprobating some. A gospel of his own he likewise has, beside these of ours. After him arose the heretics Ptolemy and Secundus, who agree throughout with Valentinus, differing only in the following point, viz. Whereas Valentinus had feigned but thirty aeons, they have added several more, for they first added four, and subsequently four more and valentine's assertion that it was the thirteenth aeon which strayed out from the pleroma as falling into despondency they deny for the one which desponded on account of disappointed yearning to see the first father was not of the original triacontad they say there arose besides heracleon a brother heretic whose sentiments pair with valentine's but by some novelty of terminology he is desirous of seeming to differ in sentiment for he introduces the notion that there existed first what he terms a monad and then out of that monad arose two and then the rest of the aeons then he introduces the whole system of valentine 
After these, there were not wanting a Marcus and a collar basis, composing a novel heresy out of the Greek alphabet, for they affirm that without those letters truth cannot be found, nay more, that in those letters the whole plenitude and perfection of truth is comprised, for this was why Christ said, I am the Alpha and the Omega. In fact, they say that Jesus Christ descended, that is, that the dove came down on Jesus, and since the dove is styled by the Greek name Peristera, it has in itself this number, Roman numerals D, C, C, I. These men run through the whole alphabet, indeed, up to A and B, and compute Ogdodes and Decads. So we may grant it useless and idle to recount all their trifles. What, however, must be allowed, not merely vain, but likewise dangerous, is this. They feign a second God beside the Creator. They affirm that Christ was not in the substance of flesh. They say there is to be no resurrection of the flesh. To this is added one Cerdo. He introduces two first causes, that is, two gods one good, the other cruel, the good being the superior, the latter, the cruel one, being the creator of the world. He repudiates the prophecies and the law, renounces God, the creator, maintains that Christ who came was the son of the superior God, affirms that he was not in the substance of flesh, states him to have been only in a phantasmal shape, to have not really suffered, but undergone a quasi-passion, and not to have been born of a virgin, nay, really not to have been born at all. A resurrection of the soul merely does he approve, denying that of the body. The Gospel of Luke alone, and that not entire, does he receive. Of the Apostle Paul, he takes neither all the epistles, nor in their integrity. The Acts of the Apostles and the Apocalypse he rejects as false. After him emerged a disciple of his, one Marcion by name, a native of Pontus, son of a bishop, excommunicated because of a rape committed on a certain virgin. He, starting from the fact that it is said, every good tree beareth good fruit, but an evil, evil, attempted to approve the heresy of Cerdo, so that his assertions are identical with those of the former heretic before him. After those arose one Lucin by name, a follower and disciple of Marcion. He, too, wading through the same kinds of blasphemy, teaches the same as Marcion and Serdo had taught. Close on their heels follows Apelles, a disciple of Marcion, who after lapsing into his own carnality was severed from Marcion. He introduces one God in the infinite upper regions, and states that he made many powers and angels beside him, withal another virtue, which he affirms to be called Lord, but represents as an angel. By him, he will have it appear that the world was originated in imitation of a superior world. With this lower world, he mingled throughout a principle of repentance because he had not made it so perfectly as that superior world had been originated. The law and the prophets he repudiates. Christ, he neither, like Marcion, affirms to have been in a phantasmal shape, nor yet in substance of a true body, as the gospel teaches, but says, because he descended from the upper regions, that in the course of his descent he wove together for himself a starry and airy flesh, and, in his resurrection, restored in the course of his ascent to the several individual elements whatever had been borrowed in his descent, and thus the several parts of his body dispersed, he reinstated in heaven his spirit only. This man denies the resurrection of the flesh. He uses, too, one only apostle, but that is Marcion's, that is, a mutilated one. He teaches the salvation of souls alone. He has, besides, private but extraordinary lections of his own, which he calls manifestations, of one Philomene, a girl whom he follows as a prophetess. He has, besides, his own books, which he has entitled Books of Syllogisms, in which he seeks to prove that whatever Moses has written about God is not true, but false. To all these heretics is added one Tatian, a brother heretic. 
This man was Justin Martyr's disciple. After Justin's death, he began to cherish different opinions from his, for he wholly savors of Valentinus, adding this, that Adam cannot even attain salvation, as if, when the branches become salvable, the root were not. Other heretics swell the list who are called cataphrygians, but their teaching is not uniform, for there are, of them, some who are called cataphoclans. There are others who are termed catationetans. These have a blasphemy common, and a blasphemy not common, but peculiar and special. The common blasphemy lies in their saying that the Holy Spirit was in the apostles indeed, the paraclete was not, and in their saying that the paraclete has spoken in Montanus more things than Christ brought forward into the compass of the gospel, and not merely more, but likewise better and greater. But the particular one, they who follow Ashines, have this, namely, whereby they add this, that they affirm Christ to be himself Son and Father. Add to these Theodotus the Byzantine, who, after being apprehended for Christ's name and apostatizing, ceased not to blaspheme against Christ, for he introduced a doctrine by which to affirm that Christ was merely a human being but deny his deity, teaching that he was born of the Holy Spirit indeed of a virgin, but was solitary and bare human being, with no preeminence above the rest of mankind, but only that of righteousness. After him break out a second heretical Theodotus, who again himself introduced a sister's sect, and says that the human being Christ himself was merely conceived alike and born of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, but that he was inferior to Melchizedek, because it is said of Christ, Thou art a priest unto eternity after the order of Melchizedek. For that Melchizedek, he says, was a heavenly virtue of preeminent grace, in that Christ acts for human beings, being made their deprecator and advocate, Melchizedek does so for heavenly angels and virtues. For to such a degree, he says, is he better than Christ, that he is fatherless, motherless, without genealogy, of whom neither the beginning nor the end has been comprehended, nor can be comprehended. But after all these again, one Praxius introduced a heresy, which Victorinus was careful to corroborate. He asserts that Jesus Christ is God the Father Almighty. Him he contends to have been crucified and suffered and died, beside which, with a profane and sacrilegious temerity, he maintains the proposition that he is himself sitting at his own right hand. End of Against All Heresies by Tertullian Read by David Ronald Against the Valentinians, Part 1 by Tertullian. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Valentinians, who are no doubt a very large body of heretics, comprising as they do so many apostates from the truth, who have a propensity for fables and no discipline to deter them therefrom, care for nothing so much as to obscure what they preach, if indeed they can be said to preach, who obscure their doctrine. The officiousness with which they guard their doctrine is an officiousness which betrays their guilt. Their disgrace is proclaimed in the very earnestness with which they maintain their religious system. Now in the case of those Eleusinian mysteries, which are the very heresy of Athenian superstition, it is their secrecy that is their disgrace. Accordingly, they previously beset all access to their body with tormenting conditions, and they require a long initiation before they enroll their members, even instruction during five years for their perfect disciples, in order that they may mould their opinions by this suspension of full knowledge, and apparently raise the dignity of their mysteries in proportion to the craving for them which they have previously created. Then follows the duty of silence. Carefully is that guarded which is so long in finding. All the divinity, however, lies in their secret recesses. They are revealed at last all the aspirations of the fully initiated. The entire mystery of the sealed tongue, the symbol of virility, 
but this allegorical representation under the pretext of nature's reverend name obscures a real sacrilege by help of an arbitrary symbol and by empty images obviates the reproach of falsehood in like manner the heretics who are now the object of our remarks the valentinians have formed eleusinian dissipations of their own consecrated by a profound silence having nothing of the heavenly in them but their mystery by the help of the sacred names and titles and arguments of true religion they have fabricated the vainest and foulest figments for men's pliant liking out of the affluent suggestions of holy scripture since from its many springs many errors may well emanate if you propose to them inquiries sincere and honest they answer you with stern look and contracted brow and say the subject is profound if you try them with subtle questions with the ambiguities of their double tongue they affirm a community of faith with yourself if you intimate to them that you understand their opinions they insist on knowing nothing themselves if you come to a close engagement with them they destroy your own fond hope of a victory over them by a self-immolation not even to their own disciples do they commit a secret before they have made sure of them they have the knack of persuading men before instructing them although truth persuades by teaching but does not teach by first persuading for this reason we are branded by them as simple and as being merely so without being wise also as if indeed wisdom were compelled to be wanting in simplicity whereas the lord unites them both be ye therefore wise as serpents and simple as doves now if we on our parts be accounted foolish because we are simple does it then follow that they are not simple because they are wise most perverse however are they who are not simple even as they are most foolish who are not wise and yet if i must choose i should prefer taking the latter condition for the lesser fault since it is perhaps better to have a wisdom which falls short in quantity than that which is bad in quantity better to be in error than to mislead besides the face of the lord is patiently waited for by those who seek him in simplicity of heart as says the very wisdom not of valentinus but of solomon then again infants have borne by their blood a testimony to christ would you say that it was children who shouted crucify him they were neither children nor infants in other words they were not simple the apostle too bids us to become children again towards god to be as children in malice by our simplicity yet as being also wise in our practical faculties at the same time with respect to the order of development in wisdom i have admitted that it flows from simplicity in brief the dove has usually served to figure christ the serpent to tempt him the one even from the first has been the harbinger of divine peace the other from the beginning has been the despoiler of the divine image accordingly simplicity alone will be more easily able to know and to declare god whereas wisdom alone will rather do him violence and betray him let then the serpent hide himself as much as he is able and let him rest all his wisdom in the labyrinths of his obscurities let him dwell deep down in the ground let him worm himself into secret holes let him unroll his length through his sinuous joints let him tortuously crawl though not all at once beast as he is that skulks the light of our dove however how simple is the very home always in high and open places facing the light as the symbol of the holy spirit it loves the radiant east that figure of christ nothing causes truth a blush except only being hidden because no man will be ashamed to give ear thereto no man will be ashamed to recognize him as god whom nature has already commended to him whom he already perceives in all his works him indeed who is simply for this reason imperfectly known because man has not thought of him as only one because he has named him in a plurality of gods and adored him in other forms yet to induce oneself to turn from this multitude of deities to another crowd to remove from a familiar authority to an unknown one to wrench oneself from what is manifest to what is hidden is to offend faith on the very threshold 
Now even suppose that you are initiated into the entire fable. Will it not occur to you that you have heard something very like it from your fond nurse when you were a baby? Amongst the lullabies she sang to you about the towers of Lamia and the horns of the sun. Let, however, any man approach the subject from a knowledge of the faith which he has otherwise learnt, as soon as he finds so many names of eons, so many marriages, so many offsprings, so many exits, so many issues, felicities and infelicities of a dispersed and mutilated deity, will that man hesitate at once to pronounce that these are the fables and endless genealogies which the inspired apostle by anticipation condemned, whilst these seeds of heresy were even then shooting forth? deservedly therefore must they be regarded as wanting in simplicity and as merely prudent who produce such fables not without difficulty and defend them only indirectly who at the same time do not thoroughly instruct those whom they teach this of course shows their astuteness if their lessons are disgraceful their unkindness if they are honourable as for us however who are the simple folk we know all about it in short, this is the very first weapon with which we are armed for our encounter. It unmasks and brings to view the whole of their depraved system. And in this we have the first augury of our victory, because even merely to point out that which is concealed with so great an outlay of artifice is to destroy it. We know, I say, most fully their actual origin, and we are quite aware why we call them Valentinians, although they affect to disavow their name. They have departed, it is true, from their founder, yet is their origin by no means destroyed. And even if it chance to be changed, the very change bears testimony to the fact. Valentinus had expected to become a bishop because he was an able man both in genius and eloquence. Being indignant, however, that another obtained the dignity by reason of a claim which confessorship had given him, he broke with the church of the true faith. Just like those restless spirits which, when roused by ambition, are usually inflamed with the desire of revenge, he applied himself with all his might to exterminate the truth, and finding the clue of a certain old opinion, he marked out a path for himself with the subtlety of a serpent. Ptolemaeus afterwards entered on the same path by distinguishing the names and numbers of the eons into personal substances which, however, he kept apart from God. Valentinus had included these in the very essence of the deity as senses and affections of motion. Sundry bipaths were then struck off therefrom by Heraclion and Secundus and the magician Marcus. Theotemus worked hard about the images of the law. Valentinus, however, was as yet nowhere, and still the Valentinians derive their name from Valentinus. Axionicus at Antioch is the only man who at the present time does honour to the memory of Valentinus by keeping his rules to the full. But this heresy is permitted to fashion itself into as many various shapes as a Cortesian, who usually changes and adjusts her dress every day. And why not? When they review that spiritual seed of theirs in every man after this fashion, whenever they have hit upon any novelty, they forthwith call their presumption a revelation, their own perverse ingenuity a spiritual gift, but they deny all unity, admitting only diversity. And thus we clearly see that, setting aside their customary dissimulation, most of them are in a divided state being ready to say, and that sincerely, of certain points of their belief, this is not so, and I take this in a different sense, and I do not admit that. By this variety, indeed, innovation is stamped on the very face of their rules, besides which it wears all the colourable features of ignorant conceits. My own path, however, lies along the original tenets of their chief teachers, not with the self-appointed leaders of their promiscuous followers. Nor shall we hear it said of us from any quarter that we have of our own mind fashioned our own materials, since these have been already produced both in respect of the opinions and their refutations in carefully written volumes by so many eminently holy and excellent men, not only those who have lived before us, but those also who were contemporary with the heresiarchs themselves, for instance Justin, philosopher and martyr, 
Miltiades, the sophist of the churches, Irenaeus, that very exact inquirer into all doctrines, our own Proculus, the model of chaste old age and Christian eloquence. All these it would be my desire closely to follow in every work of faith, even as in this particular one. Now, if there are no heresies at all, but what those who refute them are supposed to have fabricated, then the apostle who predicted them must have been guilty of falsehood. If, however, there are heresies, they can be no other than those which are the subject of discussion. No writer can be supposed to have so much time on his hands as to fabricate materials which are already in his possession. In order, then, that no one may be blinded by so many outlandish names collected together and adjusted at pleasure, and of doubtful import, I mean in this little work wherein we merely undertake to propound this heretical mystery, to explain in what manner we are to use them. Now the rendering by some of these names from the Greek, so as to produce an equally obvious sense of the word, is by no means an easy process. In the case of some others the genders are not suitable, while others again are more familiarly known in their Greek form. For the most part, therefore, we shall use the Greek names, their meanings will be seen on the margins of the page. Nor will the Greek be unaccompanied with the Latin equivalents. Only these will be marked in lines above, for the purpose of explaining the personal names, rendered necessity by the ambiguities of such of them as admit some different meaning. But although I must postpone all discussion and be content at present with the mere exposition of the heresy, still, wherever any scandalous feature shall seem to require a castigation, it must be attacked by all means, if only with a passing thrust. Let the reader regard it as the skirmish before the battle. It will be my drift to show how to wound, rather than to inflict deep gashes. If in any instance mirth be excited, this will be quite as much as the subject deserves. There are many things which deserve refutation in such a way as to have no gravity expended on them. Vain and silly topics are met with a special fitness by laughter. Even the truth may indulge in ridicule because it is jubilant. It may play with its enemies because it is fearless. Only we must take care that its laughter be not unseemly and so itself be laughed at. But wherever its mirth is decent, there is a duty to indulge it. And so at last I enter on my task. Beginning with Aeneas, the Roman poet, he simply spoke of the spacious saloons of heaven, either on account of their elevated sight, or because in Homer he had read about Jupiter banqueting therein. As for our heretics, however, it is marvellous what stories upon stories and what heights upon heights they have hung up, raised and spread out as a dwelling for each several god of theirs. Even our Creator has had arranged for him the saloons of Aeneas in the fashion of private rooms, with chamber piled upon chamber, and assigned to each god by just as many staircases as there were heresies. The universe, in fact, has been turned into rooms to let. Such stories of the heavens, you would imagine to be detached tenements in some happy isle of the blessed, I know not where. There the god even of the Valentinians has his dwelling in the attics. They call him indeed as to his essence, Aeon Telios, perfect Aeon. But in respect of his personality, Proache, before the beginning, and Earche, the beginning, and sometimes Bythos, depth, a name which is most unfit for one who dwells in the heights above. They describe him as unbegotten, immense, infinite, invisible, and eternal, as if when they describe him to be such as we know he ought to be, they straightway prove him to be a being who may be said to have had such an existence even before all things else. I indeed insist upon it that he is such a being, and there is nothing which I detect in beings of this sort more obvious than that they who are said to have been before all things, things too not their own, are found to be behind all things. Let it, however, be granted that this bythos of theirs existed in the infinite ages of the past, in the greatest and profoundest repose, in the extreme rest of a placid, and, if I may use the expression, stupid divinity, such as Epicurus has enjoined upon us. 
and yet although they would have him be alone they assign to him a second person in himself and with himself enoia thought which they also call both charis grace and siga silence other things as it happened conduced in this most agreeable repose to remind him of the need of by and by producing out of himself the beginning of all things this he deposits in lieu of seed in the genital region as it were of the womb of his siga instantaneous conception is the result siga becomes pregnant and is delivered of course in silence and her offspring is nous mind very like his father and his equal in every respect in short he alone is capable of comprehending the measureless and incomprehensible greatness of his father accordingly he is even called the father himself and beginning of all things and with great propriety monogenes the only begotten and yet not with absolute propriety since he is not born alone for along with him a female also proceeded whose name was veritas truth but how much more suitably might monogenes be called protogenes first begotten since he was begotten first thus bythos and siga nous and veritas are alleged to be the first fourfold team of the valentinian set of gods the parent stock and origin of them all for immediately when nous received the function of a procreation of his own he too produces out of himself sermo the word and vita the life if this latter existed not previously of course she existed not in bythos and a pretty absurdity would it be if life existed not in god however this offspring also produces fruit having for its mission the initiation of the universe and the formation of the entire pleroma it procreates homo man and ecclesia the church thus you have an ogdoad a double tetrad out of the conjunctions of males and females the cells so to speak of the primordial eons the fraternal nuptials of the valentinian gods the simple originals of heretical sanctity and majesty a rabble shall i say of criminals or of deities at any rate the fountain of all ulterior fecundity for behold when the second tetrad sermo and vita homo and ecclesia had borne fruit to the father's glory having an intense desire of themselves to present to the father something similar of their own they bring other issue into being conjugal of course as the others were by the union of the twofold nature on the one hand sermo and vita pour out at a birth a half score of eons on the other hand homo and ecclesia produce a couple more so furnishing an equipoise to their parents since this pair with the other ten make up just as many as they did themselves procreate i now give the names of the half score whom i have mentioned bythios profound and mixis mixture agaratos never old and henios union autophys essential nature and hedony pleasure asinitos immovable and syncrasis commixture monogenes only begotten and macaria happiness on the other hand these will make up the number twelve to which i have also referred paracletus comforter and pistis faith patricus paternal and elpis hope metricos maternal and agape love enos praise and synesis intelligence ecclesiasticus son of ecclesia and macariotes blessedness Thalitus, perfect, and Sophia, wisdom. I cannot help here quoting from a like example what may serve to show the import of these names. In the schools of Carthage there was once a certain Latin rhetorician, an excessively cool fellow whose name was Phosphorus. He was personating a man of valour and wound up with saying, I come to you, excellent citizens, from battle, with victory for myself, with happiness for you, full of honour, covered with glory, a favourite of fortune, the greatest of men, decked with triumph. And forthwith his scholars began to shout for the school of Phosphorus. Fev. Ah. Are you a believer in Fortunata and Hedony and Asenitus and Thelitas? Then shout out your Fev for the school of Ptolemy. This must be that mystery of the Pleroma, the fullness of the thirtyfold divinity. Let us see what special attributes belong to these numbers, four and eight and twelve. 
Meanwhile, with the number 30, all fecundity ceases. The generating force and power and desire of the eons is spent. As if there were not still left some strong remnant for curdling numbers. As if no other names were to be got out of the page's hall. For why are there not sets of fifty and of a hundred procreated? Why, too, are there no comrades and boon companions named for them? But further, there is an acceptance of persons inasmuch as Nous alone among them enjoys all the knowledge of the immeasurable Father, joyous and exulting, while they, of course, pine in sorrow. To be sure, Nous, so far as in him lay, both wished and trying to impart to the others also all that he had learnt about the greatness and incomprehensibility of the Father, but his mother, Siga, interposed, she who, you must know, imposes silence even on her own beloved heretics. Although they affirm that this is done at the will of the Father, who will have all to be inflamed with a longing after himself, thus, while they are tormenting themselves with these internal devices, while they are burning with the secret longing to know the Father, the crime is almost accomplished. For of the twelve eons which Homo and Ecclesia had produced, the youngest by birth, never mind the solecism, since Sophia Wisdom is her name, unable to restrain herself, breaks away without the society of her husband Thelitus in quest of the father, and contracts that kind of sin which had indeed arisen amongst the others who were conversant with Nous, but had flowed on to this eon, that is, to Sophia as is usual with maladies which, after arising in one part of the body, spread abroad their infection to some other limb. The fact is, under a pretense of love to the father, she was overcome with a desire to rival Nous, who alone rejoiced in the knowledge of the father. But when Sophia, straining after impossible aims, was disappointed of her hope, she is both overcome with difficulty and racked with affection. Thus she was all but swallowed up by reason of the charm and toil of her research, and dissolved into the remnant of his substance. Nor would there have been any alternative for her than perdition, if she had not by good luck fallen in with Horus, Limit. He too had considerable power. He is the foundation of the great universe and externally the guardian thereof. To him they give the additional names of Crux, Cross, and Lytrotes, Redeemer, and Carpistes, emancipator. When Sophia was thus rescued from danger and tardily persuaded, she relinquished further research after the father, and found repose, and laid aside all her excitement, or enthymesis, desire, along with the passion which had come over her. But some dreamers have given another account of the abbreviation and recovery of Sophia. After her vain endeavours and the disappointment of her hope, she was, I suppose, disfigured with paleness and emaciation, and that neglect of her beauty which was natural to one who was deploring the denial of the father, an affliction which was no less painful than his loss. Then, in the midst of all this sorrow, she by herself alone, without any conjugal help, conceived and bare a female offspring. Does this excite your surprise? Well, even the hen has the power of being able to bring forth by her own energy. They say, too, that among vultures there are only females which become parents alone. At any rate, she was a mother without aid from a male, and she began at last to be afraid that her end was even at hand. She was all in doubt about the treatment of her case and took pains at self-concealment. Remedies could nowhere be found. For where, then, should we have tragedies and comedies from which to borrow the process of exposing what has been born without connubial modesty? While the thing is in this evil plight, she raises her eyes and turns them to the father. Having, however, striven in vain, as her strength was failing her, she falls to praying. Her entire kindred also supplicates in her behalf, and especially Nous. Why not? What was the cause of so vast an evil? yet not a single casualty befell Sophia without its effect. All her sorrows operate, inasmuch as all that conflict of hers contributes to the origin of matter. Her ignorance, her fear, her distress become substances. Hereupon the father, by and by, being moved, produces in his own image, with a view to these circumstances, the Horos whom we have mentioned above, and this he does by means of monogenes, nous, a male-female eon, because there is this variation of statement about the father's sex. They also go on to tell us that horos is likewise called metagogus, that is, a conductor about, as well as horothetes, setter of limits. 
By his assistance they declare that Sophia was checked in her illicit courses and purified from all evils and thenceforth strengthened in virtue and restored to the conjugal state. They add that she indeed remained within the bounds of the pleroma, but that her antithemus with the accruing passion was banished by Horos and crucified and cast out from the pleroma, even as they say malum foras, evil avaunt still that was a spiritual essence as being the natural impulse of an eon although without form or shape inasmuch as it had apprehended nothing and therefore was pronounced to be an infirm and feminine fruit accordingly after the banishment of the enthymesis and the return of her mother sophia to her husband the illustrious monogenes the nous released indeed from all care and concern of the father in order that he might consolidate all things and defend and at last fix the pleroma, and so prevent any concussion of the kind again, once more emits a new couple, Christ and the Holy Spirit. I should suppose the coupling of two males to be a very shameful thing, or else the Holy Spirit must be a female, and so the male is discredited by the female. One divinity is assigned in the case of all these to procure a complete adjustment among the eons. Even from this fellowship in a common duty, two schools actually arise, two chairs, and to some extent the inauguration of a division in the doctrine of Valentinus. It was the function of Christ to instruct the eons in the nature of their conjugal relations, you see what the whole thing was, of course, and how to form some guess about the unbegotten, and to give them the capacity of generating within themselves the knowledge of the Father, it being impossible to catch the idea of him or comprehend him, in short, even to enjoy any perception of him, either by the eye or the ear, except through monogenes, the only begotten. Well, I will even grant them what they allege about knowing the Father, so that they do not refuse us the attainment of the same. I would rather point out what is perverse in their doctrine, how they were taught that the incomprehensible part of the father was the cause of their own perpetuity, whilst that which might be comprehended of him was the reason of their generation and formation. Now by these several positions the tenant, I suppose, is insinuated that it is expedient for God not to be apprehended on the very ground that the incomprehensibility of his character is the cause of perpetuity whereas what in him is comprehensible is productive not of perpetuity but rather of conditions which lack perpetuity namely nativity and formation the son indeed they make capable of comprehending the father the manner in which he is comprehended the recently produced christ fully taught them to the holy spirit however belonged the special gifts whereby they having been all set on a complete par in respect of their earnestness to learn should be enabled to offer up their thanksgiving and be introduced to a true tranquillity. Thus they are all on the self-same footing in respect of form and knowledge, all of them having become what each of them severally is, none being a different being because they are all what the others are. They are all turned into nooses, into homos, into thalitases, and so in the case of the females, into siges, into zoes, into ecclesias, into fortunatus, so that Ovid would have blotted out his own metamorphoses if he had only known our larger one in the present day. Straight away they were reformed and thoroughly established and being composed to rest from the truth, they celebrate the Father in a chorus of praise in the exuberance of their joy. The father himself also reveled in the glad feeling, of course because his children and grandchildren sang so well. And why should he not revel in absolute delight? Was not the pleroma freed from all danger? What ship's captain fails to rejoice even with indecent frolic? Every day we witness the uproarious ebullitions of sailors' joys. Therefore, as sailors always exult over the reckoning they pay in common, so do these eons enjoy a similar pleasure, one as they now all are in form, and as I may add, in feeling too. With the concurrence of even their new brethren and masters, Christ and the Holy Spirit, they contribute into one common stock the best and most beautiful thing with which they are severally adorned, vainly, as I suppose. For if they were all one by reason of the above-mentioned thorough equalization, there was no room for the process of a common reckoning, which for the most part consists of a pleasing variety. They all contributed the one good thing which they all were. There would be, in all probability, a formal procedure in the mode or in the form of the very equalization in question. Accordingly, out of the donation which they contributed to the honor and glory of the Father, they jointly fashioned the most beautiful constellation of the Pleroma and its perfect fruit, 
Jesus. Him they also surname Soter, Saviour, and Christ, and Sermo, Word, after his ancestors, and lastly Omnia, all things, as formed from a universally culled nosegay like the jay of Aesop, the Pandora of Hesiod, the bowl of Accius, the honey cake of Nestor, the miscellany of Ptolemy. How much nearer the mark if these idle title-mongers had called him Pancarpian after certain Athenian customs. By way of adding external honour also to their wonderful puppet, they produce for him a bodyguard of angels of like nature. If this be their mutual condition, it may be all right. If, however, they are consubstantial with Sota, for I have discovered how doubtfully the case is stated, where will be his eminence when surrounded by attendants who are co-equal with himself? In this series, then, is contained the first emanation of eons who are alike born and married and produce offspring. There are the most dangerous fortunes of Sophia in her ardent longing for the father, the most seasonable help of Horos, the expiation of her enthymesis and accruing passion, the instruction of Christ and the Holy Spirit, their tutelar reform of the eons, the piebald ornamentation of Sota, the consubstantial retinue of the angels. All that remains, according to you, is the fall of the curtain and the clapping of hands. What remains, in my opinion, however, is that you should hear and take heed. At all events, these things are said to have been played out within the company of the playroom, the first scene of the tragedy. The rest of the play, however, is beyond the curtain, I mean outside of the playroom. And yet, if it be such within the bosom of the father, within the embrace of the guardian Horus, why must it be outside, in free space, where God does not exist? End of Against the Valentinians, Part 1, by Tertullian Against the Valentinians, Part 2, by Tertullian This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. For Enthymesis, or rather Achamoth, because by this inexplicable name alone must she be henceforth designated, when in company with the vicious passion, her inseparable companion, she was expelled to places devoid of that light which is the substance of the pleroma, even to the void and empty region of Epicurus, she becomes wretched also because of the place of her banishment. She is indeed without either form or feature, even an untimely and abortive production. Whilst she is in this plight, Christ descends from the heights, conducted by Horos, in order to impart form to the abortion, out of his own energies, the form of substance only, but not of knowledge also. Still, she is left with some property. She has restored to her the odour of immortality, in order that she might, under its influence, be overcome with the desire of better things than belonged to her present plight. Having accomplished his merciful mission, not without the assistance of the Holy Spirit, Christ returns to the pleroma. It is usual, out of an abundance of things, for names to be also forthcoming. Enthymesis, came from action, whence Akamoth came is still a question. Sophia emanates from the Father, the Holy Spirit from an angel. She entertains a regret for Christ immediately after she had discovered her desertion by him. Therefore she hurried forth herself in quest of the light of him whom she did not at all discover, as he operated in an invisible manner, for how else would she make search for his light, which was as unknown to her as he was himself? Try, however, she did, and perhaps would have found him, had not the selfsame Horos, who had met her mother so opportunely, fallen in with the daughter quite as unseasonably, so as to exclaim at her, I -a -o, just as we hear the cry, Poro Quiritus, out of the way, Romans, or else Fidem Caesaris, by the faith of Caesar, whence, as they will have it, the name I -a -o, comes to be found in the scriptures. Being thus hindered from proceeding further, and being unable to surmount the cross, that is to say, Horos, because she had not yet practised herself in the part of Catullus's Loreolus, and given over, as it were, to that passion of hers in a manifold and complicated mesh, she began to be afflicted with every impulse thereof, with sorrow, because she had not accomplished her enterprise, with fear, lest she should lose her life, 
even as she had lost the light, with consternation, and then with ignorance. But not as her mother did she suffer this, for she was an eon. Hers, however, was a worse suffering, considering her condition, for another tide of emotion still overwhelmed her, even of conversion to the Christ, by whom she had been restored to life, and had been directed to this very conversation. Well now, the Pythagoreans may learn, the Stoics may know, Plato himself may discover whence matter, which they will have to be unborn, derived both its origin and substance for all this pile of the world, a mystery which not even the renowned Mercurius Trismegistus, master as he was of all physical philosophy, thought out. You have just heard of conversion, one element in the passion we have so often mentioned. Out of this the whole life of the world, and even that of the demiurge himself, our God, is said to have had its being. Again, you have heard of sorrow and fear. From these all other created things took their beginning. For from her tears flowed the entire mass of waters. From this circumstance one may form an idea of the calamity which she encountered, so vast were the kinds of the tears wherewith she overflowed. She had salt tear-drops, she had bitter and sweet and warm and cold, and bituminous and ferruginous and sulphurous, and even poisonous, so that the nonacris exuded therefrom which killed Alexander, and the river of the Lincesti flowed from the same source which produces drunkenness, and the salmasis was derived from the same source which renders men effeminate. The rains of heaven, Achamoth, whimpered forth, and we on our part are anxiously employed in saving up in our cisterns the very wails and tears of another. In like manner, from the consternation and alarm of which we have also heard, bodily elements were derived. And yet, amidst so many circumstances of solitude, in this vast prospect of destitution, she occasionally smiled at the recollection of the sight of Christ, and from this smile of joy light flashed forth. How great was this beneficence of providence, which induced her to smile, and all that we might not linger for ever in the dark. Nor need you feel astonished how from her joy so splendid an element could have beamed upon the world, when from her sadness even so necessary a provision flowed forth for man. O illuminating smile, O irrigating tear, and yet it might now have acted as some alleviation amidst the horror of her situation, for she might have shaken off all the obscurity thereof, as often as she had a mind to smile, even not to be obliged to turn suppliant to those who had deserted her. She too resorts to prayers after the manner of her mother, but Christ, who now felt a dislike to quit the Pleroma, appoints the Paraclete as his deputy. To her, therefore, he dispatches Soter, the Saviour, who must be the same as Jesus, to whom the Father imparted the supreme power over the whole body of the eons, by subjecting them all to him, so that by him, as the Apostle says, all things were created, with a retinue and cortege of contemporary angels, and, as one may suppose, with a dozen faces. Hereupon Achamoth, being quite struck with the pomp of his approach, immediately covered herself with a veil, moved at first with a dutiful feeling of veneration and modesty, but afterwards she surveys him calmly and his prolific equipage, with such energies as she had derived from the contemplation she meets him with the salutation, Curia here, hail, Lord. Upon this, I suppose, he receives her, confirms and conforms her in knowledge, as well as cleanses her from all the outrages of passion, without, however, utterly severing them, with an indiscriminateness like that which had happened in the casualties which befell her mother. For such vices as had become inveterate and confirmed by practice, he throws together, and when he had consolidated them in one mass, he fixes them in a separate body, so as to compose the corporeal condition of matter, extracting out of her inherent incorporeal passion such an aptitude of nature as might qualify it to attain a reciprocity of bodily substances which should emulate one another so that a twofold condition of the substances might be arranged one full of evil through its faults the other susceptible of passion from conversion this will prove to be matter which has set us in battle array against homogenes and all others who presume to teach that god made all things out of matter not out of nothing
Then Akamoth, delivered at length from all her evils, wonderful to tell, goes on and bears fruit with greater results, for, warmed with the joy of so great an escape from her unhappy condition, and at the same time heated with an actual contemplation of the angelic luminaries, one is ashamed to use such language, but there is no other way of expressing one's meaning. She, during the emotion, somehow became personally inflamed with desire towards them, and at once grew pregnant with a spiritual conception, at the very image which the violence of her joyous transport and the delight of her prurient excitement had imbibed and impressed upon her. She at length gave birth to an offspring, and then there arose a leash of natures from a triad of causes, one material arising from her passion, another animal arising from her conversion, the third spiritual which had its origin in her imagination. Having become a better proficient in practical conduct by the authority which, we may well suppose, accrued to her from her three children, she determined to impart form to each of the natures. The spiritual one, however, she was unable to touch inasmuch as she was herself spiritual, for a participation in the same nature has, to a very great extent, disqualified like and consubstantial beings from having superior power over one another. Therefore she applies herself solely to the animal nature, adducing the instructions of Sota for her guidance. And first of all, she does what cannot be described, and read and heard of, without an intense horror at the blasphemy thereof. She produces this god of ours, the god of all, except of the heretics, the father and creator and king of all things, which are inferior to him. For from him do they proceed. If, however, they proceed from him, and not rather from Akamoth, or if only secretly from her, without his perceiving her, he was impelled to all that he did, even like a puppet, which is moved from the outside. In fact, it was owing to this very ambiguity about the personal agency in the works which were done, that they coined for him the mixed name of Metropata, Motherly Father whilst his other appellations were distinctly assigned according to the conditions and positions of his works, so that they call him father in relation to the animal substances to which they give the place of honour on his right hand, whereas in respect of the material substances which they banish to his left hand, they name him Demiurgus, whilst his title king designates his authority over both classes, nay over the universe." And yet there is not any agreement between the propriety of the names and that of the works from which all the names are suggested, since all of them ought to have borne the name of her by whom the things were done, unless after all it turn out that they were not made by her. For although they say that Akamoth devised these forms in honour of the eons, they yet transfer this work to Sota as its author, when they say that he operated through her, so far as to give her the very image of the invisible and unknown father, that is, the image which was unknown and invisible to the demiurge, whilst he formed this same demiurge in imitation of Nus, the son of Propata, and whilst the archangels, who were the work of the demiurge, resembled the other eons. Now, when I hear of such images of the three, I ask, do you not wish me to laugh at these pictures of their most extravagant painter? At the female Akamoth, a picture of the father, at the demiurge, ignorant of his mother, much more so of his father. At the picture of Nus, ignorant of his father too, and the ministering angels, facsimiles of their lords. This is painting a mule from an ass, and sketching Ptolemy from Valentinus. The demiurge, therefore, placed as he was without the limits of the pleroma, in the ignominious solitude of his eternal exile, founded a new empire, this world of ours, by clearing away the confusion and distinguishing the difference between the two substances which severally constituted it, the animal and the material. Out of incorporeal elements he constructs bodies, heavy, light, erect, and stooping, celestial and terrene. Then he completes the sevenfold stage of heaven itself, with his own throne above all. Whence he had the additional name of Sabatum, from the hebdomadal nature of his abode, his mother Akamoth, too, had the title Ogdoada, after the precedent of the primeval Ogdoad. These heavens, however, they consider to be intelligent, and sometimes they make angels of them, as indeed they do of the demiurge himself, as also they call Paradise the fourth archangel, because they fix it above the third heaven of the power of which Adam partook, when he sojourned there amidst its fleecy clouds and shrubs. 
Ptolemy remembered perfectly well the prattle of his boyhood, that apples grew in the sea and fishes on the tree. After the same fashion, he assumed that nut trees flourished in the skies. The demiurge does his work in ignorance, and therefore perhaps he is unaware that trees ought to be planted only on the ground. His mother, of course, knew all about it. How is it, then, that she did not suggest the fact, since she was actually executing her own operation? But whilst building up so vast an edifice for her son by means of those works which proclaim him at once to be father, god, and king before the conceits of the Valentinians, why she refused to let them be known to even him is a question which I shall ask afterwards. Meanwhile, you must believe that Sophia has the surnames of Earth and of Mother, Mother Earth, of course, and what may excite your laughter still more heartily, even Holy Spirit. In this way they have conferred all honour on that female, I suppose even a beard, not to say other things. Besides, the demiurge had so little mastery over things, on the score you must know of his inability to approach spiritual essences, constituted as he was of animal elements, that, imagining himself to be the only being, he uttered this soliloquy, I am God, and beside me there is none else. But for all that, he at least was aware that he had not himself existed before. He understood, therefore, that he had been created, and that there must be a creator of a creature of some sort or other. How happens it, then, that he seemed to himself to be the only being, notwithstanding his uncertainty, and although he had, at any rate, some suspicion of the existence of some creator? The odium felt amongst them against the devil is the more excusable, even because the peculiarly sordid character of his origin justifies it. For he is supposed by them to have had his origin in that criminal excess of her sorrow, from which they also derive the birth of the angels and demons and all wicked spirits. Yet they affirm that the devil is the work of the demiurge, and they call him Munditanens, ruler of the world, and maintain that, as he is of a spiritual nature, he has a better knowledge of the things above than the demiurge, an animal being. He deserves from them the preeminence which all heresies provide him with. Their most eminent powers, moreover, they confine within the following limits, as in a citadel. In the most elevated of all summits presides the Trisonry Pleroma, Horos marking off its boundary line. Beneath it, Akamoth occupies the intermediate space for her abode, treading down her sun. For under her comes the Demiurge in his own hebdomad, or rather the devil, sojourning in this world in common with ourselves, formed, as has been said above, of the same elements and the same body, out of the most profitable calamities of Sophia, inasmuch as, if it had not been for these, our spirit would have had no space for inhaling and ejecting air, that delicate vest of all corporeal creatures, that revealer of all colours, that instrument of the seasons, if the sadness of Sophia had not filtered it, just as her fear did the animal existences, and her conversion the demiurge himself. Into all these elements and bodies fire was fanned. Now since they have not as yet explained to us the original sensation of this in Sophia, I will on my own responsibility conjecture that its spark was struck out of the delicate emotions of her feverish grief. For you may be quite sure that amidst all her vexations, she must have had a good deal of fever. Such being their conceits respecting God, or if you like, the gods, of what sort are their figments concerning man? For, after he had made the world, the demiurge turns his hands to man, and chooses for him as his substance not any portion of the dry land, as they say, of which alone we have any knowledge, although it was at that time not yet dried by the waters becoming separated from the earthly residuum, and only afterwards became dry but of the invisible substance of that matter which philosophy indeed dreams of from its fluid and fusible composition, the origin of which I am unable to imagine because it exists nowhere. Now, since fluidity and fusibility are qualities of liquid matter, and since everything liquid flowed from Sophia's tears, we must, as a necessary conclusion, believe that muddy earth is constituted of Sophia's eye rooms and viscid discharges, which are just as much the dregs of tears as mud is the sediment of waters. Thus does the demiurge mould man as a potter does his clay, and animates him with his own breath. Made after his image and likeness, he will therefore be both material and animal, a fourfold being, 
for in respect of his image he must be deemed clayey, that is to say material, although the demiurge is not composed of matter. But as to his likeness he is animal, for such too is the demiurge. You have two of his constituent elements. Moreover, a coating of flesh was, as they allege, afterwards placed over the clayey substratum, and it is this tunic of skin which is susceptible of sensation. In Akamoth, moreover, there was inherent a certain property of a spiritual germ of her mother Sophia's substance, and Akamoth herself had carefully severed off the same quality, and implanted it in her son the Demiurge, although he was actually unconscious of it. It is for you to imagine the industry of this clandestine arrangement, for to this end had she deposited and concealed this germ, that whenever the Demiurge came to impart life to Adam by his inbreathing, he might at the same time draw off from the vital principle the spiritual seed, and as by a pipe inject it into the clayey nature, in order that, being then fecundated in the material body as in a womb, and having fully grown there, it might be found fit for one day receiving the perfect word. When, therefore, the demiurge commits to Adam the transmission of his own vital principle, the spiritual man lay hid, although inserted by his breath, and at the same time introduced into the body, because the demiurge knew no more about his mother's seed than about herself. To this seed they give the name of Ecclesia the Church, the mirror of the church above and the perfection of man, tracing this perfection from Akamoth, just as they do the animal nature from the demiurge, the clayey material of the body they derive from the primordial substance, the flesh from matter, so that you have a new Guryon here, only a fourfold rather than a threefold monster. In like manner they assign to each of them a separate end, to the material, that is to say the carnal nature, which they also call the left-handed, they assign undoubted destruction to the animal nature, which they also call the right-handed, a doubtful issue, inasmuch as it oscillates between the material and the spiritual, and is sure to fall at last on the side to which it has mainly gravitated. As regards the spiritual, however, they say that it enters into the formation of the animal, in order that it may be educated in company with it, and be disciplined by repeated intercourse with it. For the animal nature was in want of training, even by the senses. For this purpose, accordingly, was the whole structure of the world provided. For this purpose also did Sota, the Saviour, present himself in the world, even for the salvation of the animal nature. By yet another arrangement, they will have it that he, in some prodigious way, clothed himself with the primary portions of those substances, the whole of which he was going to restore to salvation in such wise that he assumed the spiritual nature from Akamoth, while he derived the animal being, Christ, afterwards from the Demiurge. His corporal substance, however, which was constituted of an animal nature, only with wonderful and indescribable skill, he wore for a dispensational purpose, in order that he might, in spite of his own unwillingness, be capable of meeting persons, and of being seen and touched by them, and even of dying." But there was nothing material assumed by him inasmuch as that was incapable of salvation, as if he could possibly have been more required by any others than by those who were in want of salvation. And all this in order that by severing the condition of our flesh from Christ, they may also deprive it of the hope of salvation. I now adduce what they say concerning Christ, upon whom some of them engraft Jesus with so much license that they foist into him a spiritual seed together with an animal in fleshus. Indeed, I will not undertake to describe these incongruous crammings, which they have contrived in relation both to their men and their gods. Even the Demiurge has a Christ of his own, his natural son." an animal in short produced by himself proclaimed by the prophets his position being one which must be decided by prepositions in other words he was produced by means of a virgin rather than of a virgin on the ground that having descended into the virgin rather in the manner of a passage through her than of a birth by her he came into existence through her not of her not experiencing a mother in her but nothing more than a way Upon this same Christ, therefore, so they say, Jesus descended in the sacrament of baptism, in the likeness of a dove. Moreover, there was even in Christ accruing from Akamoth the condiment of a spiritual seed, in order, of course, to prevent the corruption of all the other stuffing. For after the precedent of the principal tetrad, they guard him with four substances, 
the spiritual one of Akamoth, the animal one of the Demiurge, the corporeal one, which cannot be described, and that of Sota, or in another phrase, the Columbine. As for Sota, Jesus, he remained in Christ to the last, impassable, incapable of injury, incapable of apprehension. By and by, when it came to a question of capture, he departed from him during the examination before Pilate. In like manner, his mother's seed did not admit of being injured, being equally exempt from all manner of outrage, and being undiscovered even by the demiurge himself. The animal and carnal Christ, however, does suffer after the fashion of the superior Christ, who, for the purpose of producing Akamoth, had been stretched upon the cross, that is, Horos, in a suitable, though not a cognizable form. In this manner do they reduce all things to mere images, Christians themselves being indeed nothing but imaginary beings. Meanwhile the Demiurge, being still ignorant of everything, although he will actually have to make some announcement himself by the prophets, but is quite incapable of even this part of his duty, because they divide authority over the prophets between Akamoth, the seed, and the Demiurge. No sooner heard of the advent of Sota, the saviour, than he runs to him with haste and joy, with all his might, like the centurion in the gospel and being enlightened by him on all points he learns from him also of his own prospect how that he is to succeed to his mother's place being thenceforth free from all care he carries on the administration of this world mainly under the plea of protecting the church for as long a time as may be necessary and proper i will now collect from different sources by way of conclusion what they affirm concerning the dispensation of the whole human race having at first stated their views as to man's threefold nature, which was, however, united in one in the case of Adam. They then proceed after him to divide it into three with their especial characteristics, finding opportunity for such distinction in the posterity of Adam himself, in which occurs a threefold division as to moral differences. Cain and Abel and Seth, who were in a certain sense the sources of the human race, become the fountainheads of just as many qualities of nature and essential character. The material nature, which had become reprobate for salvation, they assigned to Cain. The animal nature, which was poised between divergent hopes, they find in Abel. The spiritual preordained for certain salvation they store up in Seth. In this way also they make a twofold distinction among souls, as to their property of good and evil, according to the material condition derived from Cain, or the animal from Abel. Men's spiritual state they derive over and above the other conditions, from Seth adventitiously, not in the way of nature but of grace, in such wise that Akamoth infuses it among superior beings like rain into good souls, that is, those who are enrolled in the animal class. Whereas the material class, in other words, those which are bad souls, they say never receive the blessings of salvation, for that nature they have pronounced to be incapable of any change or reform in its natural condition. This grain, then, of spiritual seed is modest and very small when cast from her hand, but under her instruction increases and advances into full conviction, as we have already said, and the souls, on this very account, so much excelled all others, that the demiurge, even then in his ignorance, held them in great esteem. For it was from their list that he had been accustomed to select men for kings and for priests, and these even now, if they have once attained to a full and complete knowledge of these foolish conceits of theirs, since they are already naturalized in the fraternal bond of the spiritual state, will obtain a sure salvation, nay, one which is on all accounts their due. For this reason it is that they neither regard works as necessary for themselves, nor do they observe any of the calls of duty, eluding even the necessity of martyrdom on any pretense which may suit their pleasure. For this rule, they say, is enjoined upon the animal seed, in order that the salvation, which we do not possess by any privilege of our state, we may work out by right of our conduct. Upon us, who are of an imperfect nature, is imprinted the mark of this animal seed, because we are reckoned as sprung from the loves of Thaletus, and consequently as an abortion just as their mother was. But woe to us indeed, should we in any point transgress the yoke of discipline, should we grow dull in the works of holiness and justice, should we desire to make our confession anywhere else, I know not where, and not before the powers of this world and the tribunals of the chief magistrates. As for them, however, they may prove their nobility by the dissoluteness of their life and their diligence in sin, since Akamoth fawns on them as her own, for she too found sin no unprofitable pursuit. 
Now it is held amongst them that for the purpose of honouring the celestial marriages, it is necessary to contemplate and celebrate the mystery always by cleaving to a companion, that is, to a woman. Otherwise they account any man degenerate and a bastard to the truth, who spends his life in the world without loving a woman or uniting himself to her. Then what is to become of the eunuchs who we see amongst them? It remains that we say something about the end of the world and the dispensing of reward. As soon as Akamoth has completed the full harvest of her seed, and has then proceeded to gather it into her garner, or after it has been taken to the mill and ground to flour, has hidden it in the kneading trough with yeast until the whole be leavened, then shall the end speedily come. Then, to begin with, Akamoth herself removes from the middle region, from the second stage to the highest, since she is restored to the pleroma, she is immediately received by that paragon of perfection, Sota, as her spouse, of course, and they too afterwards consummate new nuptials. This must be the spouse of the scriptures, the pleroma of espousals, for you might suppose that the Julian laws were interposing, since there are these migrations from place to place. In like manner, the demiurge too will then change the scene of his abode from the celestial hebdomad to the higher regions, to his mother's now vacant saloon, by this time knowing her without, however, seeing her, a happy coincidence, for if he had caught a glance of her, he would have preferred never to have known her. As for the human race, its end will be to the following effect. To all which bear the earthly and material mark, there accrues an eternal destruction, because all flesh is grass, and amongst these is the soul of mortal man, except when it has found salvation by faith. The souls of just men, that is to say our souls, will be conveyed to the demiurge in the abodes of the middle region. We are duly thankful. We shall be content to be classed with our God, in whom lies our own origin. In the palace of the Pleroma, nothing of the animal nature is admitted, nothing but the spiritual swarm of Valentinus. There, then, the first process is the despoiling of men themselves, that is, men within the Pleroma. Now this despoiling consists of the putting off of the souls in which they appear to be clothed, which they will give back to their demiurge as they had obtained them from him. They will then become wholly intellectual spirits, impalpable, invisible, and in this state will be readmitted invisibly to the playroom, stealthily, if the case admits of the idea. What then? They will be dispersed amongst the angels, the attendants on Sota. As sons, do you suppose? Not at all. As servants, then? No, not even so. Well, as phantoms? Would that it were nothing more. Then in what capacity, if you are not ashamed to tell us? In the capacity of brides. Then will they end their Sabine rapes with the sanction of wedlock. This will be the guerdon of the spiritual, this the recompense of their faith. Such fables have their use. Although but a Marcus or a Gaius, full-grown in this flesh of ours, with a beard and such like proofs of virility, it may be a stern husband, a father, a grandfather, a great-grandfather, never mind what, in fact, if only a male. You may perhaps in the bridal chamber of the playroomer, I have already said so tacitly, even become the parent by an angel of some eon of high numerical rank. For the right celebration of these nuptials, instead of the torch and veil, I suppose that secret fire is then burst forth, which, after devastating the whole existence of things, will itself also be reduced to nothing at last, after everything has been reduced to ashes, and so their fable too will be ended. But I too am no doubt a rash man in having exposed so great a mystery in so derisive a way. I ought to be afraid that Akamoth, who did not choose to make herself known even to her own son, would turn mad, that Thaletus would be enraged, that fortune would be irritated. But I am yet a liegeman of the demiurge. I have to return after death to the place where there is no more giving in marriage, where I have to be clothed upon rather than to be despoiled, where even if I am despoiled of my sex I am classed with angels, not a male angel nor a female one. There will be no one to do aught against me, nor will they then find any male energy in me. I shall now at last produce, by way of finale, after so long a story, those points which, not to interrupt the course of it, and by the interruption distract the reader's attention, I have preferred reserving to this place. They have been variously advanced by those who have improved on the doctrines of Ptolemy. For there have been in his school disciples above their master who have attributed to their bithus two wives cogitatio thought and voluntas will 
for Cogitatio alone was not sufficient wherewith to produce any offspring, although from the two wives procreation was most easy to him. The former bore him monogenes, only begotten, and veritas, truth. Veritas was a female after the likeness of Cogitatio. Monogenes, a male, bearing a resemblance to voluntas, for it is the strength of voluntas which procures the masculine nature inasmuch as she affords efficiency to cogitatio. Others, of purer mind, mindful of the honour of the deity, have, for the purpose of freeing him from the discredit of even single wedlock, preferred assigning no sex whatever to Bithus, and therefore very likely they talk of this deity in the neutral gender rather than this god. Others, again, on the other hand, speak of him as both masculine and feminine, so the worthy chronicler Fenestella must not suppose that an hermaphrodite was only to be found among the good people of Luna. There are some who do not claim the first place for Bithus, but only a lower one. They put their Ogdoad in the foremost rank, itself, however, derived from a tetrad, but under different names, for they put Proarche, before the beginning, first, Ananoetos, inconceivable, second, Aretos, indescribable, third, Aoratos, invisible, fourth. Then after Proarche, they say Arche, beginning, came forth, and occupied the first and the fifth place, and from Ananoetos came Akataleptos, incomprehensible, in the second and the sixth place. From Aretos came Anonomastos, nameless, in the third and seventh place. From Aoratos came Agenetos, unbegotten, in the fourth and the eighth place. Now by what method he arranges this, that each of these eons should be born in two places, and that too, at such intervals, I prefer to be ignorant of than to be informed. For what can be right in a system which is propounded with such absurd peculiars? How much more sensible are they who, rejecting all this tiresome nonsense, have refused to believe that any one eon has descended from another by steps like these, which are really neither more nor less commonian? but that on a given signal, the eightfold emanation of which we have heard, issued all at once from the father and his enuia thought, that it is, in fact, from his mere notion that they gain their designations. When, as they say, he thought of producing offspring, he on that account gained the name of father. After producing, because the issue which he produced was true, he received the name of truth. When he wanted himself to be manifested, he on that account was announced as man. Those, moreover, whom he preconceived in his thought when he produced them were then designated the church. As man he uttered his word, and so this word is his first begotten son, and to the word was added life. And by this process the first Ogdoad was completed. However, the whole of this tiresome story is utterly poor and weak. Now listen to some other buffooneries of a master who is a great swell among them, and who has pronounced his dicta with an even priestly authority. They run thus. There comes, he says, before all things, pro arche, the inconceivable and indescribable and nameless, which I for my own part called monotis, solitude. With this was associated another power to which also I give the name of henotis, unity, now, inasmuch as monotis and henotis, that is to say, solitude and union, were only one being, they produced, and yet not in the same way of production, the intellectual, inassible, invisible beginning of all things, which human language has called monad, solitude. This has inherent in itself a consubstantial force which it calls unity. These powers, accordingly, solitude or solitariness, and unity or union, propagated all the other emanations of eons, Wonderful distinction, to be sure. Whatever change, union, and unity may undergo, solitariness and solitude is profoundly supreme. Whatever designation you give the power, it is one and the same. Secundus is a trifle more human, as he is briefer. He divides the Ogdoad into a pair of tetrads, a right-hand one and a left-hand one, one light and the other darkness only he is unwilling to derive the power which apostatized and fell away from any one of the eons, but from the fruits which issued from their substance. Now concerning even the Lord Jesus, into how great a diversity of opinion are they divided? One party form him in the blossoms of all the eons, another party will have it that he is made up only of those ten whom the word and the life produced, from which circumstances the titles of the word and the life were suitably transferred to him. Others, again, that he rather sprang from the twelve, the offspring of man and the church, 
and therefore they say he was designated son of man. Others, moreover, maintain that he was formed by Christ and the Holy Spirit, who have to provide for the establishment of the universe, and that he inherits by right his father's appellation. Some there are who have imagined that another origin must be found for the title Son of Man, for they have had the presumption to call the Father himself Man by reason of the profound mystery of this title, so that what can you hope for more ample concerning faith in that God with whom you are now yourself on a par? Such conceits are constantly cropping out amongst them from the redundance of their mother's seed, and so it happens that the doctrines which have grown up amongst the Valentinians have already extended their rank growth to the woods of the Gnostics. End of Against the Valentinians, Part 2, by Tertullian. Concerning Prayer, by Tertullian. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Jesus Christ our Lord, God's Spirit, God's Word and God's Reason, Word of Reason and Reason of Word and Spirit of both, fixed for the new disciples of the new covenant a new form of prayer. For it was meet that in this sphere also new wine should be stored in new wineskins, and that a new patch should be sewn on a new garment. For everything that had been in the past was either changed, as for example circumcision, or completed, as the rest of the law, or fulfilled like prophecy, or brought to perfection as faith itself. All things were renewed from their carnal state and became spiritual by the new grace of God, which added the gospel to fulfill all that had been in the past. In it, our Lord Jesus Christ was proved to be at once the Spirit of God, the Word of God, and the reason of God. The Spirit by the power he had, the Word by his teaching, and the reason by his coming. So, therefore, prayer, as established by Christ, consisted of three elements. The Word, by which it is uttered, the Spirit, in which alone lies its power, and the reason by which it is taught. John, too, had taught his disciples to pray, but all John's works was a preparation for Christ, until when he, Christ, had increased, even as the same John prophesied that he must increase, while he himself must decrease, all the work of the earlier servant must pass along, with his spirit itself, to his master. The reason, too, why there is no surviving record of the words in which John taught his followers to pray is this, that the earthly yielded to the heavenly. He that is of the earth, he said, speaketh earthly things, and he that is here from heaven speaketh those things that he hath seen. And what is there belonging to the Lord Christ that is not from heaven, this training in prayer included? Let us consider, therefore, blessed ones, his heavenly wisdom, particularly that touching the precept to pray in secret, in which he both exacted man's faith, his trust that both the sight and the hearing of the all-powerful God are present within the house, and even in a secret place, and also longed for the obedience of faith, so that man should offer his worship to him alone, who he was confident sees and hears everywhere. The second wisdom set forth in the second precept would have a like connection with faith and the obedience of faith, if we did not think a volume of words necessary for our approach to the Lord, who we are certain looks to the good of his own without any action of ours. And yet this brevity, because it conduces to the attainment of the third degree of wisdom, is supported by the substance of a great and blessed interpretation, and is as comprehensive in thought as it is succinct in language. For it includes not only the special duties of prayer, namely the worship of God or the petition of man, but almost the whole of the Lord's teaching, all the recollection of his training, so that really in the prayer there is contained an epitome of the whole gospel. It begins with witness to God and the reward of faith when we say, Father who art in heaven. For we are both praying to God and setting forth our faith, the reward of which is the right to call him by this name. It is written, 
To them that have believed in him he hath given the power to be called sons of God. And yet the Lord frequently declared God to be our Father, and even commanded that we were to call none Father on earth save him whom we have in heaven. Therefore in worshipping him thus we are also obeying a command. Happy they who recognize their Father. It is the failure to do this that is cast in the teeth of Israel, a failure to which the Spirit calls heaven and earth to witness, saying, I have begotten sons, and they have not recognized me. And in calling him Father, we name him God also. This name indicates at once his regard for us and his power. Also, in calling on the Father, we are calling upon the Son, for he says, I and the Father are one. Nor is the mother, the church, overlooked either, since in son and father, mother is implied, from whom the names both of father and of son derive their meaning. In one way, therefore, or in one word, we at once honour God in company with his own, and remember the command, and stigmatise those that have forgotten the father. The name of God the Father had been revealed to no one. Even he who had asked about it, I mean Moses, had really been told a different name. It has been revealed to us in the Son. But who then is the Son? It is a new name of the Father. I have come, said he, in the name of the Father, and again, Father, glorify thy name, and more clearly, I manifested thy name unto men. We ask, therefore, that it should be kept holy, not because it is becoming that men should pray for God's good, as if there were also another power for whose good we could pray him, or as if he would be in trouble if we did not pray for him. It is, of course, most fitting that God should be blessed everywhere and always for the remembrance of his benefits, a remembrance due at all times from every man. This, too, takes the place of blessing. But when is God's name not holy and hallowed in itself, seeing that its power makes all others holy? Before his presence, the surrounding angels never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy. So, therefore, we too, candidates for the position of angel, if we earn it, even in this world, can fully learn that heavenly word with which to address God, and the duty pertaining to our future state of glory. So far concerning God's glory. Again, as regards our petition, when we say, Hallowed be thy name, we ask that it should be made holy in us, who are in him, and at the same time in all others on whom the grace of God is still waiting, that we may obey this precept also, by praying for all, even for our enemies. And therefore by curtailing our utterance, and by refraining from saying, let it be hallowed in us, we mean in all. In accordance with this form we add, thy will be done in heaven and in earth. Not because any one is opposing the doing of God's will, and we are praying that he may see his will triumph, but we ask that his will may be done in all. For by a figurative interpretation as flesh and spirit, we are earth and heaven. And yet, even if the petition is to be understood in its plain sense, nevertheless it has the same meaning, that in us God's will may be done on earth, and that, of course, it may be done in heaven also. What else does God will? but that we should walk according to his training. We ask, therefore, that he supply us with the nature and power of his will, that we may be safe both in heaven and on earth, because the chief purpose of his will is the salvation of those whom he has adopted. There is also that will of God which the Lord carried out in preaching, working, and enduring. For if he himself declared that he was doing not his own will, but his Father's, without doubt his deeds were in accordance with his Father's will. These we are now incited to regard as patterns, that we may both preach and work and endure even to death. Such an ideal we cannot attain independently of the will of God. Likewise, when we say, Thy will be done, even in that petition we are praying for our own benefit, because there is no evil in God's will, in spite of the fact that each man is rewarded according to his merits. By the use of this phrase, we give ourselves a timely warning that may help us to endure. Even the Lord, when in view of his impending passion, he was fain to show the weakness of the flesh, even in his own flesh, said, Father, let this cup pass from me, and then remembering added, But let not my will but thine be done. 
he himself was the will and power of the father and yet to show the endurance that became him he delivered himself to the father's will thy kingdom come is also closely bound up with the petition thy will be done it means in us of course for when does god not reign in whose hand is the heart of all kings but whatever we pray for for ourselves we assign to him and we attribute to him what we expect from him therefore if the reality of the lord's kingdom is bound up with god's will and our expectation how is it that certain persons seek it in some period of the present world's history whereas the kingdom of god for the coming of which we pray looks to the end of the world we are eager to enter into our kingdom we do not want to serve too long even if the request for the coming of the kingdom had not been prescribed in the prayer we would of our own accord have proffered that petition in our haste to embrace our hope the souls of the martyrs under the altar call aloud to the lord in their displeasure how long wilt thou not avenge our blood o lord on the inhabitants of the earth of course their avenging is settled to take place at the end of the world nay rather the speedy coming of thy kingdom o lord means to the christians answered prayer to the heathen disgrace to the angels rapture for its sake we are tormented nay rather for its sake we pray but how finely the divine wisdom has arranged the order of the prayer in making room after heavenly things that is after the name of god the will of god and the kingdom of god for a petition for earthly needs also for the lord had also given the command seek first the kingdom and then these things also will be added unto you and yet we ought rather to understand give us our daily bread this day in a spiritual sense for our bread is christ because christ is life and the bread of life i am he says the bread of life and a little earlier bread is the word of the living god that descendeth from heaven and further because his body is also deemed to be in the bread this is my body therefore in asking daily bread we ask to live perpetually in christ and undivided from his body but because this phrase is admitted in a carnal sense it cannot be realized without the piety that belongs to spiritual instruction as well for he commands that bread be sought which is all the faithful need for after all other things do the heathen seek it is this he insists on by examples and also discusses in parables when he says does a father take away the bread from his children and hand it over to dogs also does he give a stone to his son when he asks for bread he shows you see what sons expect from a father but the man who knocked at the door in the night also called for bread christ further was quite right to add give us this day seeing he had said beforehand ponder not about the morrow what ye shall eat in conformity with this teaching he added the parable of the man who planned an enlargement of his granaries for his increasing crops and periods of long freedom from care but died on that very night it followed that having noted the generosity of god we should beg for his mercy also for what good will nourishment do if we are allotted to him exactly as a bull is to sacrifice the lord knew that he alone was without sin he teaches us therefore to ask that our debts be forgiven confession is the asking of indulgence because he who asks indulgence is confessing sin so also penitence is shown to be acceptable to god because he wishes it more than the death of the sinner debt moreover is in the scripture a figure for sin because like debt sin is due to be judged and a demand is made on it and it does not escape just exaction unless exaction be remitted even as the master forgave that slave the debt for that is the lesson running through the whole parable the fact too that the same slave though freed by his master does not in like manner spare his own debtor and for that reason is brought before his master and handed over to the torturer to pay the last penny by which is meant punishment for even a slight sin the fact is connected with our promise also to forgive our debtors already in another place in accordance with this style of prayer he says forgive and it shall be forgiven you and when peter asked whether a brother 
was to be forgiven seven times, he said, nay, rather seventy-seven times, that he might remodel and improve the law by which in Genesis vengeance over Cain was reckoned seven times, but over Lamech seventy times seven. To the fullness of so comprehensive a prayer, he made the addition that we might make entreaty not only for the forgiveness of sins, but also for their entire removal. Lead us not into temptation. In other words, do not allow us to be deceived, of course, by him who tempts. But away with the idea that the Lord should be thought to tempt, as if he either did not know each man's faith or was eager to dethrone it. Weakness and evil nature belong to the devil. For even the command to Abraham about the sacrificing of his son was made not to try his faith but to approve it, that in Abraham the Lord might furnish an example for the carrying out of the command, which he was afterwards to issue, that none should look upon his dear ones with greater love than upon his God. He himself, when tempted by the devil, pointed out the ruler and author of temptation. This clause he enforces by a later words, saying, Pray that ye be not tempted. They were so tempted in abandoning their Lord, because they had given themselves up to sleep rather than to prayer. Therefore the clause brings the answer explaining what is meant by lead us not into temptation. For this is what it means, but draw us away from the evil one. How many commands of prophets, gospels, apostles, how many words of the Lord, parables, illustrations, precepts are alluded to in abbreviated form in very few words? How many duties are fully set forth all at once? Respect to God in the Father, witness to faith in his name, offering of obedience in the will, mention of hope in the kingdom, desire for life in bread, confession of debts in prayer for forgiveness, anxiety about temptations in the request for protection. What wonder God alone could teach how he wished prayer to be addressed to him. The ritual of prayer, therefore, having been settled by himself and inspired by its own special law from his own spirit, even at the very time when it was coming forth from the divine lips, ascends to heaven, recommending to the Father what the Son taught. Since, however, the Lord, who has regard to human needs, says separately after communicating the set form of prayer, Ask and ye shall receive, and since there are things to be asked in view of the circumstances of each individual, they that approach have the right, after dispatching first the regular and standard prayer, by way of a foundation, to build on it outside petitions, embodying their desires, always remembering, however, the prescribed requests. Lest we should be as far away from the ears of God as we are from his precepts, the recollection of the precepts paves the way to heaven for our prayers. The chief of these precepts is that we should not ascend to God's altar until we make an end of any disagreement or misdemeanor of which we have been guilty towards our brethren. For what sort of behavior is it to approach the peace of God without peace in one's heart, to ask the forgiveness of debts while we withhold forgiveness ourselves? How will he who is angry with his brother appease his father, seeing that all wrath has from the beginning been forbidden us? Even Joseph, when giving his brothers permission to go and fetch their father, said, And do not fall into anger by the way. He certainly warned us at that time, for elsewhere our rule of life is named the way, not to proceed to the father in company with anger when we are on the way of prayer. Then the Lord, manifestly enlarging the law, puts wrath against one's brother into the same category as murder. He does not permit injury to be requited even in word. Even if we must get into a passion, our anger is not to be maintained beyond sunset, as the Apostle warns us. And how reckless it is either to pass a day without prayer, while you are slow to apologize to your brother, or to lose the chance to pray, while your angry temper persists. And it is not from anger alone, but from every possible clouding of the spirit, that the purpose of prayer ought to be free, since that purpose proceeds from a spirit like unto the spirit to which it is directed. For a spirit that is stained cannot possibly be recognized by a holy spirit, or a sad by a joyful, or a shackled by a free spirit. No one welcomes an adversary, and only a real friend is admitted to our confidence.
But what sense is there in engaging in prayer with hands washed, it is true, but with the spirit befouled, since even for the hands themselves spiritual cleanliness is necessary, that they may be raised in a state of purity from forgery, from murder, from cruelty, from poisonings, from idolatry, and all other stains which are devised by the spirit, though they are carried out by the work of the hands. This is the true cleanliness, and not that which very many superstitiously cultivate, making use of water for every prayer, even when they have just bathed the whole body. When I inquired very carefully about it and asked the reason, I found that it was a commemoration of the fact that Pilate washed his hands when delivering up the Lord. But we worship the Lord, we are not delivering him up. Nay, rather, we ought to oppose the example of such an one, and not for that sake to wash our hands, except we wash for conscience' sake on account of some stain due to human manner of life. In other respects, our hands are clean enough, for we have washed them with the rest of our bodies once for all in Christ. Although Israel wash daily over his whole body, yet he is never clean. At least his hands are always unclean, for they are covered over for ever with the blood of the prophets and of the Lord himself, and therefore inheriting the guilt of their fathers, they do not dare even to raise them to the Lord, lest some Isaiah should cry aloud, lest Christ should be filled with horror. We, however, do not merely raise them, but also spread them out, and we make our confession to Christ while we represent the Lord's passion and likewise pray. But since we have touched upon one kind of useless worship, it will not be irksome to point out others also, which are justly to be reproached as useless, since they are practised without the authority of any command either of the Lord or of the Apostles. Such practices are indeed to be put down not to piety but to superstition, being, as they are, eagerly pursued and forced, the product of a scrupulous rather than a rational sense of duty, and assuredly to be stopped, if for no other reason than that they put us on a level with the heathen. For example, certain people offer prayer divested of their upper garments. That is the way the heathen approach their images. If this were our duty, the apostles, who give instruction regarding the attitude of prayer, would certainly have included it in their teaching. But perhaps some suppose that Paul left his upper garment with Carpus while engaged in prayer. God, of course, would not listen to men clad in the upper garments although he caught the words of the three holy men in the Babylonian king's furnace when they prayed with their trousers and their turbans on. Again, why, after prayer is duly ended, certain people are accustomed to seat themselves, I cannot see the reason, unless it is that which appeals to children. For, if the well-known Hermas, whose writing is generally entitled The Shepherd, had not seated himself on his couch after his prayer was over, but had done something else, would we claim that this practice too should be observed? Certainly not. For even now the words, when I had prayed and had seated myself upon my couch, are set down simply in the course of the narrative, and not as a pattern of a custom to be followed. Otherwise prayer will have to be offered only where there is a couch. Nay, any one who sits on a seat or a bench will be acting contrary to Scripture. But since the heathen do likewise, sitting down after they have prayed to their marionettes. Even for that reason, what is performed in the presence of images deserves to be reproved in us. There too is added the fault of irreverence, a fault that even the heathen themselves would understand if they had any sense. If indeed it is irreverent to be seated in close view of and right opposite him who you are at the very moment revering and worshipping, how much more is this act irreligious in close view of the living God, while the messenger of prayer is still standing by, unless it be that we are reproaching God with the weariness prayer causes us. And yet if we pray in an orderly and humble attitude, we shall the more commend our prayers to God, even if our hands themselves are not raised on high, but raised moderately and fitly, without the presumptuous raising of the face either. For the publican in the gospel, who not only prayed with humble words, but with humble and downcast expression of face, went away more justified than the self-confident Pharisee. Even the tones of the voice ought to be subdued, else how many air passages should we need if we be heard for our sound? But God is hearer not of the voice but of the mind, even as he is its discerner. 
The demon of the Pythian oracle says, Even a dumb man I understand, and I catch the utterance of one that does not speak. Is it a sound that God's ears are waiting for? How then could Jonah's prayer find its way out to heaven, from the depths of the sea monster's belly through the inward parts of so great a beast, and from the very depths of the sea through so great a mass of waters? And what more will those who pray too loudly gain, except the disturbance of their neighbours? Nay, rather, if they reveal their petitions, what less are they doing than if they were to pray in public? Another custom has now become increasingly common. Those who are fasting after engaging in prayer with their brethren refrain from offering the kiss of peace, which is the seal of prayer. But when can peace be more fittingly exchanged with the brethren than at the time when the prayer of fasting is ascending and is more acceptable that they themselves may share in our fasting by which they have been softened for the making of an agreement with a brother touching their own peace? What prayer is complete when divorced from the holy kiss? Who, when performing his duty to the Lord, is hindered by peace? What sort of sacrifice is it from which one departs without peace? Whatever sort of prayer it be, it will not be better than obedience to the precept which commands us to conceal our fastings. As it is, by abstaining from the kiss we are recognized to be fasting. But if there is anything to be said for the practice, you can perhaps, to prevent you from being guilty of disobeying this command, dispense with the kiss of peace at home, where fasting cannot be entirely concealed. Wherever else, however, you can conceal your state of fasting, you ought to remember the precept. You will thus carry out the public practice and the private custom alike. So also on Good Friday, on which the religious duty of fasting is general, and as it were official, we rightly give up the kiss, not being careful to conceal what we are doing in common with everyone else. Similarly also, with regard to the days of the stations, very many do not think that they should take part in the prayers of the sacrifices, because the station ought to be broken up after receiving the Lord's body. Does the Eucharist then abolish a service dedicated to God, or does it not rather bind it the more to God? Will not your station be more instinct with religion, if you stand at God's altar? If you have received and preserved the Lord's body, both privileges are secure, your participation in the sacrifice and your performance of your duty. If the station has got its name from the example of the army, for we are also the soldiers of God, assuredly no joy or sorrow happening to the camp abolishes the outpost duty of the soldiers, for joy will carry out the discipline more gladly and sorrow more anxiously. Again, concerning the dress, of women at least, the variety of custom has made it impertinent, especially for a man of no position like myself, to express misgivings, after what the Holy Apostle has said, except that there would be nothing impertinent in the statement of scruples, if they were in accordance with the Apostle's views. Concerning the propriety, indeed, of dress and adornment, there is an unmistakable direction from Peter also, checking in the same words, because also in the same spirit, as Paul, both the flaunting of dress, the arrogant display of gold, and the meretriciously elaborate coiffure. A practice, however, maintained universally throughout the churches must be reviewed, as if it were of doubtful validity, namely, whether virgins ought to be veiled or not. Those who concede to virgins the right to keep their heads unveiled appear to rely on the fact that the apostle laid it down, not that virgins specifically, but that women should be veiled, and referred not to the sex, employing the word females, but to the rank of the sex, saying women. For if he had named the sex using the word females, he would have clearly laid down the law with regard to every woman, but when he names one rank of the sex, he distinguishes the other from it by his silence. He could, they say, have either named virgins specially, or used the comprehensive general term females. Those who make this concession should reflect on the constitution of the word itself, what is meant by the term woman from the very earliest literature in the holy writings. They find that already it is the name of the sex, and does not indicate the rank of the sex, since Eve, when she had not yet known man, was named by God both woman and female, female in virtue of her sex in a general sense, woman in virtue of the rank of her sex in a special sense. So, 
since Eve was called by the name woman, though at that time still unmarried, that name has become applicable to a virgin also. And it is not to be wondered at that the Apostle, being of course moved by the same spirit as inspired the composition of the whole of the divine scripture, including the book of Genesis also, used the same word woman as, after the example of Eve, is suitable to an unmarried woman and a virgin. Besides, the rest of his doctrine is in agreement. For by the very fact that he did not name virgins, any more than in another passage where he is teaching about marriage, he sufficiently declares that he has been speaking about every woman and about the whole sex, and that he has made no distinction between woman and virgin. The latter, as a matter of fact, he does not name. One who remembers to make a distinction in other passages, where of course a difference demands it, and he shows the distinction by indicating each of the two classes by its own name, when he does not make a distinction, while he refrains from naming both, intends that no difference should be understood. Again, in the Greek language in which the Apostle composed his letters, it is the custom to speak as much of women as of females. If, therefore, this word, which is in the translation instead of female, is in frequent use as the name of the sex, it was the sex he named when he said woman. In the sex, moreover, the virgin is also referred to. But the following statement is also clear. Every woman, he says, that prays or preaches with uncovered head, disgraces her head. What is meant by every woman, if not women of every age, every class, every position? By the use of the word all, he leaves out no element in woman, just as he leaves out no element in man, and no aspect of veiling. For he says in like manner, every man... Therefore, just as in the case of the male sex, under the name man, even a beardless man is forbidden to veil himself, so also in the case of the female sex, under the name woman, even the virgin is commanded to be veiled. In both sexes alike, let the younger follow the practice of the elder, or else let the male virgins be veiled too. If the female virgins are not veiled, because the male virgins are not bound by name either, let a man who is also beardless be regarded as different from another, if a woman who is also a virgin is to be so regarded. To be sure, it is on account of the angels, he says, that they ought to be veiled because the angels revolted from God for the sake of the daughters of men. Who then would claim that women alone, that is, those already married who have done with virginity, are objects of desire, unless it be unlawful that virgins also should excel in beauty and find lovers? Nay, rather, let us see whether it was not virgins only that they desired, since the scripture says the daughters of men, because the writer could have named wives of men or women indifferently. Also in saying, and took them to themselves as wives, his view is determined by the fact that it is those, of course, that are free who are taken as wives. He would have expressed himself differently concerning those that are not free. Of course, they are apart alike from widowhood and virginity. So by naming the sex in general terms daughters, he mingled the subdivisions together in the whole class. Also, when he says that nature herself teaches that women ought to be veiled by assigning the hair as a covering and an adornment to women, is not the same covering and the same glory of the head assigned also to virgins? If it is a disgrace to a woman to be shaved, it is equally so to a virgin. From those, then, to whom one state of the head is assigned, one practice with regard to the head is also demanded, and this applies even to those virgins who are protected by their childhood, for from the very first she has been named female. This, finally, is also the practice of Israel. But even if he did not practice it, our law, being enlarged and completed, would claim the addition for itself. He, or it, would be excused if he, or it, cast the veil over virgins also. Now let the age, which knows not its own sex, retain the privilege belonging to its simplicity, for even Adam also, when knowledge befell them, immediately covered what they had recognized. Certainly those in whom childhood has now passed away ought in adolescence to perform the duties of morality as well as those of nature. For both in body and in duties they are counted among women. No woman is a virgin from the time that she is marriageable, since the age in her has already married its own husband, namely time. But some virgin has vowed herself to God, 
Yet from that time she both dresses her hair differently and changes all her dress to that of a woman. Let her then make a complete profession and present all the characteristics of a virgin. Let her completely enshroud that which for God's sake she conceals. It is of importance to us to commend to the knowledge of God alone what the grace of God makes it possible to practice, lest we should esteem as highly what comes from men as what we hope for from God. Why dost thou bear before God what thou coverest before men? Wilt thou be more modest in public than in church? If it is a gift of God, and thou hast received it, why dost thou boast, he asks, as if thou hadst not received it? Why, by self-display, dost thou pass a judgment on other women? Is thy ostentation meant to encourage others to that which is good? But really, if thou boastest, thou art thyself in danger of loss, and thou art also forcing others into the same dangers. If we assume a quality from a passion for glory, we are liable to be deceived. Veil thyself, virgin, if virgin thou art, for modesty is thy duty. If thou art a virgin, do not submit to the gaze of the multitude. Let no one look with admiration on thy form, let no one feel thy falsehood. Thou counterfeitest well the aspect of a bride, if so be thou dost veil thy head. Nay, thou dost not appear false, for thou hast wedded Christ, to him thou hast surrendered thy flesh. Act as thy husband's rule requires. If he bids brides of others to veil themselves, be sure he bids his own much more. But think not that the rule of every predecessor is to be upset. Many give over their own wisdom and its steadfastness to the bondage of another's habit. Let them not then be forced to veil themselves, but, at any rate, it is not right that those who wish to do so should be prevented. Even those who cannot deny that they are virgins I permit to enjoy in their repute quietness of conscience before God. Concerning those, however, who are promised to bridegrooms, I can unhesitatingly go beyond my rule and declare with all solemnity that they must be veiled from that day on which they have quivered at the first contact with a man's body in kiss and right hand. For everything in them has already entered into wedlock, their age by its ripeness, their flesh by its age, their spirit by its knowledge, their modesty by its experience of the kiss, their hope by its expectation, their mind by its consent." Rebecca is enough of an example for us, who, when her bridegroom had been merely pointed out, veiled herself when marrying the knowledge of him. As regards kneeling also, prayer finds a variety of practice in the action of a certain very few who refrain from kneeling on the Saturday. At the very moment when this difference of opinion is pleading its cause in the churches, the Lord will give his grace that they may either yield or without proving a stumbling block to others, follow their own opinion. But we, according to the tradition we have received on the day of the Lord's resurrection, and on it alone, ought to refrain carefully not only from this, but from every attitude and duty that cause perplexity, putting off even our daily business, lest we give any place to the devil. The same thing too at Whitsuntide, which is distinguished by the same solemnity of its rejoicing, but who would hesitate daily to prostrate himself before God, even at the very first prayer with which we enter on the day? Further, at the fastings and stations, no prayer must be engaged in without the bended knee and the other signs of humility. For we are not only praying, but also begging for mercy and confessing our misdeeds to God our Lord. With regard to the times of prayer, nothing at all has been ordained, save, of course, that we must pray at all times and in all places. But why in all places when we are forbidden to do so in public? In all places he means that convenience or even necessity has offered. Nor indeed do we regard the apostles as having disobeyed this command when they prayed and sang to God in prison in the hearing of the prisoners, or Paul who on board ship in the presence of all celebrated the Eucharist. Concerning time, however, the keeping also of certain hours will not be useless from an external point of view. I mean of these common hours that mark the intervals of the day, the third, sixth, and ninth, which in Scripture are to be found the most usual. The first pouring of the Holy Spirit on the assembled disciples took place at the third hour. Peter, on the day of which he experienced the vision of all uncleanness in the vessel, had at the sixth hour ascended to the top of the house to pray. 
He also, in company with John, was on his way into the temple at the ninth hour, when he restored the paralytic to health. And although these facts are stated simply without any command about the practice, yet it would be a good thing to establish some prior standard, which will both compel the remembrance of prayer, and as it were compulsorily at times drag one away from affairs to such a duty. We read also of Daniel's practice which followed, you may be sure, the teaching of Israel. We ought, like him, to pray not less than thrice a day, being debtors to the three, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, of course quite apart from the regular prayers which without any reminder are due to the beginning of day and night. But it becomes the faithful neither to take food nor to proceed to the bath before prayer has intervened, for the refreshment and food of the spirit must be deemed to come before that of the flesh, since heavenly things come before earthly things. When a brother has entered thy house, suffer him not to depart without prayer. Thou hast seen, says he, a brother, thou hast seen thy Lord. Particularly if he be a stranger, lest perchance he be an angel. Even he himself, when received by brethren, would not put earthly refreshment before heavenly. For immediately your faith will be judged, or else how will you say according to the precept, Peace be to this house, if you do not exchange a greeting of peace with those who are in the house. Those who are more careful in the matter of prayer are wont to add in their prayers the hallelujah and psalms of this character, to the clauses of which a response is to be made by those who are in their company. And certainly every custom is excellent which conduces to the precedence and honour of God, and such is the bringing to him a full prayer like some fat victim. This is in fact the spiritual victim that abolished the sacrifices of the olden time. To what purpose, says he, is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me? I am full of the burnt offerings of rams, and I will have none of the fat of lambs or the blood of bulls and of goats. For who hath required these at your hands? What God therefore did seek the gospel teaches, the hour will come, he says, when true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and truth. For God is a spirit, and therefore he seeks worshippers of like kind. We are the true worshippers and the true priests, who are praying with the Spirit, with the Spirit sacrifice prayer, a victim specially appropriate and acceptable to God, a victim which he truly sought, which he had in mind for himself. This is the victim, dedicated with our whole heart, fed on faith, cared for with truth, unblemished in innocence, clean in purity, an offering of love garlanded, that we ought to escort to God's altar, in company with a procession of good works, midst psalms and hymns, and it will obtain all things for us from God. What will God refuse to prayer that comes from spirit and truth, since such he demands? We read and hear and see how great are the proofs of his power. Even the prayers of the olden times freed men from fire and wild beasts and starvation, yet it had not received its pattern from Christ. But how much more does Christian prayer work? It does not plant the angel of moisture in the midst of a fire, or stop the mouths of lions, or bring country fair to the starving. It turns away no feeling of suffering by the gift of grace, but furnishes sufferers and the victims of intense feeling and pain with the power to endure. It extends grace to include courage, that faith may know what it is to get from the Lord, realizing what it is suffering for God's name. But even in past days, prayer inflicted scourges, routed the hosts of the enemy, stayed the benefit of rain showers. Now, however, righteous prayer turns away all the wrath of God, keeps watch in face of the enemy, begs for the persecutors. Is there any wonder that it can wring water from the sky, seeing that it could obtain even fire? Prayer is the only thing that can prevail with God. But Christ willed that it should work no evil. All the power he conferred upon it sprang from good. So it has no power except to recall the souls of the dead from the very way of death, to restore the maimed, to cure the sick, to purge the victims of evil spirits, to open the bars of the prison, to loosen the bonds of the upright. 
It also washes away sins, drives back temptations, quenches persecutions, consoles the downhearted, cheers the courageous, attends upon the traveller in distant lands, subdues waves, confounds robbers, nourishes the poor, guides the rich, raises the fallen, supports the falling, and upholds them that do stand. Prayer is a wall for faith, a shield and a weapon against the enemy who watches us from all sides. Therefore let us never go forth unarmed. Let us bethink ourselves of the station by day and of watching by night. Under the armour of prayer let us guard the standard of our commander. Let us in prayer await the angel's trump. All the angels likewise pray. And every creature, beasts of the field and wild beasts, pray and bend the knee. And as they leave the stable or the cave, look up to heaven with no vain utterance, stirring their breath after their own manner. Even the birds, as they rise in the morning, wing their way up to heaven, and make an outstretched cross with the wings in place of hands, and utter something that seems a prayer. What more, then, is there to say on the duty of prayer? Even the Lord himself prayed, to whom be honour and power for ever and ever. End of Concerning Prayer by Tertullian On Baptism by Tertullian. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by David Ronald. Happy is our sacrament of water, in that, by washing away the sins of our early blindness, we are set free and admitted into eternal life. A treatise on this matter will not be superfluous, instructing not only such as are just becoming formed in the faith, but them who, content with having simply believed, without full examination of the grounds of the traditions, carry in mind, through ignorance, an untried, though probable faith. The consequence is that a viper of the Cainite heresy, lately conversant in this quarter, has carried away a great number with her most venomous doctrine, making it her first aim to destroy baptism, which is quite in accordance with nature, for vipers and asps and basilisks themselves generally do affect arid and waterless places. But we, little fishes, after the example of our ichthus, Jesus Christ, are born in water, nor have we safety in any other way than by permanently abiding in water, so that most monstrous creature, who had no right to teach even sound doctrine, knew full well how to kill the little fishes by taking them away from the water. Well, but how great is the force of perversity for so shaking the faith or entirely preventing its reception, that it impugns it on the very principles of which the faith consists. There is absolutely nothing that makes men's minds more obdurate than the simplicity of the divine works which are visible in the act, when compared with the grandeur which is promised thereto in the effect, so that from the very fact that with so great simplicity, without pomp, without any considerable novelty of preparation, finally, without expense, a man is dipped in water, and amid the utterance of some few words, is sprinkled, and then rises again, not much, or not at all, the cleaner. The consequent attainment of eternity is esteemed the more incredible. I am a deceiver if, on the contrary, it is not from their circumstance, and preparation, and expense, that idle solemnities or mysteries get their credit and authority built up. O oh, miserable incredulity! which quite denies to God his own properties, simplicity, and power. What, then, is it not wonderful, too, that death should be washed away by bathing? But it is the more to be believed if the wonderfulness be the reason why it is not believed. For what does it behoove divine works to be in their quality, except that they be above all wonder? We also ourselves wonder, but it is because we believe. Incredulity, on the other hand, wonders but does not believe, for the simple acts it wonders at, as if they were vain, the grand results as if they were impossible. And grant that it be just as you think, sufficient to meet each point is the divine declaration which has forrun, quote, the foolish things of the world hath God elected to confound its wisdom, end quote, and, quote, the things very difficult with men are easy with God, end quote. For if God is wise and powerful, which even they who pass him by do not deny, it is with good reason that he lays the material causes of his own operation in the contraries of wisdom and of power, 
that is, in foolishness and impossibility, since every virtue receives its cause from those things by which it is called forth. Mindful of this declaration as of a conclusive prescript, we nevertheless proceed to treat the question, quote, how foolish and impossible it is to be formed anew by water, in what respect, pray, has this material substance merited an office of so high dignity, end quote. The authority, I suppose, of the liquid element has to be examined. This, however, is found in abundance, and that from the very beginning. For water is one of those things which, before all the furnishings of the world, were quiescent with God in a yet unshapen state. In the first beginning, saith Scripture, God made the heaven and the earth, but the earth was invisible and unorganized, and darkness was over the abyss, and the Spirit of the Lord was hovering over the waters. The first thing, O man, which you have to venerate, is the age of the waters, in that their substance is ancient, the second, their dignity, in that they were the seat of the divine spirit, more pleasing to him, no doubt, than all the other then existing elements. For the darkness was total thus far, shapeless, without the ornament of stars, and the abyss gloomy, and the earth unfurnished, and the heaven unwrought, water alone, always a perfect, gladsome, simple material substance, pure in itself, supplied a worthy vehicle to God. What of the fact that the waters were in some way the regulating powers by which the disposition of the world thenceforward was constituted by God? For the suspension of the celestial firmament in the midst he caused by dividing the waters, the suspension of the dry land he accomplished by separating the waters, after the world had been hereupon set in order through its elements when inhabitants were given it, the waters were the first to receive the precept to bring forth living creatures. Water was the first to produce that which had life, that it might be no wonder in baptism if waters know how to give life. For was not the work of fashioning man himself also achieved with the aid of waters? Suitable material is found in the earth, yet not apt for the purpose unless it be moist and juicy, which earth, the waters, separated the fourth day before into their own place, temper with their remaining moisture to a clayey consistency. If, from that time onward, I go forward in recounting universally, or at more length, the evidences of the authority of this element, which I can adduce to show how great is its power or its grace, how many ingenious devices, how many functions, how useful an instrumentality it affords the world, I fear I may seem to have collected rather the praises of water than the reasons of baptism, although I should thereby teach all the more fully that it is not to be doubted that God has made the material substance which he has disposed throughout all his products and works obey him also in his own peculiar sacraments, that the material substance which governs terrestrial life acts as an agent likewise in the celestial. But it will suffice to have thus called at the outset these points in which withal is recognized that primary principle of baptism which was even then foreknoted by the very attitude assumed for a type of baptism that the spirit of god who hovered over the waters from the beginning would continue to linger over the waters of the baptized but a holy thing of course hovered over a holy or else from that which hovered over that which was hovered over borrowed a holiness, since it is necessary that in every case an underlying material substance should catch the quality of that which overhangs it, most of all a corporal of a spiritual, adapted as the spiritual is, through the subtleness of its substance, both for penetrating and insinuating. Thus the nature of the waters, sanctified by the Holy One itself, conceived withal the power of sanctifying, let no one say, Quote, why then are we, pray, baptized with the very waters which then existed in the first beginning? End quote. Not with those waters, of course, except in so far as the genus indeed is one, but the species very many. But what is an attribute to the genus reappears likewise in the species, and accordingly it makes no difference whether a man be washed in a sea or a pool, a stream or a fount, a lake or a trough, nor is there any distinction between those whom John baptized in the Jordan and those whom Peter baptized in the Tiber, unless withal the eunuch whom Philip baptized in the midst of his journeys with chance water, derived therefrom more or less of salvation than others. All waters, therefore, in virtue of the pristine privilege of their origin, 
do, after invocation of God, attain the sacramental power of sanctification, for the Spirit immediately supervenes from the heavens and rests over the waters, sanctifying them from himself, and being thus sanctified, they imbibe at the same time the power of sanctifying. Albeit the similitude may be admitted to be suitable to the simple act that, since we are defiled by sins, as it were by dirt, we should be washed from those stains in waters. But as sins do not show themselves in our flesh, inasmuch as no one carries on his skin the spot of idolatry, or fornication, or fraud, so persons of that kind are foul in the spirit, which is the author of the sin, for the spirit is Lord, the flesh servant. Yet they each mutually share the guilt, the spirit on the ground of command, the flesh of subservience. Therefore, after the waters have been in a manner endued with medicinal virtue, through the intervention of the angel, the spirit is corporally washed in the waters, and the flesh is in the same spiritually cleansed. Quote, well, but the nations who are strangers to all understanding of spiritual powers ascribe to their idols the imbuing of waters with the same self-efficacy, end quote. So they do, but they cheat themselves with waters which are widowed, for washing is the channel through which they are initiated into some sacred rites of some notorious Isis or Mithras. The gods themselves likewise they honor by washings. Moreover, by carrying water around and sprinkling it, they everywhere expiate country seats, houses, temples, and whole cities, at all events, at the Apollinarian and Eleusinian games, they are baptized, and they presume that the effect of their doing that is their regeneration and the remission of the penalties due to their perjuries. Among the ancients, again, whoever had defiled himself with murder was wont to go in quest of purifying waters. Therefore, if the mere nature of water, in that it is appropriate material for washing away, leads men to flatter themselves with a belief in omens of purification, how much more truly will waters render that service through the authority of God by whom all their nature has been constituted? If men think that water is endued with a medicinal virtue by religion, what religion is more effectual than that of the living God? Which fact, being acknowledged, we recognize here also the zeal of the devil rivaling the things of God, while we find him, too, practicing baptism in his subjects. What similarity is there? The unclean cleanses, the ruiner sets free, the damned absolves. He will, forsooth, destroy his own work by washing away the sins which himself inspires. These remarks have been set down by way of testimony against such as reject the faith. If they put no trust in the things of God, the spurious imitations of which, in the case of God's rival, they do trust in. Are there not other cases, too, in which, without any sacrament, unclean spirits brood on waters, in spurious imitation of that brooding of the divine spirit in the very beginning? Witness all shady founts, and all unfrequented brooks, and the ponds in the baths, and the conduits in private houses, or the cisterns and wells which are said to have the property of spiriting away through the power, that is, of a hurtful spirit. Men whom waters have drowned, or affected with madness, or with fear, they call nymphcot, or lymphatic, or hydrophobic. Why have we adduced these instances? Lest any think it too hard for belief that a holy angel of God should grant his presence to waters, to temper them to man's salvation, while the evil angel holds frequent profane commerce with the selfsame element to man's ruin. If it seems a novelty for an angel to be present in waters, an example of what was to come to pass has forerun. An angel, by his intervention, was wont to stir the pool at Bethsaida. They who were complaining of ill health used to watch for him, for whoever had been the first to descend into them after his washing ceased to complain. This figure of corporal healing sang of a spiritual healing, according to the rule by which things carnal are always antecedent as figurative of things spiritual, and thus, when the grace of God advanced to higher degrees among men, an accession of efficacy was granted to the waters and to the angel. They who were wont to remedy bodily defects, now heal the spirit. They who used to work temporal salvation, now renew eternal. They who did set free, but once in the year, now save peoples in a body daily. 
death being done away through abolition of sins, the guilt being removed, of course the penalty is removed too, thus man will be restored for God to his likeness, who in days bygone had been conformed to the image of God, the image is counted to be in his form, the likeness in his eternity. For he receives again that spirit of God which he had then first received from his afflatus, but had afterwards lost through sin. Not that in the waters we obtain the Holy Spirit, but in the water, under the witness of the angel, we are cleansed and prepared for the Holy Spirit. In this case also a type has proceeded, for thus was John beforehand the Lord's forerunner, preparing his ways. Thus, too, does the angel, the witness of baptism, make the path straight for the Holy Spirit, who is about to come upon us by the washing away of sins, which faith sealed in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit obtains. For if, in the mouth of three witnesses, every word shall stand, while through the benediction we have the same three as witnesses of our faith, whom we have as sureties of our salvation too, how much more does the number of the divine name suffice for the assurance of our hope likewise? Moreover, after the pledging both of the attestation of faith and the promise of salvation under three witnesses, there is added of necessity mention of the church, inasmuch as, wherever there are three, that is, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, there is the church, which is a body of three. After this, when we have issued from the font, we are thoroughly appointed with a blessed unction, a practice derived from the old discipline, wherein on entering the priesthood, men were wont to be anointed with oil from a horn ever since Aaron was anointed by Moses. Whence Aaron is called Christ from the chrism, which is the unction, when made spiritual, furnished an appropriate name to the Lord, because he was anointed with the Spirit of God the Father, as written in the Acts, for truly they were gathered together in this city against the Holy Son whom thou hast anointed. Thus too, in our case, the unction runs carnally, i.e. on the body, but profits spiritually, in the same way as the act of baptism itself, too, is carnal, in that we are plunged in water, but the effect spiritual, in that we are freed from sins. In the next place, the hand is laid on us, invoking and inviting the Holy Spirit through benediction. Shall it be granted possible for human ingenuity to summon a spirit into water, and, by the application of hands from above, to animate their union into one body, with another spirit of so clear sound? And shall it not be possible for God, in the case of his own organ, to produce by means of holy hands a sublime spiritual modulation? But this, as well as the former, is derived from the old sacramental rite in which Jacob blessed his grandsons, born of Joseph, Ephraim, and Manasses, with his hands laid on them, and interchanged, and indeed so transversely slanted one over the other, that by delineating Christ, they even portended the future benediction into Christ. Then, over our cleansed and blessed bodies, willingly descends from the Father that holiest spirit, over the waters of baptism, recognizing, as it were, his primeval seat, he reposes, he who, glided down on the Lord, in the shape of a dove, in order that the nature of the Holy Spirit might be declared by means of the creature, the emblem of simplicity and innocence, because even in her bodily structure the dove is without literal gall, and accordingly, he says, be ye simple as doves, even this is not without supporting evidence of a preceding figure, for just as, after the waters of the deluge, by which the old iniquity was purged, after the baptism, so to say, of the world, a dove was the herald which announced to the earth the assuagement of celestial wrath, when she had been sent her way out of the ark, and had returned with the olive branch, a sign which even among the nations is the foretoken of peace, so by the selfsame law of heavenly effect, to earth, that is, to our flesh, as it emerges from the font, after its old sins, flies the dove of the Holy Spirit, bringing us the peace of God, sent out from the heavens, where is the church, the typified ark. But the world returned unto sin, in which point baptism would ill be compared to the deluge, and so it is destined to fire, just as the man too is, who after baptism renews his sins, so that this also ought to be accepted as a sign for our admonition. How many, therefore, are the pleas of nature, how many the privileges of grace, how many the solemnities of discipline, the figures, the preparations, the prayers, which have ordained the sanctity of water, 
First, indeed, when the people set unconditionally free escaped the violence of the Egyptian king by crossing over through water, it was water that extinguished the king himself with his entire forces. What figure more manifestly fulfilled in the sacrament of baptism, the nations are set free from the world by means of water, to wit, and the devil, their old tyrant, they leave quite behind, overwhelmed in the water. Again, water is restored from its defect of bitterness to its native grace of sweetness by the tree of Moses. That tree was Christ, restoring, to wit, of himself, the veins of some time envenomed and bitter nature into the all salutary waters of baptism. This is the water which flowed continuously down for the people from the accompanying rock, for if Christ is the rock, without doubt we see baptism blessed by the water in Christ. How mighty is the grace of water in the sight of God and his Christ for the confirmation of baptism. Never is Christ without water if, that is, he is himself baptized in water, inaugurates in water the first rudimentary displays of his power. When invited to the nuptials, invites the thirsty when he makes a discourse to his own sempiternal water approves when teaching concerning love among works of charity the cup of water offered to a poor child recruits his strength at a well walks over the water willingly crosses the sea ministers water to his disciples onward even to the passion does the witness of baptism last while he is being surrendered to the cross water intervenes witness pilate's hands when he is wounded, forth from his side bursts water, witness the soldier's lance. We have spoken, so far as our moderate ability permitted, of the generals which form the groundwork of the sanctity of baptism. I will now equally, to the best of my power, proceed to the rest of its character, touching certain minor questions. The baptism announced by John formed the subject, even at that time, of a question proposed by the Lord himself, indeed to the Pharisees, whether that baptism were heavenly or truly earthly, about which they were unable to give a consistent answer inasmuch as they understood not because they believed not. But we, with but as poor a measure of understanding as of faith, are able to determine that that baptism was divine indeed, yet in respect of the command, not in respect of efficacy too, and that we read that John was sent by the Lord to perform this duty. But human in its nature, for it conveyed nothing celestial, but it foreministered to the thing celestial, being, to wit, appointed over repentance, which is in man's power. In fact, the doctors of the law and the Pharisees, who were unwilling to believe, did not repent either. But if repentance is a thing human, its baptism must necessarily be of the same nature. Else, if it had been celestial, it would have given both the Holy Spirit and remission of sins. But none either pardons sins or freely grants the Spirit, save God only. Even the Lord himself said that the Spirit would not descend on any other condition, but that he should first ascend to the Father. What the Lord was not yet conferring, of course, the servant could not furnish. Accordingly, in the Acts of the Apostles, we find that men who had John's baptism had not received the Holy Spirit, whom they knew not even by hearing. That, then, was no celestial thing which furnished no celestial endowments, whereas the very thing which was celestial in John, the spirit of prophecy, so completely failed after the transfer of the whole spirit to the Lord, that he presently sent to inquire whether he whom he had himself preached, whom he had pointed out when coming to him, were he, and so the baptism of repentance was dealt with as if it were a candidate for the remission and sanctification shortly about to follow in Christ. For in that John used to preach baptism for the remission of sins, the declaration was made with reference to a future remission. If it be true, as it is, that repentance is antecedent, remission subsequent, and this is preparing the way, but he who prepares does not himself perfect, but procures for another to perfect. John himself professes that the celestial things are not his, but Christ's, by saying, He who is from the earth speaketh concerning the earth, he who comes from the realms above is above all, and again, by saying that he baptized in repentance only, but that one would shortly come who would baptize in the spirit and fire, of course, because true and stable faith is baptized with water unto salvation, pretended and weak faith is baptized with fire unto judgment. But behold, say some, the Lord came and baptized not, for we read, and yet he used not to baptize, but his disciples, as if, in truth, 
John had preached that he would baptize with his own hands. Of course, his words are not so to be understood, but as simply spoken after an ordinary manner, just as, for instance, we say, the emperor set forth an edict, or the prefect cajoled him. Pray does the emperor in person set forth, or the prefect in person cajole. One whose ministers do a thing is always said to do it. So, he will baptize you, will have to be understood as standing for, through him, or into him, you will be baptized. But let not the fact that he himself baptized not trouble any, for into whom should he baptize? Into repentance? Of what use, then, do you make his forerunner, into remission of sins which he used to give by a word? Into himself, whom by humility he was concealing? Into the Holy Spirit, who had not yet descended from the Father? Into the church, which his apostles had not yet founded? And thus it was with the selfsame baptism of John that his disciples used to baptize as ministers with which John before had baptized as a forerunner. Let none think it was with some other, because no other exists, except that of Christ subsequently, which at that time, of course, could not be given by his disciples, inasmuch as the glory of the Lord had not yet been fully attained, nor the efficacy of the font, established through the passion and the resurrection, because neither can our death see dissolution except by the Lord's passion, nor our life be restored without his resurrection. When, however, the prescript is laid down that, without baptism, salvation is attainable by none, chiefly on the ground of that declaration of the Lord who says, Unless one be born of water, he hath not life, there arise immediately scrupulous, nay rather, audacious doubts on the parts of some, how in accordance with that prescript salvation is attainable by the apostles, whom, Paul accepted, we do not find baptized in the Lord. Nay, since Paul is the only one of them who has put on the garment of Christ's baptism, either the peril of all the others who lack the water of Christ is prejudged that the prescript may be maintained, or else the prescript is rescinded if salvation has been ordained even for the unbaptized. I have heard, the Lord is my witness, doubts of that kind, that none may imagine me so abandoned as to exconjugate, unprovoked, in the license of my pen, ideas which would inspire others with scruple. And now, as far as I shall be able, I will reply to them who affirm that the apostles were unbaptized, for if they had undergone the human baptism of John, and were longing for that of the Lord, then, since the Lord himself had defined baptism to be one, saying to Peter, who was desirous of being thoroughly bathed, he who hath once bathed hath no necessity to wash a second time, which, of course, he would not have said at all to one not baptized, even here we have a conspicuous proof against those who, in order to destroy the sacrament of water, deprive the apostles even of John's baptism. Can it seem credible that the way of the Lord, that is, the baptism of John, had not then been prepared in those persons who were being destined to open the way of the Lord throughout the whole world? The Lord himself, though no repentance was due from him, was baptized. Was baptism not necessary for sinners? As for the fact, then, that others were not baptized, they, however, were not companions of Christ, but enemies of the faith, doctors of the law, and Pharisees. From which fact is gathered an additional suggestion that, since the opposers of the Lord refused to be baptized, they who followed the Lord were baptized, and were not like-minded with their own rivals, especially when, if there were any one to whom they clave, the Lord had exalted John above him by the testimony, saying, Among them who are born of women, there is none greater than John the Baptist. Others make the suggestion, forced enough clearly, that the apostles then served the turn of baptism when, in their little ship, they were sprinkled and covered with the waves that Peter himself was also immersed enough when he walked on the sea. It is, however, as I think, one thing to be sprinkled or intercepted by the violence of the sea, another thing to be baptized in obedience to the discipline of religion. But that little ship did present a figure of the church in that she is disquieted in the sea, that is, in the world, by the waves, that is, by persecutions and temptations. The Lord, through patience, sleeping as it were, until roused in their last extremities by the prayers of the saints, he checks the world and restores tranquility to his own. Now, whether they were baptized in any manner whatever, or whether they continued unbathed to the end, so that even one saying of the Lord, touching the one bath, 
does, under the person of Peter, merely regard us, still, to determine concerning the salvation of the apostles is audacious enough, because on them the prerogative even of the first choice, and thereafter of undivided intimacy, might be able to confer the compendious grace of baptism, seeing they, I think, followed him who was wont to promise salvation to every believer. Thy faith, he would say, hath saved thee, and thy sin shall be remitted thee. On thy believing, of course, albeit thou be not yet baptized. If that was wanting to the apostles, I know not in the faith of what things it was that, roused by one word of the Lord, one left the toll booth behind for ever, another deserted father and ship, and the craft by which he gained his living, a third, who disdained his father's obsequies, fulfilled before he heard it that highest precept of the Lord, he who prefers father or mother to me is not worthy of me. Here then, those miscreants provoke questions, and so they say, baptism is not necessary for them to whom faith is sufficient, for withal Abraham pleased God by a sacrament of no water but a faith. But in all cases it is the latter things which have a conclusive force and the subsequent which prevail over the antecedent. Grant that, in days gone by, there was salvation by means of bare faith before the passion and resurrection of the Lord, but now that faith has been enlarged and has become a faith which believes in his nativity, passion, and resurrection, there has been an amplification added to the sacrament, viz. the sealing act of baptism, the clothing, in some sense, of the faith which before was bare, and which cannot exist now without its proper law. For the law of baptizing has been imposed, and the formula prescribed, Go, he saith, teach the nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The comparison with this law of that definition, unless a man have been reborn of water and spirit, he shall not enter into the kingdom of the heavens, has tied faith to the necessity of baptism. Accordingly, all thereafter, who became believers, used to be baptized. Then it was, too, that Paul, when he believed, was baptized, and this is the meaning of the precept which the Lord had given him when smitten with the plague of loss of sight, saying, Arise, and enter Damascus, there shall be demonstrated to thee what thou oughtest to do, to wit, be baptized, which was the only thing lacking to him. That point accepted, he had sufficiently learnt and believed the Nazarene to be the Lord, the Son of God. But they rolled back an objection from that apostle himself, in that he said, For Christ sent me to baptize, as if by this argument baptism were done away. For if so, why did he baptize Gaius and Crispus and the house of Stephanus? However, even if Christ had not sent him to baptize, yet he had given other apostles the precepts to baptize. But these words were written to the Corinthians in regard of the circumstances of that particular time, seeing that schisms and dissensions were agitated among them, while one attributes everything to Paul, another to Apollos, for which reason the peacemaking apostle for fear he should seem to claim all gifts for himself says that he had been sent not to baptize but to preach, for preaching is the prior thing, baptizing the posterior. Therefore the preaching came first, but I think baptizing withal was lawful to him to whom preaching was. I know not whether any further point is mooted to bring baptism into controversy. Permit me to call to mind what I have omitted above, lest I seem to break off the train of impending thoughts in the middle. There is to us one, and but one baptism, as well according to the Lord's gospel, as according to the apostles' letters, inasmuch as he says, one God, and one baptism, and one church in the heavens. But it must be admitted that the question, what rules are to be observed with regards to heretics, is worthy of being treated. For it is to us that that assertion refers. Heretics, however, have no fellowship in our discipline, whom the mere fact of their excommunication testifies to be outsiders. I am not bound to recognize in them a thing which is enjoined on me, because they and we have not the same God, nor one that is the same Christ. And, therefore, their baptism is not one with ours either, because it is not the same, a baptism which, since they have it not duly, doubtless they have not at all nor is that capable of being counted which is not had. Thus, they cannot receive it either, because they have it not. But this point has already received a fuller discussion from us in Greek. We enter then the font once, once our sins washed away, because they ought never to be repeated. 
but the Jewish Israel bathes daily because he is daily being defiled, and for fear that defilement should be practiced among us, also, therefore, was the definition touching the one bathing made. Happy water, which once washes away, which does not mock sinners with vain hopes, which does not, by being infected with the repetition of impurities, again defile them whom it has washed. We have, indeed, likewise, a second font, itself withal one with the former, of blood, to wit, concerning which the Lord said, I have to be baptized with the baptism when he had been baptized already, for he had come by means of water and blood, just as John has written, that he might be baptized by the water, glorified by the blood, to make us, in like manner, called by water, chosen by blood. These two baptisms he sent out from the wound in his pierced side, in order that they who believe in his blood might be bathed with the water. They who had been bathed in the water might likewise drink the blood. This is the baptism which both stands in lieu of the fontal bathing, when that has not been received, and restores it when lost. For concluding our brief subject, it remains to put you in mind also of the due observance of giving and receiving baptism. Of giving it, the chief priest, who is the bishop, has the right, in the next place, the presbyters and deacons, yet not without the bishop's authority, on account of the honor of the church, which being preserved, peace is preserved. Beside these, even laymen have the right, for what is equally received can be equally given. Unless bishops or priests or deacons be on the spot, other disciples are called, i.e., to the work. The word of the Lord ought not to be hidden by any. In like manner, too, baptism, which is equally God's property, can be administered by all. But how much more is the rule of reverence and modesty incubant on laymen, seeing that these powers belong to their superiors, lest they assume to themselves the specific function of the bishop? Emulation of the episcopal office is the mother of schisms. The most holy apostle has said that all things are lawful, but not all expedient. Let it suffice it surely in the case of necessity to avail yourselves of that rule, if at any time circumstance either of place or of time or of person compels you so to do. For then the steadfast courage of the succourer, when the situation of the endangered one is urgent, is exceptionally admissible, inasmuch as he will be guilty of a human creature's loss if he shall refrain from bestowing what he had free liberty to bestow. But the woman of pertness, who has usurped the power to teach, will of course not give birth for herself, likewise to a rite of baptizing, unless some new beast shall arise, like the former, so that, just as the one abolished baptism, so some other should in her own right confer it. But if the writings, which wrongly go under Paul's name, claim Thecla's example as a license for women's teaching and baptizing, let them know that, in Asia, the presbyter who composed that writing, as if he were augmenting Paul's fame from his own store, after being convicted and confessing that he had done it from love of Paul, was removed from his office. For how credible would it seem that he who has not permitted a woman even to learn with overboldness should give a female the power of teaching and of baptizing? Let them be silent, he says, and at home consult their own husbands. But they whose office it is know that baptism is not rashly to be administered. Give to everyone who beggeth thee, has a reference of its own, appertaining especially to almsgiving. On the contrary, this precept is rather to be looked at carefully. Give not the holy things to dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine, and lay not hands easily on any, share not other men's sins. If Philip so easily baptized the chamberlain, let us reflect that a manifest and conspicuous evidence that the Lord deemed him worthy had been interposed. The Spirit had enjoined Philip to proceed to that road. The eunuch himself, too, was not found idle, nor as one who was suddenly seized with an eager desire to be baptized, but after going up to the temple for prayer's sake, being intently engaged on the divine scripture, was thus suitably discovered, to whom God had, unasked, sent an apostle, which one, again, the spirit bade, adjoin himself to the chamberlain's chariot. The scripture which he was reading falls in opportunity with his faith. Philip, being requested, is taken to sit beside him. The Lord is pointed out. Faith lingers not. Water needs no waiting for. The work is completed and the apostle snatched away. But Paul too was, in fact, speedily baptized, for Simon, his host, speedily recognized him to be an appointed vessel of election. God's approbation sends sure premonitory tokens before it. Every petition may both deceive and be deceived. 
and so according to the circumstances and disposition and even age of each individual the delay of baptism is preferable principally however in the case of little children for why is it necessary if baptism itself is not so necessary that the sponsors likewise should be thrust into danger who both themselves by reason of mortality may fail to fulfil their promises and may be disappointed by the development of an evil disposition in those for whom they stood the lord does indeed say forbid them not to come unto me let them come then while they are growing up let them come while they are learning while they are learning whither to come let them become christians when they have become able to know christ why does the innocent period of life hasten to the remission of sins more caution will be exercised in worldly matters so that one who is not trusted with earthly substance is trusted with divine let them know how to ask for salvation that you may seem at least to have given to him that asketh for no less cause must the unwedded also be deferred in whom the ground of temptation is prepared alike in such as never were wedded by means of their maturity and in the widowed by means of their freedom until they marry or else be more fully strengthened for continence if any understand the weighty import of baptism they will fear its reception more than its delay sound faith is secure of salvation the passover affords a more than usually solemn day for baptism when with all the lord's passion in which we are baptized was completed nor will it be incongruous to interpret figuratively the fact that when the lord was about to celebrate the last passover he said to his disciples who were sent to make preparation ye will meet a man bearing water he points out the place for celebrating the passover by the sign of water after that pentecost is a most joyous space for conferring baptisms wherein too the resurrection of the lord was repeatedly proved among the disciples and the hope of the advent of the lord indirectly pointed to in that at that time when he had been received back into the heavens the angels told the apostles that he would so come as he had withal ascended into the heavens at pentecost of course but moreover when jeremiah says and i will gather them together from the extremities of the land in the feast day he signifies the day of the passover and of pentecost which is properly a feast day however every day is the lord's every hour every time is apt for baptism if there is a difference in the solemnity distinction there is none in the grace they who are about to enter baptism ought to pray with repeated prayers fasts and bendings of the knee and vigils all the night through and with the confession of all bygone sins that they may express the meaning even of the baptism of john they were baptized saith the scripture confessing their sins to us it is a matter for thankfulness if we do now publicly confess our iniquities or our turpitudes for we do at the same time both make satisfaction for our former sins by mortification of our flesh and spirit and lay beforehand the foundation of defences against the temptations which will closely follow watch and pray saith the lord lest ye fall into temptation and the reason i believe why they were tempted was that they fell asleep so that they deserted the lord when apprehended and he who continued to stand by him and use the sword even denied him thrice for with all the word had gone before that no one untempted should attain the celestial kingdoms the lord himself forthwith after baptism temptation surrounded when in forty days he kept the fast then someone will say it becomes us too rather to fast after baptism well and who forbids you unless it be the necessity for joy and the thanksgiving for salvation but so far as i with my poor powers understand the lord figuratively retorted upon israel the reproach they had cast on the lord for the people after crossing the sea and being carried about in the desert during forty years although they were there nourished with divine supplies nevertheless were more mindful of their belly and their gullet than of god thereupon the lord driven apart into desert places after baptism showed by maintaining a fast of forty days that the man of god lives not by bread alone but by every word of god and that temptations incident to fullness or immoderation of appetite are shattered by abstinence therefore blessed ones whom the grace of god awaits when you ascend from the most sacred font of your new birth and spread your hands for the first time in the house of your mother together with your brethren ask from the father ask from the lord that his own specialties of grace and distributions of gifts may be supplied you ask saith he and ye shall receive 
Well, you have asked and have received. You have knocked and it has been opened to you. Only I pray that, when you are asking, you be mindful likewise of Tertullian the sinner. End of On Baptism by Tertullian To His Wife by Tertullian This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Book 1. I have thought it meet, my best beloved fellow servant in the Lord, even from this early period, to provide for the course which you must pursue after my departure from the world, if I shall be called before you, and to entrust to your honour the observance of the provision. For in things worldly we are active enough, and we wish the good of each of us to be consulted. If we draw up wills for such matters, why ought we not much more to take forethought for our posterity in things divine and heavenly, and in a sense to bequeath a legacy to be received before the inheritance be divided? The legacy I mean of admonition and demonstration touching those bequests which are allotted out of our immortal goods and from the heritage of the heavens. Only that you may be able to receive in its entirety this fiofment in trust of my admonition, God grant, to whom be honour, glory, renown, dignity, and power, now and to the ages of the ages. The precept, therefore, which I give you is that, with all the constancy you may, you do, after our departure, renounce nuptials. Not that you will on that score confer any benefit on me, except in that you will profit yourself. But to Christians, after their departure from the world, no restoration of marriage is promised in the day of resurrection, translated as they will be into the condition and sanctity of angels. Therefore no solicitude arising from carnal jealousy will, in the day of resurrection, even in the case of her whom they chose to represent as having been married to seven brothers successively, wound any one of her so many husbands, nor is any husband awaiting her to put her to confusion. The question raised by the Sadducees has yielded to the Lord's sentence. Think not that it is for the sake of preserving to the end for myself the entire devotion of your flesh, that I, suspicious of the pain of anticipated slight, am even at this early period instilling into you the counsel of perpetual widowhood. There will at that day be no resumption of voluptuous disgrace between us. No such frivolities, no such impurities does God promise to his servants. But whether to you or to any other woman whatever who pertains to God, the advice which we are giving shall be profitable, we take leave to treat of at large. We do not indeed forbid the union of man and woman, blessed by God as the seminary of the human race, devised for the replenishment of the earth and the furnishing of the world, and thereafter permitted yet singly. For Adam was the one husband of Eve, and Eve his one wife, one woman, one rib. We grant that among our ancestors and the patriarchs themselves it was lawful not only to marry but even to multiply wives. There were concubines too in those days. But although the church did come in figuratively in the synagogue, yet to interpret simply it was necessary to institute certain things which should afterward deserve to be either lopped off or modified. For the law was in due time to supervene. Nor was that enough, for it was meet that causes for making up the deficiencies of the law should have forerun him who was to supply those deficiencies. And so to the law presently had to succeed the word of God introducing the spiritual circumcision. Therefore, by means of the wide license of those days, materials for subsequent emendations were furnished beforehand, of which materials the Lord by his gospel, and then the apostle in the last days of the Jewish age, either cut off the redundancies or regulated the disorders. But let it not be thought that my reason for premising thus much, concerning the liberty granted to the old, and the restraint imposed on the later time, is that I may lay a foundation for teaching that Christ's advent was intended to dissolve wedlock, and to abolish marriage unions, as if from this period onward I were prescribing an end to marrying. 
let them see to that who among the rest of their perversities teach the disjoining of the one flesh in twain denying him who after borrowing the female from the male recombined between themselves in the matrimonial computation the two bodies taken out of the consortship of the self-same material substance in short there is no place at all where we read that nuptials are prohibited of course on the ground that they are a good thing what however is better than this good we learn from the apostle who permits marrying indeed but prefers abstinence the former on account of the insidiousness of temptations the latter on account of the straits of the times now by looking into the reason thus given for each proposition it is easily discerned that the ground on which the power of marrying is conceded is necessity but whatever necessity grants she by her very nature depreciates in fact in that it is written to marry is better than to burn what pray is the nature of this good which is only commended by comparison with evil so that the reason why marrying is more good is merely that burning is less nay but how far better is it neither to marry nor to burn why even in persecutions it is better to take advantage of the permission granted and flee from town to town than when apprehended and racked to deny the faith and therefore more blessed are they who have strength to depart this life in blessed confession of their testimony i may say what is permitted is not good for how stands the case i must of necessity die if i be apprehended and confess my faith if i think that fate deplorable then flight is good but if i have a fear of the thing which is permitted the permitted thing has some suspicion attaching to the cause of its permission but that which is better no one ever permitted as being undoubted and manifest by its own inherent purity there are some things which are not to be desired merely because they are not forbidden albeit they are in a certain sense forbidden when other things are preferred to them for the preference given to the higher things is a dissuasion from the lowest a thing is not good merely because it is not evil nor is it evil merely because it is not harmful further that which is fully good excels on this ground that it is not only not harmful but profitable into the bargain for you are bound to prefer what is profitable to what is merely not harmful for the first place is what every struggle aims at the second has consolation attaching to it but not victory but if we listen to the apostle forgetting what is behind let us both strain after what is before and be followers after the better rewards thus albeit he does not cast a snare upon us he points out what tends to utility when he says the unmarried woman thinks on the things of the lord that both in body and spirit she may be holy but the married is solicitous how to please her husband but he nowhere permits marriage in such a way as not rather to wish us to do our utmost in imitation of his own example happy the man who shall prove like paul but we read that the flesh is weak and hence we soothe ourselves in some cases yet we read too that the spirit is strong for each clause occurs in one and the same sentence flesh is an earthly spirit a heavenly material why then do we too prone to self-excuse put forward in our defence the weak part of us but not look at the strong why should not the earthly yield to the heavenly if the spirit is stronger than the flesh because it is withal of nobler origin it is our own fault if we follow the weaker now there are two phases of human weakness which make marriages necessary to such as are disjoined from matrimony the first and most powerful is that which arises from fleshly concupiscence the second from worldly concupiscence but by us who are servants of god who renounce both voluptuousness and ambition each is to be repudiated fleshly concupiscence claims the functions of adult age craves after beauty's harvest rejoices in its own shame pleads the necessity of a husband to the female sex as a source of authority and of comfort or to render it safe from evil rumours to meet these its counsels do you apply the examples of sisters of ours whose names are with the lord who when their husbands have preceded them to glory give to no opportunity of beauty or of age the precedence over holiness 
They prefer to be wedded to God. To God their beauty, to God their youth is dedicated. With him they live, with him they converse, him they handle by day and by night. To the Lord they assign their prayers as dowries. From him, as oft as they desire it, they receive his approbation as dotal gifts. Thus they have laid hold for themselves of an eternal gift of the Lord, and while on earth, by abstaining from marriage, are already counted as belonging to the angelic family. Training yourself to an emulation of their constancy by the examples of such women, you will, by spiritual affection, bury that fleshly concupiscence in abolishing the temporal and fleeting desires of beauty and youth by the compensating gain of immortal blessings. On the other hand, this worldly concupiscence to which I referred has as its causes glory, cupidity, ambition, want of sufficiency, through which causes it trumps up the necessity for marrying, promising itself, forsooth, heavenly things in return, to lord it, namely, in another's family, to roost on another's wealth, to extort splendour from another's store, to lavish expenditure which you do not feel. Far be all this from believers, who have no care about maintenance, unless it be that we distrust the promises of God, and his care and providence, who clothes with such grace the lilies of the field, who without any labour on their part feeds the fowls of the heaven, who prohibits care to be taken about tomorrow's food and clothing, promising that he knows what is needful for each of his servants, not indeed ponderous necklaces, nor burdensome garments, nor Gallic mules, nor German bearers, which all add lustre to the glory of nuptials, but sufficiency, which is suitable to moderation and modesty." Presume, I pray you, that you have need of nothing if you attend upon the Lord. Nay, that you have all things if you have the Lord, whose are all things. Think often on things heavenly, and you will despise things earthly. To widowhood signed and sealed before the Lord, naught is necessary but perseverance. Further reasons for marriage which men allege for themselves arise from anxiety for posterity and the bitter, bitter pleasure of children. To us this is idle, for why should we be eager to bear children whom, when we have them, we desire to send before us to glory, in respect I mean of the distresses that are now imminent, desirous as we are ourselves, too, to be taken out of this most wicked world and received into the Lord's presence, which was the desire even of an apostle. To the servant of God, forsooth, offspring is necessary." For of our own salvation we are secure enough, so that we have leisure for children. Burdens must be sought by us for ourselves, which are voided even by the majority of the Gentiles, who are compelled by laws, who are decimated by abortions. Burdens which, finally, are to us most of all unsuitable, as being perilous to faith. For why did the Lord foretell a woe to them that are with child, and then that give suck, except because he testifies that in the days of disencumbrance the encumbrances of children will be an inconvenience? It is to marriage, of course, that those encumbrances appertain, but that woe will not pertain to widows. They, at the first trump of the angel, will spring forth disencumbered, will freely bear to the end whatsoever pressure and persecution, with no burdensome fruit of marriage heaving in the womb, none in the bosom. Therefore, whether it be for the sake of the flesh or of the world, or of posterity that marriage is undertaken, none of all these necessities affects the servants of God so as to prevent my deeming it enough to have once for all yielded to some one of them, and by one marriage appeased all concupiscence of this kind. Let us marry daily, and in the midst of our marrying, let us be overtaken, like Sodom and Gomorrah, by that day of fear. For there it was not only, of course, that they were dealing in marriage and merchandise, but when he says they were marrying and buying, he sets a brand upon the very leading vices of the flesh and of the world, which call men off the most from divine disciplines, the one through the pleasure of rioting, the other through the greed of acquiring. And yet that blindness then was felt long before the ends of the world. What then will the case be if God now keep us from the vices which of old were detestable before him? The time, says the apostle, is compressed. It remaineth that they who have wives act as if they had them not. 
But if they who have wives are thus bound to consign to oblivion what they have, how much more are they who have not prohibited from seeking a second time what they no longer have? so that she whose husband has departed from the world should thenceforward impose rest on her sex by abstinence from marriage, abstinence which numbers of Gentile women devote to the memory of beloved husbands. When anything seems difficult, let us survey others who cope with still greater difficulties. How many are there who from the moment of their baptism set the seal of virginity upon their flesh, how many, again, who, by equal mutual consent, cancel the debt of matrimony, voluntary eunuchs for the sake of their desire after the celestial kingdom? But if, while the marriage tie is still intact, abstinence is endured, how much more when it has been undone? For I believe it to be harder for what is intact to be quite forsaken than for what has been lost not to be yearned after." A hard and arduous thing enough, surely, is the continence for God's sake of a holy woman after her husband's decease, when Gentiles, in honour of their own Satan, endure sacerdotal offices which involve both virginity and widowhood. At Rome, for instance, they who have to do with the type of that inextinguishable fire, keeping watch over the omens of their own future penalty, in company with the old dragon himself, are appointed on the ground of virginity. To the Archaean Juno in the town of Agium, a virgin is allotted, and the priestesses who rave at Delphi know not marriage. Moreover, we know that widows minister to the African Ceres, enticed away indeed from matrimony by a most stern oblivion, for not only do they withdraw from their still living husbands, but they even introduce other wives to them in their own room, the husbands of course smiling on it, all contact with males, even as far as the kiss of their sons being forbidden them, and yet with enduring practice they persevere in such a discipline of widowhood, which excludes the solaces even of holy affection. These precepts has the devil given to his servants, and he is heard. He challenges, forsooth, God's servants by the continents of his own, as if on equal terms. Continent are even the priests of hell, for he has found a way to ruin men even in good pursuits, and with him it makes no difference to slay some by voluptuousness, some by continence. To us, continence has been pointed out by the Lord of salvation as an instrument for attaining eternity. As a testimony of our faith, as a commendation of this flesh of ours, which is to be sustained for the garment of immortality, which is one day to supervene, for enduring, in fine, the will of God. Besides, reflect, I advise you, that there is no one who is taken out of the world but by the will of God, if, as is the case, not even a leaf falls off of a tree without the will of God. The same who brings us into the world must of necessity take us out of it too. Therefore, when, through the will of God, the husband is deceased, the marriage likewise, by the will of God, deceases. Why should you restore what God has put an end to? Why do you, by repeating the servitude of matrimony, spurn the liberty which is offered you? You have been bound to a wife, says the apostle, seek not loosing. You have been loosed from a wife, seek not binding. For even if you do not sin in remarrying, still, he says, pressure of the flesh ensues. Wherefore, so far as we can, let us love the opportunity of continence. As soon as it offers itself, let us resolve to accept it, that what we have not had strength to follow in matrimony we may follow in widowhood. The occasion must be embraced which puts an end to that which necessity commanded. How detrimental to faith, how obstructive to holiness, second marriages are, the discipline of the church and the prescription of the apostle declare, when he suffers not men twice married to preside over a church, when he would not grant a widow admittance into the order unless she had been the wife of one man, for it behoves God's altar to be set forth pure. That whole halo which encircles the church is represented as consisting of holiness, Priesthood is a function of widowhood and of celibacies among the nations. Of course, this is in conformity with the devil's principle of rivalry. For the king of heathendom, the chief pontiff, to marry a second time is unlawful. How pleasing must holiness be to God when even his enemy affects it. 
not of course as having any affinity with anything good, but as contumeliously affecting what is pleasing to God the Lord. For concerning the honours which widowhood enjoys in the sight of God, there is a brief summary in one saying of his through the prophet, Do thou justly to the widow and to the orphan, and come ye, let us reason, saith the Lord. These two names, left to the care of the divine mercy, in proportion as they are destitute of human aid, the father of all undertakes to defend. Look how the widow's benefactor is put on a level with the widow herself, whose champion shall reason with the Lord. Not to virgins, I take it, is so great a gift given. Although in their case, perfect integrity and entire sanctity shall have the nearest vision of the face of God, yet the widow has a task more toilsome, because it is easy not to crave after that which you know not, and to turn away from what you have never had to regret. More glorious is the continence which is aware of its own right, which knows what it has seen. The virgin may possibly be held the happier, but the widow the more hardly tasked. The former, in that she has always kept the good, the latter, in that she has found the good for herself. In the former it is grace, in the latter virtue that is crowned. For some things there are which are of the divine liberality, some of our own working. The indulgences granted by the Lord are regulated by their own grace. The things which are objects of man's striving are attained by earnest pursuit. Pursue earnestly, therefore, the virtue of continence, which is modesty's agent, industry, which allows not women to be wanderers, frugality, which scorns the world. Follow companies and conversations worthy of God, mindful of that short verse, sanctified by the Apostle's quotation of it, ill interviews, good morals do corrupt. Talkative, idle, wine-bibbing, curious tent-fellows do the very greatest hurt to the purpose of widowhood. Through talkativeness they creep in words unfriendly to modesty. Through idleness they seduce one from strictness. Through wine-bibbing they insinuate any and every evil. Through curiosity they convey a spirit of rivalry in lust. Not one of such women knows how to speak of the good of single husbandhood, for their God, as the Apostle says, is their belly, and so too what is neighbour to the belly. These considerations, dearest fellow servant, I commend to you thus early, handled throughout superfluously indeed after the Apostle, but likely to prove a solace to you, in that, if so it shall turn out, you will cherish my memory in them. Book 2 Very lately, best beloved fellow servant in the Lord, I, as my ability permitted, entered for your benefit at some length into the question, what course is to be followed by a holy woman when her marriage has, in whatever way, been brought to an end? Let us now turn our attention to the next best advice in regard of human infirmity. Admonished hereto by the examples of certain who, when an opportunity for the practice of continence has been offered them, by divorce, or by the decease of the husband, have not only thrown away the opportunity of attaining so great a good, but not even in their remarriage have chosen to be mindful of the rule that, above all, they marry in the Lord. And thus my mind has been thrown into confusion in the fear that, having exhorted you myself to perseverance in single husbandhood and widowhood, I may now, by the mention of precipitate marriages, put an occasion of falling in your way. But if you are perfect in wisdom, you know, of course, that the course which is the more useful is the course which you must keep. But inasmuch as that course is difficult, and not without its embarrassments, and on this account is the highest aim of widowed life, I have paused somewhat in my urging you to it, nor would there have been any causes for my recurring to that point also in addressing you, had I not by this time taken up a still graver solicitude." for the nobler is the continence of the flesh which ministers to widowhood, the more pardonable a thing it seems if it be not preserved in. For it is then when things are difficult that their pardon is easy. But in as far as marrying in the Lord is permissible, as being within our power, so far more culpable is it not to observe that which you can observe. Add to this the fact that the apostle, with regard to widows and the unmarried, advises them to remain permanently in that state, when he says, But I desire all to persevere in imitation of my example. 
but touching marrying in the Lord, he no longer advises, but plainly bids. Therefore, in this case especially, if we do not obey, we run a risk, because one may with more impunity neglect an advice than an order, in that the former springs from counsel and is proposed to the will for acceptance or rejection. The other descends from authority and is bound to necessity. In the former case, to disregard appears liberty, in the latter contumacy. Therefore, when in these days a certain woman removed her marriage from the pale of the church and united herself to a Gentile, and when I remembered that this had in days gone by been done by others, wondering at either their own waywardness or else the double dealing of their advisers, in that there is no scripture which holds forth a license of this deed, I wonder, said I, whether they flatter themselves on the ground of that passage of the first epistle to the Corinthians, where it is written, If any of the brethren has an unbelieving wife, and she consents to the matrimony, let him not dismiss her. Similarly, let not a believing woman married to an unbeliever, if she finds her husband agreeable to their continued union, dismiss him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the believing wife, and the unbelieving wife by the believing husband, else were your children unclean. It may be that, by understanding generally this monition regarding married believers, they think that license is granted thereby to marry even unbelievers. God forbid that he who thus interprets the passage be wittingly ensnared himself. But it is manifest that this scripture points to those believers who may have been found by the grace of God in the state of Gentile matrimony. According to the words themselves, if it says any believer has an unbelieving wife, it does not say takes an unbelieving wife. It shows that it is the duty of one who, already living in marriage with an unbelieving woman, has presently been, by the grace of God, converted to continue with his wife, for this reason to be sure, in order that no one, after attaining to faith, should think that he must turn away from a woman who is now, in some sense, an alien and stranger. Accordingly, he subjoins with all a reason that we are called in peace unto the Lord God, and that the unbeliever may, through the use of matrimony, be gained by the believer. The very closing sentence of the period confirms the supposition that this is thus to be understood. As each, it says, is called by the Lord, so let him persevere. But it is Gentiles who are called, I take it, not believers. But if he had been pronouncing absolutely, in the words under discussion, touching the marriage of believers merely, then had he virtually given to saints a permission to marry promiscuously? If, however, he had given such a permission, he would never have subjoined a declaration so diverse from and contrary to his own permission, saying, The woman, when her husband is dead, is free. Let her marry whom she wishes only in the Lord. Here, at all events, there is no need for reconsidering, for what there might have been reconsideration about, the Spirit has oracularly declared. For fear we should make an ill use of what he says, let her marry whom she wishes, he has added only in the Lord, that is, in the name of the Lord, which is undoubtedly to a Christian. That Holy Spirit, therefore, who prefers that widows and unmarried women should persevere in their integrity, who exhorts us to a copy of himself, prescribes no other manner of repeating marriage except in the Lord. To this condition alone does he concede the foregoing of continence. Only, he says, in the Lord, he has added to his law a weight, only. Utter that word with what tone and manner you may, it is weighty. It both bids and advises, both enjoins and exhorts, both asks and threatens. It is a concise, brief sentence, and by its own brevity, eloquent. Thus is the divine voice wont to speak, that you may instantly understand, instantly observe. For who but could understand that the apostle foresaw many dangers and wounds to faith in marriages of this kind, which he prohibits? and that he took precaution in the first place against the defilement of holy flesh in Gentile flesh. At this point someone says, What then is the difference between him who is chosen by the Lord to himself in the state of Gentile marriage, and him who was of old, that is before marriage, a believer, that they should not be equally cautious for their flesh, whereas the one is kept from marriage with an unbeliever, the other bidden to continue in it? Why, if we are defiled by a Gentile, is not the one disjoined, just as the other is not bound? 
I will answer, if the Spirit give me ability, alleging, before all other arguments, that the Lord holds it more pleasing that matrimony should not be contracted, than that it should at all be dissolved. In short, divorce he prohibits, except for the cause of fornication, but continence he commends. Let the one, therefore, have the necessity of continuing, the other, further, even the power of not marrying. Secondly, if, according to the Scripture, they who shall be apprehended by the faith in the state of Gentile marriage are not defiled thereby for this reason, that, together with themselves, others also are sanctified. Without doubt, they who have been sanctified before marriage, if they commingle themselves with strange flesh, cannot sanctify that flesh in union with which they were not apprehended. The grace of God, moreover, sanctifies that which it finds. Thus, what has not been able to be sanctified is unclean. What is unclean has no part with the holy unless to defile and slay it by its own nature. If these things are so, it is certain that believers contracting marriages with Gentiles are guilty of fornication and are to be excluded from all communication with the brotherhood in accordance with the letter of the apostle who says that with persons of that kind there is to be no taking of food even. Or shall we in that day produce our marriage certificates before the Lord's tribunal, and allege that a marriage such as he himself has forbidden has been duly contracted? What is prohibited in the passage just referred to is not adultery, it is not fornication. The admission of a strange man to your couch less violates the temple of God, less commingles members of Christ with the members of an adulteress. So far as I know, we are not our own but bought with a price. And what kind of price? The blood of God. In hurting this flesh of ours, therefore, we hurt him directly. What did that man mean who said that to wed a stranger was indeed a sin, but a very small one, whereas in other cases, setting aside the injury done to the flesh which pertains to the Lord, every voluntary sin against the Lord is great? For in so far as there was a power of avoiding it, in so far is it burdened with the charge of contumacy, let us now recount the other dangers or wounds, as I have said, to faith foreseen by the Apostle, most grievous not to the flesh merely, but likewise to the spirit too. For who would doubt that faith undergoes a daily process of obliteration by unbelieving intercourse? Evil confabulations corrupt good morals. How much more fellowship of life and indivisible intimacy? Any and every believing woman must of necessity obey God. And how can she serve two lords, the Lord and her husband, a Gentile to boot? For in obeying a Gentile, she will carry out Gentile practices, personal attractiveness, dressing of the head, worldly elegancies, baser blandishments, the very secrets even of matrimony tainted, not as among the saints the duties of the sex are discharged with honour shown to the very necessity which makes them incumbent, with modesty and temperance as beneath the eyes of God. But let her see to the question how she discharges her duties to her husband. To the Lord, at all events, she is unable to give satisfaction according to the requirements of his discipline, having at her side a servant of the devil, his Lord's agent for hindering the pursuits and duties of believers, so that if a station is to be kept, the husband at daybreak makes an appointment with his wife to meet him at the baths. If there are fasts to be observed, the husband that same day holds a convivial banquet. If a charitable expedition has to be made, never is family business more urgent." For who would suffer his wife, for the sake of visiting the brethren, to go round from street to street to other men's, and indeed to all the poorer, cottages? Who will willingly bear her being taken from his side by nocturnal convocations, if need be so? Who, finally, will, without anxiety, endure her absence all the night long at the paschal solemnities? Who will, without some suspicion of his own, dismiss her to attend that Lord's Supper which they defame? Who will suffer her to creep into prison to kiss a martyr's bonds? Nay, truly, to meet any one of the brethren, to exchange the kiss, to offer water for the saints' feet, to snatch somewhat for them from her food, from her cup, to yearn after them, to have them in her mind. If a pilgrim brother arrive, what hospitality for him in an alien home? If bounty is to be distributed to any, the granaries, the storehouses are foreclosed." But some husband does endure our practices and not annoy us. Here, therefore, there is a sin in that Gentiles know our practices. 
in that we are subject to the privity of the unjust, in that it is thanks to them that we do any good work. He who endures a thing cannot be ignorant of it, or else, if he is kept in ignorance because he does not endure it, he is feared. But since Scripture commands each of two things, namely that we work for the Lord without the privity of any second person, and without pressure upon ourselves, it matters not in which quarter you sin, whether in regard to your husband's privity, if he be tolerant, or else in regard to your own affliction in avoiding his intolerance. Cast not, saith he, your pearls to swine, lest they trample them to pieces, and turn round and overturn you also. Your pearls are the distinctive marks of even your daily conversation. The more care you take to conceal them, the more liable to suspicion you will make them, and the more exposed to the grasp of Gentile curiosity. Shall you escape notice when you sign your bed or your body, when you blow away some impurity, when even by night you rise to pray? And will you not be thought to be engaged in some work of magic? Will not your husband know what it is which you secretly taste before taking any food? And if he knows it to be bread, does he not believe it to be that bread which it is said to be? And will every husband, ignorant of the reason of these things, simply endure them, without murmuring, without suspicion, whether it be bread or poison? Some, it is true, do endure them, but it is that they may trample on, that they may make sport of such women, whose secrets they keep in reserve against the danger which they believe in, in case they ever chance to be hurt, they do endure wives whose dowries, by casting in their teeth their Christian name, they make the wages of silence, while they threaten them, forsooth, with a suit before some spy as arbitrator, which most women, not foreseeing, have been wont to discover either by the extortion of their property, or else by the loss of their faith. The handmaid of God dwells amid alien labours, and among these labours, on all the memorial days of demons, at all solemnities of kings, at the beginning of the year, at the beginning of the month, she will be agitated by the odour of incense. And she will have to go forth from her house by a gate wreathed with laurel, and hung with lanterns, as from some new constituary of public lusts, will have to sit with her husband oft-times in club meetings, oft-times in taverns, and want as she was formerly to minister to the saints, will sometimes have to minister to the unjust. And will she not hence recognize a prejudgment of her own damnation, in that she tends to them whom formerly she was expecting to judge? Whose hand will she yearn after? Of whose cup will she partake? What will her husband sing to her, or she to her husband? From the tavern, I suppose, she who sups upon God will hear somewhat. From hell what mention of God arises, what invocation of Christ? Where are the fosterings of faith by the interspersion of the scriptures in conversation? Where the spirit, where refreshment, where the divine benediction? All things are strange, all inimical, all condemned, aimed by the evil one for the attrition of salvation. If these things may happen to those women also who, having attained the faith while in the state of Gentile matrimony, continue in that state, Still they are excused as having been apprehended by God in these very circumstances, and they are bidden to persevere in their married state, and are sanctified and having hope of making a gain held out to them. If then a marriage of this kind, contracted before conversion, stands ratified before God, why should not one contracted after conversion too go prosperously forward, so as not to be thus harassed by pressures and straits and hindrances and defilements, having already, as it has, the partial sanction of divine grace. Because, on the one hand, the wife, in the former case, called from among the Gentiles to the exercise of some eminent heavenly virtue, is, by the visible proofs of some marked divine regard, a terror to her Gentile husband, so as to make him less ready to annoy her, less active in laying snares for her, less diligent in playing the spy over her. He has felt mighty works, he has seen experimental evidences, he knows her changed for the better. Thus even he himself is by his fear a candidate for God. Thus men of this kind, with regard to whom the grace of God has established a familiar intimacy, are more easily gained. But on the other hand, to descend into forbidden ground unsolicited and spontaneously is quite another thing. Things which are not pleasing to the Lord, of course, offend the Lord, are, of course, introduced by the evil one. 
A sign hereof is this fact, that it is wooers only who find the Christian name pleasing, and accordingly some heathen men are found not to shrink in horror from Christian women, just in order to exterminate them, to wrest them away, to exclude them from the faith. So long as marriage of this kind is procured by the evil one, but condemned by God, you have a reason why you need not doubt that it can in no case be carried to a prosperous end. Let us further inquire, as if we were in very deed inquisitors of divine sentences, whether they be lawfully thus condemned. Even among the nations do not all the strictest lords and most tenacious of discipline interdict their own slaves from marrying out of their own house? in order, of course, that they may not run into levitious excess, desert their duties, purvey their lord's goods to strangers. Yet further, have not the nations decided that such women as have, after their lord's formal warning, persisted in intercourse with other men's slaves, may be claimed as slaves? Shall earthly disciplines be held more strict than heavenly prescripts, so that Gentile women, if united to strangers, lose their liberty? Ours can join to themselves the devil's slaves and continue in their former position. Forsooth, they will deny that any formal warning has been given them by the Lord through his apostle. What am I to fasten on as the cause of this madness except the weakness of faith, ever prone to the concupiscences of worldly joys, which indeed is chiefly found among the wealthier? For the more any is rich and inflated with the name of matron, the more capacious house does she require for her burdens, as it were a field wherein ambition may run its course. To such the churches look paltry." A rich man is a difficult thing to find in the house of God, and if such an one is found there, difficult is it to find such unmarried. What then are they to do? Whence but from the devil are they to seek a husband apt for maintaining their sedan and their mules and their hair curlers of outlandish stature? A Christian, even although rich, would perhaps not afford all these. Set before yourself, I beg of you, the example of Gentiles. Most Gentile women, noble in extraction and wealthy in property, unite themselves indiscriminately with the ignoble and the mean, sought out for themselves for luxurious or mutilated for licentious purposes. Some take up with their own freedmen and slaves, despising public opinion, provided they may but have husbands from whom to fear no impediment to their own liberty. To a Christian believer it is irksome to wed a believer inferior to herself in a state, destined as she will be to have her wealth augmented in the person of a poor husband. For if it is the poor, not the rich, whose are the kingdoms of the heavens, the rich will find more in the poor than she brings him, or than she would in the rich. She will be dowered with an ampler dowry from the goods of him who is rich in God." Let her be on an equality with him on earth, who in the heavens will perhaps not be so. Is there need for doubt and inquiry and repeated deliberation whether he whom God has entrusted with his own property is fit for dotal endowments? Whence are we to find words enough fully to tell the happiness of that marriage which the church cements, and the oblation confirms, and the benediction signs and seals, which angels carry back the news of to heaven, which the Father holds for ratified? For even on earth children do not rightly and lawfully wed without their father's consent. What kind of yoke is that of two believers, partakers of one hope, one desire, one discipline, one and the same service? Both are brethren, both fellow servants, no difference of spirit or of flesh. Nay, they are truly two in one flesh. Where the flesh is one, one is the spirit too. Together they pray, together prostrate themselves, together perform their fasts, mutually teaching, mutually exhorting, mutually sustaining. Equally are they both found in the church of God, equally at the banquet of God, equally in straits, in persecutions, in refreshments. Neither hides aught from the other, neither shuns the other, neither is troublesome to the other. The sick is visited, the indigent relieved, with freedom. Alms are given without danger of ensuing torment, sacrifices attended without scruple, daily diligence discharged without impediment. There is no stealthy signing, no trembling greeting, no mute benediction. Between the two echo psalms and hymns, and they mutually challenge each other, which shall better chant to their Lord. Such things when Christ sees and hears, he joys. To these he sends his own peace. Where two are, 
there withal is he himself. Where he is, there the evil one is not. These are the things which that utterance of the apostle has, beneath its brevity, left to be understood by us. These things, if need shall be, suggest to your own mind. By these turn yourself away from the examples of some. To marry otherwise is, to believers not lawful, is not expedient. End of To His Wife by Tertullian The Chaplet by Tertullian This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Read by David Ronald Very lately it happened thus. While the bounty of our most excellent emperors was dispensed in the camp, the soldiers, laurel-crowned, were approaching. One of them, more a soldier of God, more steadfast than the rest of his brethren, who had imagined that they could serve two masters, his head alone uncovered, the useless crown in his hand. Already, even by that peculiarity known to every one as a Christian, was nobly conspicuous. Accordingly, all began to mark him out jeering him at a distance gnashing on him near at hand the murmur is wafted to the tribune when the person had just left the ranks the tribune at once puts the question to him why are you so different in your attire he declared that he had no liberty to wear the crown with the rest being urgently asked for his reasons he answered i am a christian o soldier boasting thyself in god then the case was considered and voted on the matter was remitted to a higher tribunal the offender was conducted to the prefects at once he put away the heavy cloak his disburdening commenced he loosed from his foot the military shoe beginning to stand upon holy ground he gave up the sword which was not necessary either for the protection of our lord from his hand likewise dropped the laurel crown and now purple clad with the hope of his own blood shod with the preparation of the gospel girt with the sharper word of god completely equipped in the apostle's armor and crowned more worthily with the white crown of martyrdom he awaits in prison the largesse of christ thereafter averse judgments began to be passed upon his conduct whether on the part of christians i do not know for those of the heathen are not different as if he were headstrong and rash and too eager to die because in being taken to the task about a mere matter of dress he brought trouble on the bearers of the name he forsooth alone brave among so many soldier brethren he alone a christian it is plain that as they have rejected the prophecies of the holy spirit they are also proposing the refusal of martyrdom so they murmur that a peace so good and long is endangered for them nor do i doubt that some are already turning their back on the scriptures are making ready their luggage, are equipped for flight from city to city. For that is all of the gospel they care to remember. I know, too, their pastors are lions in peace, deer in the fight. As to the questions asked for extorting confessions from us, we shall teach elsewhere. Now, as they put forth also the objection, but where are we forbidden to be crowned? I shall take this point up, as more suitable to be treated of here, being the essence, in fact, of the present contention, so that, on the one hand, the inquirers who are ignorant but anxious may be instructed, and on the other, those may be refuted who try to vindicate the sin, especially the laurel-crowned Christians themselves, to whom it is merely a question of debate, as if it might be regarded as either no trespass at all, or at least a doubtful one, because it may be made the subject of investigation." That it is neither sinless nor doubtful, I shall now, however, show. I affirm that not one of the faithful has ever a crown upon his head except at a time of trial. That is the case with all, from catechumens to confessors and martyrs, or, as the case may be, deniers. Consider then, whence, the custom about which we are now chiefly inquiring got its authority. But when the question is raised why it is observed, it is meanwhile evident that it is observed. Therefore, that can neither be regarded as no offense or an uncertain one which is perpetrated against a practice which is capable of defense, 
on the ground even of its repute and is sufficiently ratified by the support of general acceptance. It is undoubted so that we ought to inquire into the reason of the thing, but without prejudice to the practice, not for the purpose of overthrowing it, but rather of building it up, that you may all the more carefully observe it, when you are also satisfied as to its reason. But what sort of procedure is it for one to be bringing into debate a practice when he has fallen from it, and to be seeking the explanation of his having ever had it when he has left it off? Since, although he may wish to seem, on this account, desirous to investigate it, that he may show that he has not done wrong in giving it up, it is evident that he nevertheless transgressed previously in its presumptuous observance. If he has done no wrong to-day in accepting the crown, he offended before in refusing it. This treatise, therefore, will not be for those who are not in a proper condition for inquiry, but for those who, with the real desire of getting instruction, bring forward not a question for debate, but a request for advice. For it is from this desire that a true inquiry always proceeds, and I praise the faith which has believed in the duty of complying with the rule before it has learned the reason of it. An easy thing it is at once to demand where it is written that we should not be crowned. But is it written that we should be crowned? Indeed, in urgently demanding the warrant of Scripture in a different side from their own, men prejudge that the support of Scripture ought no less to appear on their part. For if it shall be said that it is lawful to be crowned on this ground, that Scripture does not forbid it, it will as validity be retorted that just on this ground is the crown unlawful because the scripture does not enjoin it what shall discipline do shall it accept both things as if neither were forbidden or shall it refuse both as if neither were enjoined but quote, the thing which is not forbidden is freely permitted end quote. i should rather say that what has not been freely allowed is forbidden and how long shall we draw this saw to and fro through this line when we have an ancient practice which by anticipation has made for us the state i e of the question if no passage of scripture has prescribed it assuredly custom which without doubt flowed from tradition has confirmed it for how can anything come into use if it has not first been handed down even in pleading tradition written authority you say must be demanded let us inquire, therefore, whether tradition, unless it be written, should not be admitted. Certainly we shall say that it ought not to be admitted if no cases of other practices, which, without any written instrument, we maintain on the ground of tradition alone, and the countenance thereafter of custom, affords us any precedent. To deal with this matter briefly, I shall begin with baptism. When we are going to enter the water, but a little before, in the presence of the congregation, and under the hand of the president, we solemnly profess that we disown the devil and his pomp, and his angels. Hereupon we are thrice immersed, making a somewhat ampler pledge than the Lord has appointed in the gospel. Then, when we are taken up, as newborn children, we taste first of all a mixture of milk and honey, and from that day we refrain from the daily bath for a whole week. We take also, in congregations before daybreak, and from the hand of none but the presidents, the sacrament of the Eucharist, which the Lord both commanded to be eaten at meal times and enjoined to be taken by all alike. As often as the anniversary comes round, we make offerings for the dead as birthday honors. We count fasting or kneeling in worship on the Lord's day to be unlawful. We rejoice in the same privilege also from Easter to Whit Sunday. We feel pain should any wine or bread, even though our own, be cast upon the ground. At every forward step and movement, at every going in and out, when we put on our clothes and shoes, when we bathe, when we sit at the table, when we light the lamps, on couch, on seat, in all the ordinary actions of daily life, we trace upon the forehead the sign. If for these and other such rules you insist upon having positive scripture injunction, you will find none. Tradition will be held forth to you as the originator of them, custom as their strengthener, and faith as their observer. That reason will support tradition and custom, and faith you will either yourself perceive, 
or learn from some one who has. Meanwhile, you will believe that there is some reason to which submission is due. I add still one case more, as it will be proper to show you how it was among the ancients also. Among the Jews, so usual is it for their women to have the head veiled, that they may thereby be recognized. I ask in this instance for the law. I put the apostle aside. If Rebecca at once drew down her veil, when in the distance she saw her betrothed, this modesty of a mere private individual could not have made a law, or it will have made it only for those who have the reason which she had. Let virgins alone be veiled, and this, when they are coming to be married, and not till they have recognized their destined husband. If Susanna also, who is subjugated to unveiling on her trial, furnishes an argument for the veiling of women, I can say here also the veil was a voluntary thing. She had come accused, ashamed of the disgrace she had brought on herself, properly concealing her beauty, even because now she feared to please. But I should not suppose that, when it was her aim to please, she took walks with a veil on in her husband's avenue. Grant now that she was always veiled. In this particular case, too, or, in fact, in that of any other, I demand the dress law. If I nowhere find a law, it follows that tradition has given the fashion in question to custom, to find subsequently its authorization in the apostle's sanction from the true interpretation of reason. This instances, therefore, will make it sufficiently plain that you can vindicate the keeping of even unwritten tradition established by custom, the proper witness for tradition when demonstrated by long-continued observance. But even in civil matters, custom is accepted as law, when positive legal enactment is wanting, and it is the same thing whether it depends on writing or on reason, since reason is, in fact, the basis of law. But, you say, if reason is the ground of law, all will now henceforth have to be counted law, whoever brings it forward which shall have reason as its ground. Or do you think that every believer is entitled to originate and establish a law, if only it be such as is agreeable to God, as is helpful to discipline, as promotes salvation when the Lord says, quote, But why do you not even of your own selves judge what is right? End quote. And not merely in regard to a judicial sentence, but in regard to every decision and matters we are called on to consider, the Apostle also says, quote, If of anything you are ignorant, God shall reveal it unto you. End quote. He himself, too, being accustomed to afford counsel, though he had not the command of the Lord, and to dictate of himself as possessing the Spirit of God who guides into all truth. Therefore, his advice has, by warrant of divine reason, become equivalent to nothing less than a divine command. Earnestly now inquire of this teacher, keeping intact your regard for tradition, from whomsoever it originally sprang, nor have regard to the author, but to the authority, and especially of that custom itself, which on this very account we should revere, that we may not want an interpreter, so that if reason too is God's gift, you may then learn, not whether custom has to be followed by you, but why. The argument for Christian practices becomes all the stronger when also nature, which is the first rule of all, supports them. Well, she is the first who lays it down, that a crown does not become the head, but I think ours is the God of nature, who fashioned man, and, that he might desire, appreciate, become partaker of, the pleasures afforded by his creatures, endowed him with certain senses, acting through members, which, so to speak, are their peculiar instruments. The sense of hearing he has planted in the ears, that of sight, lighted up in the eyes, that of taste, shut up in the mouth, that of smell, wafted into the nose, that of touch, fixed on the tips of the fingers, by means of these organs of the outer man doing duty to the inner man, the enjoyments of the divine gifts are conveyed by the senses to the soul. What, then, in flowers affords you enjoyment? For it is the flowers of the field which are the peculiar, at least the chief material of crowns. Either smell, you say, or color, or both together. What will be the senses of color and smell? Those of seeing and smelling, I suppose. What members have had these senses allotted to them? the eyes and the nose, if I am not mistaken, with sight and smell, then make use of flowers, for these are the senses by which they are meant to be enjoyed. Use them by means of the eyes and nose, which are the members to which these senses belong. You have got the thing from God, the mode of it from the world, 
but an extraordinary mode does not prevent the use of the thing in the common way. Let flowers, then, both when fastened into each other and tied together in thread and rush, be what they are when free, when loose, things to be looked at and smelt. You count it a crown, let us say, when you have a bunch of them bound together in a series, that you may carry many at one time, that you may enjoy them all at once. Well, lay them in your bosom if they are so singularly pure, and strew them on your couch if they are so exquisitely soft, and consign them to your cup if they are so perfectly harmless. Have the pleasure of them in as many ways as they appeal to your senses. But what taste for a flower? What sense for anything belonging to a crown but its band? Have you in the head, which is able neither to distinguish color, nor to inhale sweet perfumes, nor to appreciate softness? It is as much against nature to long after a flower with the head, as it is to crave food with the ear, or sound with the nostril. But every thing which is against nature deserves to be branded as monstrous among all men. But with us, it is to be condemned also as sacrilege against God, the Lord and Creator of nature. Demanding then a law of God, you have that common one prevailing all over the world, engraven on the natural tables on which the Apostle too is wont to appeal, as when in respect of the woman's veil he says, quote, Does not even nature teach you? End quote. As when to the Romans, affirming that the heathen do by nature those things which the law requires, he suggests both natural law and a law revealing nature. Yes, and also in the first chapter of the epistle, he authenticates nature when he asserts that males and females changed among themselves the natural use of the creature into that which is unnatural, by way of penal retribution for their error. We first of all indeed know God himself by the teaching of nature, calling him God of gods, taking for granted that he is good, and invoking him as judge. Is it a question with you whether for the enjoyment of his creatures nature should be our guide, that we may not be carried away in the direction in which the rival of God has corrupted, along with man himself, the entire creation, which had been made over to our race for certain uses, whence the apostle says that it too unwillingly became subject to vanity, completely bereft of its original character, first by vain, then by base, unrighteous and ungodly uses. It is thus accordingly in the pleasures of the shows that the creature is dishonored by those who by nature indeed perceive that all the materials of which shows are got up to belong to God, but lack the knowledge to perceive as well that they have all been changed by the devil. But with this topic we have, for the sake of our own play lovers, sufficiently dealt, and that, too, in a work in Greek. Let these dealers in crowns then recognize, in the meantime, the authority of nature, on the ground of a common sense as human beings, and the certifications of their peculiar religion, as, according to the last chapter, worshippers of the god of nature, and, as it were, thus over and above what is required, let them consider those other reasons, too, which forbid us wearing crowns, especially on the head, and indeed crowns of every sort. For we are obliged to turn from the rule of nature, which we share with mankind in general, that we may maintain the whole peculiarity of our Christian discipline, in relation also to other kinds of crowns, which seem to have been provided for different uses, as being composed of different substances, lest, because they do not consist of flowers, the use of which nature has indicated, as it does in the case of this military laurel one itself, they may be thought not to come under the prohibition of our sect, since they have escaped any objections of nature. I see, then, that we must go into the matter both with more research and more fully, from its beginnings on through its successive stages of growth to its more erratic developments, for this we need to turn to heathen literature, for things belonging to the heathen must be proved from their own documents. The little of this I have acquired will, I believe, be enough. If there really was a Pandora, whom Hesiod mentions as the first of women, hers was the first head the graces crowned, for she received gifts from all the gods when she got her name Pandora. But Moses, a prophet, not a poet shepherd, shows us the first woman, Eve, having her loins more naturally girt about with leaves than her temples with flowers. Pandora, then, is a myth. And so we have to blush for the origin of the crown, even on the ground of the falsehood connected with it, and, as will soon appear, on the ground no less of its realities. 
for it is an undoubted fact that certain persons either originated the thing or shed luster on it. Pharisees relates that Saturn was the first who wore a crown, Diodorus that Jupiter, after conquering the Titans, was honored with this gift by the rest of the gods. To Priapus, also the same author assigns fillets, and to Ariadne, a garland of gold and of Indian gems, the gift of Vulcan, afterwards of Bacchus, and subsequently turned into a constellation. Callimachus has put a vine crown upon Juno. So too at Argos, her statue, vine wreathed, with a lion's skin placed beneath her feet, exhibits the stepmother exulting over the spoils of her two stepsons. Hercules displays upon his head, sometimes popular, sometimes wild olive, sometimes parsley. You have the tragedy of Cerberus, you have Pindar, and besides Callimachus, who mentions that Apollo too, when he had killed the Delphic serpent, as a suppliant, put on a laurel garland, for among the ancients supplicants were wont to be crowned. Harpocration argues that Bacchus, the same as Osiris among the Egyptians, was designedly crowned with ivy, because it is the nature of ivy to protect the brain against drowsiness. But that, in another way also, Bacchus was the originator of the laurel crown, the crown in which he celebrated his triumph over the Indians, even the rabble acknowledge, when they call the days dedicated to him, the, quote, great crown, unquote. If you open, again, the writings of the Egyptian Leo, you learn that Isis was the first who discovered and wore ears of corn upon her head, a thing more suited to the belly. Those who want additional information will find an ample exposition of the subject in Claudius Saturnitus, a writer of distinguished talent who treats this question also, for he has a book on crowns, so explaining their beginnings as well as causes, and kinds, and rites, that you find all that is charming in the flower, all that is beautiful in the leafy branch, and every sod or vine shoot has been dedicated to some head or other, making it abundantly clear how foreign to us we should judge the custom of the crowned head, introduced as it was by, and thereafter constantly managed for the honor of, those whom the world has believed to be gods. If the devil, a liar from the beginning, is even in this matter working for his false system of godhead, idolatry, he had himself also without doubt provided for his god lie being carried out. What sort of thing, then, must that be counted among the people of the true god, which was brought in by the nations in honor of the devil's candidates, and was set apart from the beginning to no other than these, and which even then received its consecration to idolatry by idols, and in idols yet alive? Not as if an idol were anything, but since the things which others offer up to idols belong to demons. But if the things which others offer to them belong to demons, how much more what idols offer to themselves when they were in life? The demons themselves, doubtless, had made provision for themselves by means of those whom they had possessed, while in a state of desire and craving before provision had been actually made. Hold fast, in the meantime, this persuasion, while I examine a question which comes in our way, for I already hear it is said that many other things as well as crowns have been invented by those whom the world believes to be gods, and that they are notwithstanding to be met with both in our present usages and in those of early saints, and in the service of God, and in Christ himself, who did his work as man by no other than these ordinary instrumentalities of human life. Well, let it be so, nor shall I inquire any farther back into the origin of this things, that Mercury have been the first who taught the knowledge of letters, I will own that they are requisite both for the business and commerce of life, and for performing our devotion to God. Nay, if he also first strung the cord to give forth melody, I will not deny when listening to David that this invention has been in use with the saints and has ministered to God. Let Aesculapius have been the first who sought and discovered cures. Isaiah mentions that he ordered Hezekiah medicine when he was sick, Paul, too, knows that a little wine does the stomach good. Let Minerva have been the first who built a ship. I shall see Jonah and the apostle sailing. Nay, there is more than this, for even Christ we shall find has ordinary raiment. Paul, too, has his cloak. If at once of every article of furniture and each household vessel you name some god of the world as the originator, well, I must recognize Christ both as he reclines on a couch, 
and when he presents a basin for the feet of his disciples and when he pours water into it from an ewer and when he is girt about with linen towel a garment specially sacred to osiris it is thus in general i reply upon the point admitting indeed that we use along with other these articles but challenging that this be judged in the light of the distinction between things agreeable and things opposed to reason because the promiscuous employment of them is deceptive concealing the corruption of the creature by which it has been made subject to vanity for we affirm that those things only are proper to be used whether by ourselves or by those who live before us and alone befit the service of a god in christ himself which to meet the necessities of human life supply what is simply useful and affords real assistance and honorable comfort so that they may be well believed to have come from god's own inspiration who first of all no doubt provided for and taught and ministered to the enjoyment i should suppose of his own man as for the things which are out of this class they are not fit to be used among us especially those which on the account indeed are not to be found either with the world or in the ways of christ in short what patriarch what prophet what levite or priest or ruler or at a later period what apostle or preacher of the gospel or bishop do you ever find the wearer of a crown i think not even the temple of god itself was crowned as neither was the ark of the testament nor the tabernacle of witness nor the altar nor the candlestick crowned though certainly both on that first solemnity of the dedication and in that second rejoicing for the restoration crowning would have been most suitable if it were worthy of god but if these things were figures of us for we are temples of god and altars and lights and sacred vessels this too they in figure set forth that the people of god ought not to be crowned the reality must always correspond with the image if perhaps you object that christ himself was crowned to that you will get the brief reply be you too crowned as he was you have full permission yet even that crown of insolent ungodliness was not of any decree of the jewish people it was a device of the roman soldiers taken from the practice of the world a practice which the people of god never allowed either on the occasion of public rejoicing or to gratify innate luxury so they returned from the babylonish captivity with timbrels and flutes and psalteries more suitably than with crowns and after eating and drinking uncrowned they rose up to play neither would the account of the rejoicing nor the exposure of the luxury have been silent touching the honor or dishonor of the crown thus too isaiah as he says with timbrels and psalteries and flutes they drank wine would have added with crowns if this practice had ever place in the things of god so when you allege that the ornaments of the heathen deities are found no less with god with the subject of claiming among these for general use the head crown you already lay it down for yourself that we may not have among us as a thing whose use we are to share with others what is not to be found in the service of god well what is so unworthy of god indeed as that which is worthy of an idol but what is worthy of an idol as that which is also worthy of a dead man for it is the privilege of the dead also to be thus crowned as they too straightway become idols both by their dress and the service of deification which deification is with us a second idolatry wanting then the sense it will be theirs to use the thing for which the sense is wanting just as if in full possession of the sense they wish to abuse it when there ceases to be any reality in the use there is no distinction between using and abusing who can abuse a thing when the precipient nature with which he wishes to carry out his purpose is not his to use it the apostle moreover forbids us to abuse while he would more naturally have taught us not to use unless on the ground that where there is no sense for things there is no wrong use of them but the whole affair is meaningless and is in fact a dead work so far concerns the idols though without doubt a living one as respects the demons to whom the religious right belongs the idols of the heathen says david are silver and gold they have eyes and see not a nose and smell not hands and they will not handle 
by means of these organs, indeed, we are to enjoy flowers, but if he declares that those who make idols will be like them, they already are so who use anything after the style of idol adornings. Quote, to the pure, all things are pure, so, likewise, all things to the impure are impure. End quote. But nothing is more impure than idols. The substances are themselves as creatures of God without impurity, and in this their native state are free to the use of all. But the ministries to which in their use they are devoted make all the difference. For I, too, kill a cock for myself, just as Socrates did for Aesculapius. And if the smell of some place or other offends me, I burn the Arabian product myself, but not with the same ceremony, nor in the same dress, nor with the same pomp, with which it is done to idols. If the creature is defiled by a mere word, as the apostle teaches, quote, but if any one say, this is offered in sacrifice to idols, you must not touch it, end quote, much more when it is polluted by the dress, and rites, and pomp of what is offered to the gods, thus the crown also is made out to be an offering to idols, for with this ceremony, and dress, and pomp, it is presented in sacrifice to idols, its originators to whom its use is specifically given over, and chiefly on this account, that what has no place among the things of God may not be admitted into use with us as with others. Wherefore the apostle exclaims, Flee idolatry! Certainly idolatry, whole and entire, he means. Reflect on what a thicket it is, and how many thorns lie hid in it. Nothing must be given to an idol, and so nothing must be taken from one. If it is inconsistent with faith to recline in an idol temple, what is it to appear in an idol dress? What communion have Christ and Belial? Therefore, flee from it, for he enjoins us to keep at a distance from idolatry, to have no close dealings with it of any kind. Even an earthly serpent sucks in men at some distance with its breath. Going still further, John says, quote, My little children, keep yourself from idols. End quote. Not now from idolatry, as if from the service of it, but from idols, that is, from any resemblance to them. For it is an unworthy thing that you, the image of the living God, should become the likeness of an idol and a dead man. Thus far, we assert that this attire belongs to idols, both from the history of its origin and from its use by false religion, on this ground, besides, that while it is not mentioned as connected with the worship of God, it is more and more given over to those in whose antiquities, as well as festivals and services, it is found. In a word, the very doors, the very victims and altars, the very servants and priests are crowned. You have, in Claudius, the crowns of all the various colleges of priests. We have added also that distinction between things altogether different from each other, things, namely, agreeable, and things contrary to reason, in answer to those who, because there happens to be the use of some things in common, maintain the right of participation in all things. With reference to this part of the subject, therefore, it now remains that the special grounds for wearing crowns should be examined, that while we show these to be foreign, nay, even opposed to our Christian discipline, we may demonstrate that none of them have any plea of reason to support it, on the basis of which this article of dress might be vindicated, as one in whose use we can participate, as even some others may whose instances are cast up to us. To begin with the real ground of the military crown, I think we must first inquire whether warfare is proper at all for Christians. What sense is there in discussing the merely accidental when that on which it rests is to be condemned? Do we believe it lawful for a human oath to be superadded to one divine, for a man to come under promise to another master after Christ, and to abjure father, mother, and all nearest kinsfolk, whom even the law has commanded us to honor and love next to God himself, to whom the gospel, too, holding them only of less account than Christ, has in like manner rendered honor. Shall it be held lawful to make an occupation of the sword, when the Lord proclaims that he who uses the sword shall perish by the sword? And shall the Son of Peace take part in the battle when it does not come him even to sue at law? And shall he apply the chain and the prison and the torture, and the punishment, who is not the avenger even of his own wrongs? Shall he forsooth either keep watch service for others more than for Christ, or shall he do it on the Lord's day, when he does not even do it for Christ himself? And shall he keep guard before the temples which he has renounced? 
And shall he take a meal where the apostle has forbidden him? And shall he diligently protect by night those whom in the daytime he has put to flight by the exorcisms, leaning and resting on the spear, the while with which Christ's side was pierced? Shall he carry a flag, too, hostile to Christ? And shall he ask a watchword from the emperor, who has already received one from God? Shall he be disturbed in death by the trumpet of the trumpeteer, who expects to be aroused by the angel's trump? And shall the Christian be burned according to the camp rule, when he was not permitted to burn incense to an idol, when to him Christ remitted the punishment of fire? Then how many other offenses there are involved in the performances of camp offices, which we must hold to involve a transgression of God's law, you may see by a slight survey. The very carrying of the name over from the camp of light to the camp of darkness is a violation of it. Of course, if faith comes later and finds any preoccupied with military service, their case is different, as in the instance of those whom John used to receive for baptism, and of those most faithful centurions, I mean the centurion whom Christ approves, and the centurion whom Peter instructs. Yet at the same time, when a man has become a believer, and faith has been sealed, there must be either an immediate abandonment of it, which has been the course with many, or all sorts of quibbling will have to be resorted to in order to avoid offending God, and that is not allowed even outside of military service, or, last of all, for God the fate must be endured which a citizen faith has been no less ready to accept. Neither does military service hold out escape from punishment of sins or exemption from martyrdom. Nowhere does the Christian change his character. There is one gospel and the same Jesus who will one day deny everyone who denies and acknowledge everyone who acknowledges God, who will save, too, the life which has been lost for his sake, but on the other hand, destroy that which for gain has been saved to his dishonor. With him, the faithful citizen is a soldier, just as the soldier is a citizen. A state of faith admits no plea of necessity. They are under no necessity to sin, whose one necessity is that they do not sin. For if one is pressed to the offering of sacrifice and the sheer denial of Christ by the necessity of torture or the punishment, yet discipline does not connive even at that necessity, because there is a higher necessity to dread denying to undergo martyrdom than to escape from suffering and to render the homage required. In fact, an excuse of this sort overturns the entire essence of our sacrament, removing even the obstacle to voluntary sins, for it will be possible also to maintain that inclination is a necessity, as involving in it, forsooth, a sort of compulsion. I have, in fact, disposed of this very allegation of necessity with reference to the pleas by which crowns connected with official position are vindicated, in support of which it is in common use, since for this very reason offices must be either refused, that we may not fall into acts of sin, or martyrdoms endured, that we may get quit of offices. Touching this primary aspect of the question, as to the unlawfulness even of a military life itself, I shall not add more, that the secondary question may be restored to its place. Indeed, if, putting my strength to the question, I banish from us the military life, I should now to no purpose issue a challenge on the matter of the military crown. Suppose, then, that the military service is lawful, as far as the plea for the crown is concerned. But I first say a word also about the crown itself. This laurel one is sacred to Apollo or Bacchus, to the former as the god of archery, to the latter as the god of triumphs. In like manner, Claudius teaches when he tells us that soldiers are wont, too, to be wreathed in myrtle, for the myrtle belongs to Venus, the mother of the Aeniadi, the mistress also of the god of war, who through Ilia and the Romuli is Roman. But I do not believe that Venus is Roman as well as Mars, because of the vexation the concubine gave her. When military service again is crowned with olive, the idolatry has respect to Minerva, who is equally the goddess of arms, but got a crown of the tree referred to because of the peace she made with Neptune. In these respects, the superstition of the military garland will be everywhere defiled and all defiling. And it is further defiled, I should think, also in the grounds of it. Lo, the yearly public pronouncing of vows, what does that bear on its face to be? It takes place first in the part of the camp where the general's tent is, and then in the temples. In addition to the places, observe the words also, 
Quote, we vow that you, O Jupiter, will then have an ox with gold-decorated horns. End quote. What does the utterance mean? Without a doubt, the denial of Christ. Albeit the Christian says nothing in these places with the mouth, he makes his response by having the crown on his head. This laurel is likewise commanded to be used at the distribution of the largesse. So you see, idolatry is not without its gain, selling, as it does, Christ for pieces of gold, as Judas did for pieces of silver. Will it be, quote, ye cannot serve God and mammon, end quote, to devote your energies to mammon and to depart from God? Will it be, quote, render unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things which are God's, end quote, not only not to render the human being to God, but even to take the denarius from Caesar? Is the laurel of the triumph made of leaves or of corpses? Is it adorned with ribbons or with tombs? Is it bedowed with ointments or with tears of wives and mothers? It may be of some Christians too, for Christ is also among the barbarians. Has not he who has carried a crown for this cause on his head fought even against himself? Another sort of service belongs to the royal guards, and indeed, crowns are called castrenses, as belonging to the camp Munifica. Likewise, from the Caesarean functions, they perform. But even then, you are still the soldier and the servant of another, and if of two masters, of God and Caesar, but assuredly then, not of Caesar, when you owe yourself to God, as having higher claims, I should think, even in matters in which both have an interest. For state reasons, the various orders of the citizens also are crowned with laurel crowns, but the magistrates besides the golden ones, as at Athens and at Rome, even to those are preferred the Etruscan. This appellation is given to the crowns which, distinguished by their gems and oak leaves of gold, they put on, with mantles having an embroidery of palm branches, to conduct the chariots containing the images of the gods to the circus. There are also provincial crowns of gold, needing now the larger heads of images instead of those of men. But your orders and your magistracies, and your very place of meeting, the church, are Christ. You belong to him, for you have been enrolled in the books of life. There the blood of the Lord serves for your purple robe, and your broad stripe is his own cross. There the axe is already laid to the trunk of the tree. There is the branch out of the root of Jesse. Never mind the state horses with their crown. Your Lord, when, according to the scripture, he would enter Jerusalem in triumph, had not even an ass of his own. These put their trust in chariots, and these in horses, but we will seek our help in the name of the Lord our God. From so much as a dwelling in the Babylon of John's revelation, we are called away, much more then from its pomp. The rabble, too, are crowned, at one time because of some great rejoicing for the success of the emperors, at another on account of some custom belonging to municipal festivals, for luxury strives to make her own every occasion of public gladness. But as for you, you are a foreigner in this world, a citizen of Jerusalem, the city above. Our citizenship, the apostle says, is in heaven. You have your own registers, your own calendar. You have nothing to do with the joys of the world. Nay, you are called to the very opposite, for, quote, the world shall rejoice, but ye shall mourn, end quote. And I think the Lord affirms that those who mourn are happy, not those who are crowned. Marriage, too, decks the bridegroom with its crown, and therefore we will not have heathen brides, lest they seduce us even to the idolatry with which among them marriage is initiated. You have the law from the patriarchs indeed, you have the apostle enjoining people to marry in the Lord, you have a crowning also on the making of a freeman, but you have been already ransomed by Christ, and that at a great price. How shall the world manumit the servant of another? Though it seems to be liberty, yet it will come to be found bondage. In the world everything is nominal, and nothing real, for even then, as ransomed by Christ, you are under no bondage to man, and now, Though man has given you liberty, you are the servant of Christ. If you think freedom of the world to be real, so that you even seal it with a crown, you have returned to the slavery of man. Imagining it to be freedom, you have lost the freedom of Christ, fancying it is slavery. Will there be any dispute as to the cause of crown-wearing, which contests in the games in their turn supply, and which, both as sacred to the gods and in honor of the dead, their own reason at once condemns? 
it only remains that the Olympian Jupiter and the Nemean Hercules and the wretched little Archimorus and the hapless Antinous should be crowned in a Christian that he himself may become a spectacle disgusting to behold. We have recounted, as I think, all the various causes of the wearing of the crown, and there is not one which has any place with us. All are foreign to us, unholy, unlawful, having been abjured already, once for all in the solemn declaration of the sacrament. For they were of the pomp of the devil and his angels, offices of the world, honors, festivals, popularity huntings, false vows, exhibitions of human servility, empty praises, base glories, and in them all idolatry, even in respect of the origin of the crowns alone, with which they are all wreathed. Claudius will tell us in his preface, indeed, that in the poems of Homer, the heaven also is crowned with constellations, and that no doubt by God, no doubt for man, therefore man himself too should be crowned by God. But the world crowns brothels, and baths, and bakehouses, and prisons, and schools, and the very amphitheaters, and the chambers where the clothes are stripped from dead gladiators, and the very beers of the dead. How sacred and holy, how venerable and pure is the article of dress, determined not from the heaven of poetry alone, but from the traffickings of the whole world. But indeed a Christian will not even dishonor his own gate with laurel crowns, if so be he knows how many gods the devil has attached to doors, Janus so called from gate, Lymentinus from threshold, Phocus and Carna from leaves and hinges, among the Greeks too, the Thyraean Apollo, and the evil spirits, the Antelli. Much less may the Christian put the service of idolatry on his own head. Nay, I might have said, upon Christ, since Christ is the head of the Christian man, for his head is as free as even Christ is, under no obligation to wear a covering, not to say a band, but even the head which is bound to have the veil, I mean woman's, as already taken possession of by this very thing, is not open also to a band. She has the burden of her own humility to bear. If she ought not to appear with her head uncovered on account of the angels, much more with a crown on it will she offend those elders who perhaps are then wearing crowns above. For what is a crown on the head of a woman, but beauty made seductive, but mark of utter wantonness, a notable casting away of modesty, a setting temptation on fire? Therefore, a woman taking counsel from the apostle's foresight will not too elaborately adorn herself, that she may not either be crowned with any exquisite arrangement of her hair. What sort of garland, however, I pray you, did he who is the head of the man and the glory of the woman, Christ Jesus, the husband of the church, submit to in behalf of both sexes, of thorns, I think, and thistles, a figure of the sins which the soil of the flesh brought forth for us, but which the power of the cross removed, blunting in its endurance by the head of our Lord, death's every sting. Yes, and besides the figure, there is contumely with ready lip, and dishonor, and infamy, and the ferocity involved in the cruel things which then disfigured and lacerated the temples of the Lord, that you may now be crowned with laurel, and myrtle, and olive, and any famous branch, and which is of more use with hundred-leaved roses too, culled from the garden of Midas, and with both kinds of lily, and with violets of all sorts, perhaps also with gems and gold, so as even to rival that crown of Christ which he afterwards obtained. For it was after the gall he tasted the honeycomb, and he was not greeted as king of glory in heavenly places till he had been condemned to the cross as king of the Jews, having first been made by the Father for a time a little less than the angels, and so crowned with glory and honor. If for these things you owe your own head to him, repay it if you can, such as he presented his for yours, or be not crowned with flowers at all, if you cannot be with thorns, because you may not be with flowers. Keep for God his own property untainted, he will crown it if he choose. Nay, then he does even choose, he calls us to it. To him who conquers, he says, I will give a crown of life. Be you too faithful unto death and fight you, too, the good fight, whose crown the apostle feels so justly confident has been laid up for him. The angel also, as he goes forth on a white horse, conquering and to conquer, receives a crown of victory, and another is ordained with an encircling rainbow, as it were in its fair colors, a celestial meadow. In like manner, the elders sit crowned around, 
crowned too with a crown of gold, and the Son of Man himself flashes out above the clouds. If such are the appearances in the vision of the seer, of what sort will be the realities of the actual manifestation? Look at those crowns, inhale those odors. Why condemn you to a little chaplet or a twisted headband, the brow which has been destined for a diadem? For Christ Jesus has made us even kings to God and his Father. What have you in common with the flower which is to die? You have a flower in the branch of Jesse, upon which the grace of the divine spirit in all its fullness rested, a flower undefiled, unfading, everlasting, by choosing which the good soldier, too, has got promotion in the heavenly ranks. Blush, ye fellow soldiers of his, henceforth not to be condemned even by him, but by some soldier of Mithras, who, at his initiation in the gloomy cavern, in the camp, it may well be said, of darkness, when at the sword's point a crown is presented to him, as though in mimicry of martyrdom, and thereupon put upon his head, is admonished to resist and cast it off, and, if you like, transfer it to his shoulder, saying that Mithras is his crown, and thenceforth he is never crowned, and he has that for a mark to show who he is, if anywhere he be subjugated to trial in respect of his religion, and he is at once believed to be a soldier of Mithras if he throws the crown away, if he say that in his god he has his crown. Let us take note of the devices of the devil, who is wont to ape some of God's things with no other design than, by the faithfulness of his servants, to put us to shame and to condemn us. End of the chaplet